Cataclysm, Stormborn Saga Book 13, written by J.T. Williams, copyright 2020, part one, A Gathering of Clouds. Evurn was at the helm at the Nakri. The stars glimmered above them. He was alone, save for Rasi. The serpent was curled up at his feet and sleeping. Why would he not tell us? I don't care of some demon. He could have told us. He saw Valrin as a son, a son he had never had, a son he had failed. They were approaching an island north of the chief lands of men, a grand island as he understood it, with secrets of its own, though he assumed it was just stories. The myths said that Srun Island was no mere island or relic like they had seen in the glacial seas. It was a massive city, secretive, and the home to an offshoot of the race of men who had found favor under the gods. He had seen it once, the crown of Srun, a fortress atop the cliffs of one of the northernmost points of the north, a region firmly set between Taria and the mountains of the east, the border of the Shadowlands. This lone fortress was connected to the island, but this was the only part of Srun he knew of, the island itself was veiled at all times, no matter the weather, no matter how close you tried to get. The island nation's fleet was unmatched and guarded their waters with a fierce hand. He just wished Valrin was here. That was all he could think about. You're not going to sleep? Milia is quite confident she can guide the ship, and if you're worried of her, I can. He jumped at the sudden words, staring at Evium. I'm fine. Avium put her arm around him. I know fine. I also know that that word can hide more pain than any other word. Evern slowly pushed her arm from him. We must keep focused. Rornuk and Alera have gone out searching for any allies of theirs who might be hiding. Makli is sending out owls of Okar to gather any followers of Meridas who would pledge themselves to the cause of the Stormborn. A holy fleet. Avium nodded. I was there. Evern coughed, shivering. I just keep repeating it to myself. I don't think any number of warriors or fleets will stop this. This Misla is no different from Ayaklo. This is a city destroyer. It will not stop with a few volleys of arrows. He could tell Avium was staring at him. You're getting sick. Go make yourself some tea. Stay inside. The air was much colder than the air they had been in before. Whatever Misla was doing to the climate, the rest of the world was reacting in the opposite way. There were sheets of ice upon the water, and snow clouds were blowing off the lands in the far distance. Wura's lights burned above them, undulating and dancing, a green show high above them. Avern couldn't stand that either. Avium placed her hand by Avern's on the helm. We can't help him if you end up sick. Go, take care of yourself. Trust in Rungar. Avorn stared at her unwavering glare. He sighed. Fine. Come on, Rossi. He took his staff and left Avium at the helm, walking down the steps and around to the captain's quarters. He knew he was getting sick, and it wasn't like him. The events of the last few weeks had kept him fatigued, and his ability to cast magic had wavered. Sometimes he wished he had never left the island Valrin, and the others found him on. The thought had crossed his mind several times as of late. But that was his old self talking, the person who had driven him from his home. Even that decision was on his mind. But he was faithful to the Stormborn. No matter what, he'd fight to protect him and help him reach his destiny. As he went into the captain's quarters, he noticed Melia and Ordak sleeping on opposite sides of the room. He went to the sacks of supplies Carrick had provided them and down to a small recessed stone stove. He had found this earlier, behind a piece of broken wood. Though it seemed the ship itself had been restored, there were still scraps here and there and parts of the ship that had not been fully activated. As he gathered some kindling to light the fire, he noticed several rune stones in the oven. Rossi slithered up and looked in and then scurried away. Now don't tell me you're scared of rune stones. 
That's old magic, druid magic. The snake hissed. Okay, then. He took his staff and placed the head on the stones, using a bit of energy to create a small spark of flame, activating the rune stones. They began to glow and create a rather warm heat. He set his water to boil and then sat down at the table. He looked around at the ornate designs within the ship. Stranta Vedi, not a term I know. In the corner of the room, a crystal began to spin. He noticed that the turtle that, as he understood it, had fixed the ship, crawled toward him. On its back was a pool of water, and the turtle leaped up onto the table, pointing the pool of water to him. A voice spoke in the common tongue. Stranta Vedi, of ocean lore. The Sea Peoples, an offshoot of ordained Dwemhar culture, those who remained pure to the Dwemhar way, yet embraced that of advanced mathematics, astrology, astro-mechanics, crystalline mechanics, and sought to hold on to that which was lost. Original founder, Ordravan, High Templar. An image of a Dwemhar man appeared within the pool. Following the betrayal of Eliu to the Dwemhar High Council, Ordravan began working to perfect the technology of Eliu, while still maintaining his connection to the Great Aura, the binding force of all natural beings. In doing so, he eventually worked in secret to empower the Rusus to bring down the city ship, Ayaklo. That's a story I don't know. In pre-flood year 10,152, Ordravan met with Rusus Rungar and enabled the binding of Rusus energy with Dwemhar crystals, creating flying vessels capable of internal power by Rusus pilots. Records regarding this were lost when Ayaklo burned the Rusus city, revealing its devastating capabilities to the world. The final record in my database of this event was a plan incursion to take down the central core of Ayaklo. That did happen, Evern said. Rungar and the others made it to Ayaklo. Stranta Vedi are the pure form of mortal Dwemhar, those who were betrayed, those who still fight. If you see this, you are Stranta Vedi, you are a protector of ocean lore. Hail Meridas, glory to the seas. The turtle's back returned to that of simple metal, and it turned, clanking its two strange arms together. I guess thanks are in order. I didn't need a history lesson, but... He paused. Perhaps that is what Rungar seeks to tell us, what he remembered. Evern grabbed a mug and scooped some of the dry tea from a small bag into his cup. He poured the water and allowed it to steep. As he walked around the room, he noticed a pale light coming in from one of the windows. Dawn was upon them. As he spooned out the herbs and sipped his warm beverage, Ordak awoke, smacking himself in the chest as he jumped up. He looked around the cabin and saw Evern. No sleep? Evern said nothing. As the orc made his way to the table, Evern tapped the side of his mug. It's cold, even for me, Ordak said. Yes. Misla warmed the cold air of the glacial seas and caused everything south of that to become frigid, or so it seems. Evium at the helm? Ever nodded. Ordak looked around. It's different now. It's not the same. Bray gone. Valrin. Well, whatever he did. I'm not too sure of myself now. I'm not too sure of us. We serve the Stormborn. We follow his last command. Rungar was alive when Ayaklo still flew. Rungar is our best chance to stop Misla. Not Valrin. I mean, he's there. He might slay Marag himself. If he does, then we have less to worry about. But I'm not confident in any of this working out just as we want it to. Nothing we've done has worked out just as we wanted, not since I left my island. He paused. Not since I left the Shadowlands. Even that first night finally reaching a place where I thought I'd be free of... everything. Aviam's father just happened to want to go on a quest, starting a friendship that eventually led me against the Scourge Siren and to Ayaklo the first time. It seems from the moment I left home, I've been tied to the events of the Stranta Vedi. Stranta Vedi, what's the... Evorn hushed him, looking over at the turtle. Don't get it started. It's a sect of the Dwemhar. The Sea Peoples. The two of them went silent, 
and Ordok picked one of his nails. Have you ever thought about going back? To where? The Shadowlands. Hmm, Evan said, finishing the rest of the tea. I'll need something a bit stronger if we're having this conversation. He set his mug down. I'm not going back there. My life has been nothing but trouble since I left. I can only imagine what would happen if I went back there. Maybe the trouble happens because you're not? What? Ordak lifted his hands. I don't know. Maybe the gods are punishing you. You did say you left everything behind. Maybe you shouldn't have. Ordak, I've told you before. I'll tell you again. I made a choice and left that life. I will never pick up a blade again. I will never go back to that place as long as I draw breath. I'll go back once I embrace death. My soul can go back. I've run too, Melia said. Neither Ordak nor Evorn had noticed that their thief companion was awake. We've all run to and from our troubles. It's part of the point of being together, I think, Ordak said. But I think we're doing right, not wrong. Melia stood up, grabbing herself a mug from the supplies they had brought and beginning her own tea. I'm not quite sure what we're doing, Evern said. We're making most of this up as we go. No, I mean running from our troubles. We're not. We're meant for greater things. If this had all not happened, I'd still be in Selir. I'd still be a thief. Now, I fight for something greater, something meaningful. I've never done that. Have you? Evern saw Ordak look at him. I have, but I've also done other things, dishonorable actions. Then you reclaim your honor. There is a belief among thieves of repayment. If I wrong you, though you might not get your revenge on me, the gods will see that I am wronged. It is something we must work through, something that brings balance. Our trouble now is both our own actions and the actions of others are coming to haunt us, and we are suffering because of it. But it is all still warranted. Never knew a wise thief. Ordak said with a partial laugh. Never knew a good orc, Melia said. Evern laughed. I see why you led a guild, young one. How old are you? How old do I look? Well, your mind is much greater than that of your physical age, Evern said. Then that's all that matters. Evern nodded. I agree. There was a sudden jolt in the ship. Evern looked up as the entire cabin shook. He stood up, moving quickly to the door and up to the helm of the ship. Wind shot across the bow and the ship lurched to one side. He pulled himself up to the helm, seeing Avium struggling to hold the ship. He ran up and grabbed hold of the wheel with her, turning them from a sudden patch of rough waters. They were near a large flat island, and there were several other ships with long, narrow hulls in the water ahead. They had their own large deck-mounted crossbows manned, but they were not aimed at the Nakri. Did we run aground? Evern asked. No, there is something in the water! Avium shouted over the roaring wind. I saw it for a second. It was there, and then it wasn't. Suddenly, the water exploded between them and the other vessels on the surface. A massive tentacled creature rose into the sky, floating just above the surface of the water. Ordok Milia, get up here! Spears! The two of them were already exiting the cabin beneath. Milia ran to the railing of the ship, backing away slowly as Ordok went for the spears. Evern guided the Nakri along the far edge, away from the creature. Repeated sounds of slamming mechanisms preceded a volley of bolts striking the creature. Throw! Evorn shouted. Ordak and Melia took turns tossing their spears and grabbing second ones. The two spears were engorged in red flame, lashing out and striking the creature. It turned toward them, shooting across the surface of the water. Avium lifted her hands, summoning a ball of energy and casting it at the approaching fiend. Her spell exploded, sending rippling bolts of lightning out across the surface. The creature fell into the water, its tentacles shaking. Ordak threw several more spears, each one striking the creature in the face. 
It made a shrill sound, slapping the water around before vanishing beneath the surface. Both Ordak and Melia punched the air. Yes, Melia said. Good work, Ordak laughed. Eveum looked at Evorn. A creature of Marog? Likely. I saw something similar when we descended from Misla. As Evern began to turn their vessel toward the other ships, more ships appeared at their sides, moving out from behind the line of ships they had first seen. In just a few moments, they had vessels on either side of them. All the ships had flags bearing the symbol of an octopus, ironically, not too unlike what they had just fought. A man with a thick red beard stood on the bow of one of the larger ships. He lifted his hand in greeting. Thank you, strangers, he said with a gruff voice. That is the third one this week, but we've never managed to turn one back so quickly. Turn it back? Ordak asked. That one was dead. The bearded man laughed. No, no. When they die, they bleed. That fella didn't bleed. He's still alive, I'll tell you that. But I do not recognize your vessel or its ability with magic. Tell me, where do your allegiances lie? What do you know of the Great Wall of Clouds? Avern turned and looked behind him. He could tell Misla was drifting high above them, moving slower than before, but making a steady flight over them. I know some things, but I'd rather speak in private. We hail from the glacial seas. We seek Srun and Arusis by the name of Rungar. I am Ivurn, and this is Iviam, Ordak, and Milia. The man bowed slightly. I am happy to meet each of you. Surely I have heard of such a crew in whispers. Rungar had a meeting with our king earlier today. I am Arryn, admiral of the island nation fleet. These are our sovereign waters, a place where those who do not wish us harm are free to pass, but where we will spill the blood of those who desire ill will. We thank you for your assistance, and I'll personally see you to Srun. Follow my ship through the straits. It is not the simplest of routes when coming from the east. As the ships began to move away from the sides of the Nakri, Evorn settled in to follow this vessel. Have you heard of the island nation? Aviam asked. They are rumored to be a favored kingdom of men under the gods. I've heard that. I never went this far west by sea when I was still in the Shadowlands, but I can say that what dealings us Shadow Elves had with most sailing vessels in our waters was always short. I believe these here typically keep to themselves. As Ordok and Milia walked to the railings, looking out at the many ships circling around them, Ivorn turned the wheel of the ship to follow the Admiral to the mainland. Though he had mentioned it was precarious, the water seemed calm enough going this way. Do we have any reason not to trust these people? Aviam asked. Evorn shook his head. Not that I know of. These people simply want to be left alone, and if they've already dealt with this type of sea monster three times, they must have some clue that none of this is normal. Rossi slithered out and onto the banister in front of the wheel of the ship. What? You smell a difference in the air? The snake moved back down and curled up his boot, slithering up to his arm and onto the wheel of the ship. So I guess now I need to expect you to be guiding the ship, no? Aviam laughed. I was feeling pretty good piloting the ship until we hit that rough water, but of course that was not actually my fault. Excuses, Evern said with a joking laugh. They were proceeding quickly moving out of the open ocean and into a narrow gorge of rock that looked as if it were a remnant of a wall, not too much unlike the island they had spent so many days before, now searching for the artifacts of the lost captain. But the stone was definitely not that of the Dwemhar. It was even brick, carved out and polished from the sea rock. If anything, it was dwarven, with constructs of the island nation merged with that of dwarven ingenuity. He could see watchers on the rocks high above, but much like the stories, there was a deep fog that remained. They were taking a long path around the rocks and narrow passages he could see. There were torches here, too. Higher up, there was even a massive torch basin, a lighthouse of sorts, but much simpler than anything of elvish design. Truly, Srun was more than what it seemed, 
but their secret remained that. The lands were the north, a section of the lands almost exclusively ruled by the race of men. While there were dwarven and elven settlements and, in fact, some large cities, it was men who primarily ruled this region. From the glacial seas, moving south into the Great Bay of the North, they were nearing their destination. Being so close to the lands of men, he was interested to know of what had transpired in Taria. Though that was further west, he was thinking about them and the foe Fadis and the others faced. That was all they needed. Vampires and Marog. They emerged from the gorge of rock almost as quickly as they had entered it. Here, they could see a beach ahead and a massive dock with a few dozen ships. High above here, there was a sheer wall of rock with glass that shimmered in the sunlight. This is an old place, perhaps even older than the race of men, Aviam asked. Perhaps it is just a respect for that which is older, Ivorn suggested. Rare for what I know of most of the race of men. They are the young race, the one not of the originals. They were meant to teach the elder races to cease the wars that erupted before their time. Men are not the most intelligent of races, but there are many among them who have proven themselves in our histories. I count Fadis as a dear friend, and I hope those of Taria remain. It troubles me that Rungar is not there. I hope whatever he seeks is worth it. You two really don't like my kind, Milia said, walking up the helm. It's more disdain for the recklessness of those in power. Milia sat on the railing, twirling her hair. Yeah? That's why I've never fit in with others. Before I was in Silir, I grew up in a town just further south from here. Not Locum, not that place, but one of the lesser towns. We moved around a lot, so I can't really claim one place as home. But from Radinba to North Lok, I consider this entire coast my home. The last I heard, the many kingdoms were working together like none before. But you mentioned Taria. Isn't that the Wild Lands? It is. And right now, they're at war with the vampires. It will not be long before that spills over into the other kingdoms. Well... Once we're done here, maybe we can deal with that. Help out against the vampires. We do have friends doing just that. Fadis is the leader of the rangers of Taria, Aviam said. Kirla, a rogue type. In fact, you'd like her. She's fighting alongside him. That and the wood elves of the western woodlands. Ordak laughed, running up to Milia. What? You're thinking about leaving the crew already? He put his arm around her. We've got more spears to throw, more ruins to explore. The work of the Stormborn is never done. Ivorn sighed, bringing the ship close to the docks and lowering the sails. It worked almost like the Ayla Sunrise, an automated system. Ordak, cast lines! Melia and Ordak ran to the lower railings and tossed the lines out to several people waiting on the docks. In just a few moments, they were tied off. Hey, Aviam said, putting her hand on Evern's. We'll figure this out. Nothing happens just to happen. Avern smiled and picked up his staff, nodding. They exited the vessel, joining a growing assembly on the docks and Aaron, who was patiently awaiting them. Quite a vessel, the admiral said. I do not believe I've seen such a ship. Ivern noticed that the ships the islanders used were wider-bodied and set low to the water. Many shields lined the upper railings and the carved images of beasts on the front of their ships. Likewise, Evern said, these are seafaring vessels. Sea, river, it doesn't really matter. We can take these anywhere for the most part. They're fast, too. Great for getting out of trouble. He leaned in. Or getting into it, a bit of raiding sometimes. Aaron laughed. But come, come, let us go see our Grand King. He'll tell you more of us, and we can reunite you with Rungar. I'm going for a drink. Patrols have gotten longer since the seas have been changing. And cold, a crew member shouted. Cold indeed, Aaron said. We like cold but the amount of ice layering the oceans at night is beyond that which I can remember. 
he led them up a walkway that cut up and around a sheer cliff. The stairs were stone and icy, and the higher they climbed, the more precarious the pathway seemed. Good run, Aaron said. You see, of all the islands and their beauty, it is our fortress here that commands these lands. You can say what you want of Lokum, with its high walls, or Radinba just south of us, but none have the fleet we have. We might need all of it soon, Evern said. There are more monsters, more ships. Up until now we have only seen our enemy in passing, or in skirmishes with our few allies. They are coming here. Aaron brought them up to a long pathway, adorned with statues honoring Meridas and Dimn. Looking to the south, Evern noticed rolling green hills as far as he could see. Though, like an infection, ice and snow were slowly spreading south. Further out, across the water, he could see the glowing hue of another city. We have been gathering our forces, Aaron said. Though we've had our fights between each other, most of the city-states of the north have signed a protectorate to work together. You have signed this too? Aviam asked. Oh, you caught that bit in my tone? Aaron laughed. No, we will remain our own people. There is no protectorate for us, not to mention they fight behind shields and long spears, not quite our style. He tapped the axe at his hip. As they came to the doorway, guards pushed open the doors, and they entered a small room with a large dish of water. You must be marked before entering this sacred place. An attendant garbed in a white tunic stood next to the water. He had a brooch of a fish and a silver ladle. He scooped up some of the water and then went to each of them, starting with Evern, placing the water on their foreheads. I did not think this was a temple to the gods, Evern said. No temple to the gods, but hallowed ground, a place where our people hid when the seas overtook the north. It was but an island for a time, until the water receded. Aaron led them around the corner to the left, taking an immediate right and down a long hallway that had a breeze through where the cold wind cut between the open-air walkway. Ahead, there were more guards holding larger spears and another doorway. Aaron motioned with his finger, and the two guards pushed open the doors. Evern proceeded in directly behind Aaron. They emerged into a large room with a massive stone table. Off to the right, was a stone chair set atop a large stone octopus and an old man sitting atop the chair. King of Srun, master of the seas, Aaron began. Third son under the white crow, King Hathul. I present the ones from the north, the ones Rungar spoke of. This is Evern, Aviam, Milia, and Ordak. King Hathul raised his finger and Aaron bowed away. Where is the stormborn? Evern bowed. He has taken the fight to our enemy alone. So, that is not the Aela Sunrise docked below? It is not. It is the Nakri, a ship of the Strantavedi, a vessel of considerable power. Strantavedi? the king asked. There was a moment of pause where Aaron and the king simply stared at one another. So it seems the times may be darker that we believe. Sire, I intend to go and assure all of the city are prepared. Bovika and Kersa fleets have been retrofitted already. I will push the other captains to switch our armaments. King Hathul nodded. Very well. Go. A messenger came running into the throne room, bowing to the king before rushing to his feet. Hathul motioned for him to approach. What news from the dwarves of Haradar? Haradar sends no news as of yet. Though, an assembly of elves has come up from Narisond. Among them is the one called True Song, a keen warrior as it has been reported. I need more ships, not standalone warriors. Tell me, Evern, the king said, lifting his chalice. You know this enemy who blows upon our shores. What is their weakness? Evern shook his head. There is not a weakness that I know or can isolate. Their fleets fought against that of Makli of the Eastern Seas, but that was not their focus. It is Misla, that which you see as stone and fogs in the northern sky. That is the real concern. 
Why should the great fleets of the island nation fear that which is clouds? It's a weapon, Aviam said, a Dwemhar weapon capable of blasting a city or fortress. She motioned to the building around them, from high above. Then it is as Rungar said. I thought the Rus is insane, Hathul said. You have the sea monsters too, Ordak said. I dare say there are less than a dozen. The king stood up, smacking his hands together. Out, everyone! I want everyone out! There are arrows to be made, rock to be reinforced! Those who remained were made up of simply the crew of the Nakri and the king. The seas quake in the great bay, the water bubbling as I understand it. A volcano prepares to erupt beneath the waters. A few months ago, that was all I was concerned with. Now I already deal with something working against those of men, a rift I can feel in my soul that my priests of Meridas have felt. All the while the Falakar raided our sovereign land on the border of the Shadowlands. Dwarves do what they do best, pulling their hammer songs out of the outposts closest to us and leaving rabble there. The elves of the West were my allies, but vampires erupt from the ground, and I have not heard from Taria in some time. Where did these people of Misla come from? The king pointed at Evern. How did they come out of the great northern seas like a plague none saw until it was already affecting the people? They come from another realm, sire, a break between an alternate existence. The Dwemhar who created the island of Iclo attempted to push his darkness away, to cut from himself that which was evil. It resided in a mask and then became sentient. It went on to use its knowledge, that of the Dwemhar, to create a secondary version of Ayaklo. Ayaklo is an island. So, Rungar was right about that too? I thought he had lost his mind. Yes. The king stood up from his chair, going around to a table with many bottles. Come, come, have a drink. It's the least I can do. Ordak went to step forward when Evern smacked him in the stomach. We are okay, king. We must meet up with Rungar. He sought us. Indeed, he is on quite a quest himself, looking for some guide stone or something. He is not here? Aviam asked. No, he wanted me to speed you his way, though, which I intend. But I must tell you a small fact, a small whisper. As the king walked back to his throne, he set his chalice on the seat and looked at each of them with a small smile. There is a movement among men, a movement to rise up. This protectorate they signed is something else. They have changed what the children are taught in the high sanctums. They are teaching a version of history that is not as we know it. Why teach the children anything but the truth? Aviam asked. There are many who believe that elves want to rule over us. The elves seek nothing like that, Evern said. They deal with their own issues in their lands, and Narasond has been a peaceful city. The king nodded. Already they blame the changing atmosphere, the war to come, on elves. They are saying magic is to blame. That's insane, Aviam said. We protect them. He sipped his drink, lifting it to her. Exactly what they are using against you. They claim that men must rise up that elves and dwarves must embrace the path that the Dwemhar and Rusis did. I don't like it. I complain about the dwarves, but they are good, kind folk. The elves might be a bit annoying, but they're honest, too. They have renounced the gods of the north in Lokum, set up an altar to some self-made deity, a god of men, or so they claim it. Yet they intend to fight with us, Evern asked. Yes, but they will twist this. No matter the end, I fear of what comes to my lands. Taria needs allies. They are rangers and elves, nothing much else. They fight vampires. And even the sky there is different, the black moon, as Rungar tells me. I can see the shroud even from here some days. But you are of men, Ordak said. You barely know us, so why tell us this? There are few I trust, Hathul said. Even within my island there are whispers that speak ill of me. Rungar was a name I knew as a child, and then to meet the man. He paused and chuckled. I just knew he was a charlatan. I put him in a cell, and before I could get back up here, he was sitting on my throne, 
asking if I'd like to try again. He spoke of the ancient times, the founding of our island. He knew stuff of legend, but yet he recounted it like it was simply something that happened a fortnight ago. Hathel sipped his drink. If he could trust me and spoke highly of you and yours, he said, motioning to the others. I can trust you with what I feel is happening to our people. It's concerning, but hardly something we must deal with soon, A.V.M. said. We must go to Rungar. You said he left. Did he sail somewhere? No, he went by land, taking the southern road to a city called Radinba. He heard a rumor that I guess has something to do with what he seeks. I will provide you horses and then continue with our preparations. We are expecting more dwarves to arrive in the coming days. Captain Aaron will be gathering our high ships in preparation to lead the attack. Do you know if there is a ground army? Should we prepare only for a sea battle? The only preparation is all preparation. I do not know what Missla brings, but know that we will need everything we can muster. The king bowed slightly before them. As I understand it, we of Srun and the lands of the north should be giving you all the praise. I have heard of many rumors across the oceans of the actions of the Stormborn and the Ayla Sunrise. It is a pity to not meet the captain. Indeed, Evern said. All right, then. Head on back outside. There should be horses already waiting for you. I didn't suspect you'd be the types for merriment and drinking. Actually, Ordak said, raising his hand. Milia grabbed his hand and pulled him away. We'd be honored, but it isn't the time for us. But save us a bottle, for sure. King Hathor lifted his glass. I will do so. As Evern and Evium walked ahead of Ordak and Milia, Evern could hear Evium sigh. What is it? I can't feel Valrin. I can't even feel his life force. Evern swallowed his spit, trying to think of something to say. But he couldn't. Part Two Southern Trek As they exited Srun, they looked down the road made of shells, with statues ordaining either side. At the far end were a handful of attendants with four brown horses. Are you those from the glacial seas? A narrow-built, taller man asked. We are, Evern said. I'm Tresp, keeper of the horses in Srun. These are good beasts, good for winter weather. We've got a storm blowing in from the south and one coming from the north. I never thought I'd say that. As Evern and the others mounted up, Tresp stared at Evium. He began to shiver, looking away with wide eyes and heavy breathing. What is it? Evern asked. Nothing. The man shook his head. Nothing. Avern looked at Avium, but she motioned for them to get moving. Wait, Tresp said. What is it? Evern asked him. I've seen her. He pointed to Avium. I saw her in a dream. But I died. She didn't, but there were many dead around her and broken ships and the screams. Oh, the screams. Do you leave here to prevent that or return with it? Prevent it, Avium said. I promise you. The man nodded quickly, biting at his lips. Then Wura and Kel be with you. May Etha light your path. Evern gave the man a short grin and kicked his horse, moving them down the road. As they began their journey south, Evern looked over to Avium. It was like he was in a waking nightmare, she said. He saw me. He knew me. It's as he saw it in his mind. Thought he might be a bit off myself, Ordak said. No, it is not uncommon before any calamity that the spirits come to those who reside in a place of destruction. Their ancestors seek to warn them or inspire them to rise up. That is what that was. Perhaps the man will stand up against what comes. Or flee, Evan said plainly. These people are not warriors. Most of the race of men rely on others to do their fighting. You say that, but Aaron and the island nation, whom I assume this man is part of, don't seem the type to back down. I felt a lot of life in the fogs before we reached the small dock and back there with the king. I feel they are hiding a greater secret. You do not have the ships they had, and not more people. 
In time, perhaps we'll learn. I have had dreams too, Milia said. Evium looked back at her. Tell me of them. The sea draws back before me. I stand on the coast and the water vanishes. But it isn't long, and the ground trembles. There is a flash in the sky, and fire engulfs the mountains before a wave of water washes over me. The dream always ends there. How many times have you had this dream? Half a dozen. It's always the same. Had some dreams like this once when I had a bit too much to drink over several days, but I haven't been drinking that much. Evern could tell Avium was staring at him. What? he asked, annoyed that he could feel her within his mind. You? Any dreams? I dream only of waking dreams, of not having a monster or evil to fight. Of how quiet it was on my little island. Avium laughed. That is not the type of dream I am asking about. It's the only kind that matters. I haven't had a dream in many years. I try not to. The Falakar tribes of the Shadowlands put stock in dreams. But I do not. Evern kicked his horse to move a bit further away from Evium, but she quickly followed him. You're not telling the truth, she whispered. Evern sighed, looking down at her, and then back up the rolling hills before them. It was beginning to snow. There was a gust of cold air that blew through them before he felt Rossi moving underneath his robes, curling up on his chest. And what of it? he asked. What can you change? I hope to see something to give us an advantage, a way to prepare for what's coming. He said nothing to her. Yes, I've had dreams. Evern continued to try to ignore Avium. He could tell she was still trying to peer into his mind, but he knew that no matter what she thought she could gain from seeing what he had dreamed, it wouldn't help. For what he had seen was something truly terrifying. He saw broken timbers and bodies floating in the water. Ships of many sizes were on fire, and a dead beast lying on the beaches, its green blood mixed in the rolling waves. Worse, he recognized the beaches as the very beaches he could see now. The green fields had been blown back, no longer green but barren rock. All the while in the clouds high above, lightning flashed against lightning. The winds from the north clashed with the winds from the south, and he could hear the wailing of children. Damn! He looked back to Avium and saw that in just that small amount of thought he had put toward it, she had seen what he was trying to prevent her from seeing. It was foolish, of course, for him to put any thought toward it while a Dwemhar was trying to peer into his mind. It didn't matter. So... You have seen as I have seen? I didn't tell you anything for a reason, Evern said. If I wanted to talk about it, I would have told you. But I didn't. That should be enough for you for now. He felt cold talking to Evium like that. But after everything, after Valrin leaving, he did not want to talk further of the future. Look at that, Ordak said, pointing out to the water. Evorn looked over, having not been paying particular attention to the bay. There were columns of steam coming out of the water, and in a large swath of the surface was bubbling. A volcano churns beneath the water, Avaeum said. Like we need anything else, Ordak said. Evorn exhaled in frustration, kicking his horse as the road rose up before him. It was some time later, riding over many hills of green grass, where glowbugs jumped from flower to flower, that finally... They had reached their destination. They came over the crest of the hill and could see a rather large city up ahead. This place sat right on the ocean itself, with massive white walls and towers that rose like splinters of ivory. Further, he could see the spire of the city of Locum. This place was much further away from them and in fact considered a capital of the region. But the smaller city they were going to would no doubt have a rather interesting population. Seeing that the north was inhabited almost primarily by the race of men, he didn't expect any elves, dwarves, or other magic folk. But it just so happened that coming down the road there was a merchant, 
from the looks of his wares on his wagon and the way he was dressed, not even having a sword, a dwarven merchant. How fair is the weather in the city? Evern asked. It is cold, the man grumbled. We will find the people's reception rather cold as well. It seems that nightmares have been haunting the people of the city. In the arrival of the holy men from Locum, many have thrown off what faith could once be placed in the old gods in favor of this newer god. These people no longer follow the gods of the north? Aviam asked. The dwarf shrugged. Some do, I guess, but others do not. This isn't a place for our kind, the dwarf said, looking at Evern and the others. Just be careful. I am headed back to Harodar. It seems the safest place for my kind now. Perhaps you will be forced to go home yourselves. Take care to not meddle too much. The merchant continued on his way, smacking the donkey, pulling his cart, and moving on down the road. So what am I, an elf? Millie asked with a laugh. It seems it is as the king told us, Ordak said. We'll deal with it, Evern said. They continued forward, coming to the grand gates of the city. Here they saw the men of the north, and stalwart were they. They wore large breastplates with long swords at their hips. These two men guarded the gate and ensured no unwanted visitors came into the city. One of them walked in front of Avorn as he approached. Halt, good travelers. Please tell me what your business is here in the city. There is much trouble about the lands. We must know you do not bring that trouble here. Evorn dismounted his horse, taking his staff in hand and bowing slightly to both of the guards. We bring no trouble. We only seek a friend who came here before us, a Rusus. We are travelers from the far north, the glacial seas. The other guard laughed. The glacial seas are a bit warm, I'm hearing. You're not wrong. The weather has indeed been strange, and I'm not sure what to think of it, Evern said. I am seeking counsel with those that may can help in this city and other cities along the bay. I hope to discover the true cause of this change. We absolutely come in peace to those of the north. The man scanned each of them. Eveam dismounted, and quickly following, Ordak and Melia did the same. Good, good. I remember the Rus's coming a few days ago. He had rather nice gauntlets. I felt like I was looking at something from the old history books from when I was a child learning of the old races. I directed him to the inn, just inside the gates to the left. They can put you up there if needed or provide food and drink. We've been thankful for a good harvest this last fall, though winter has come a bit quicker than we expected. Evern bowed again. Thank you. They led their horses by foot, passing through the city gates, and they passed another set of guards, who paid them little mind. The city was the largest that any of them had seen in some time. Not mentioning, of course, going back in time and seeing Ayeklo. Even the small village where they had been captured before was nothing compared to the city. While not as large as Lokum, the city of Radinba was a stopping point for merchants and travelers coming from the east to the west. As it were, it was also the first line of defense against someone or something coming against the people of the north. In such, there was a very heavy military presence. This was actually something Evern didn't expect, though he wasn't sure if this was the normal status of the city, or if these were war preparations as the entire region prepared for Misla. This place is a lot busier than the last time I was here, Melia said. Oh, Evern asked. Oh, yes. While I was always amazed at the number of three-story buildings and the many avenues and halls that made up the outer portion of the city, I always enjoyed the fact that there were very little people here. I did come for fast once, and during that, there were people from the mountains to the east and the field even further south, but the city prepared. That is a good sign, I think. Evern looked around, noticing people on the balconies high above pointing down at them. They did stand out, after all. It was not often you would see in any region of the north a shadow elf with the slightly darker skin than a high elf. Evorn clicked, and Rossi jumped down to the ground. The serpent slithered forward as they began to weave through many townsfolk and bartering stands set up along the road. 
Up ahead, Avorn could see a sign that read the last inn. I guess I found the tavern or inn or whatever it actually is. Aveam rubbed her arms and looked around. I doubt Rungar is lounging in the inn. I doubt that too, but where else are we to go? This is a rather large city. No drinking, he said, looking at Ordak and Milia. Ordak sneered. Avern led them to the tavern. They found a place to tie off the horses, and after doing so, they continued toward the door. Great, a good drink would do me well, Ordak said. Not here to drink. We're here to find Rungar, Evern said. Pushing open the door of the tavern, Evern was met by the musty smell of pipe smoke and herbs. The place was very quaint, with lower ceilings than he expected. There were several columns with small tables sitting at the base of each column. The bar itself was well lit, with many candles and, to his surprise, several books. The barkeep was a blonde female with her hair up in a bun. She smiled at them as they entered and began pulling down glasses. Drinks all around? the woman asked him. Evern shook his head. It will not be necessary right now. I am simply seeking a friend, a Rusus by the name of Rungar. Oh, Rungar, I met him two nights ago, quite a nice man. He was particularly excited to learn of the Rusus who lived within our happy city. Rusus? Evian asked. That's exactly the way he said it, the barkeeper said. He has a room, and I'd be happy to get your room next to him. We don't have many people staying in the inn as it is, and many more in the city have been moving out since the decree of war was issued. War? Evern asked. A war against the sea. There are monsters, many monsters, supposedly coming ashore. The armies of the north are prepared. A protectorate has been signed between the city-states. I think I'll be staying right here because there are a lot of people who cannot get out of the city, but you're welcome to have that room. Evern looked to Avium. I assume we'll hold the room just in case, he whispered. Avium nodded. That's a good idea. At the very least, we have somewhere to come back to in the event we can even find him. As Ordak and Melia both eyed the bottles behind the bar, Evern signaled to the barkeep, who had just begun to walk away. We'll take the room, he told her. Good, good. I'll mark down the four of you under the name of... Just put Val's. It's simple enough and is appropriate as needed, Evern said. I got you down, then. Now we just have to find where that Rusus ran off to, Milia said. The barkeep chuckled. If it isn't too much of an intrusion... I can give you a small bit of advice. What is it? Evium asked. The Rusus did indeed seek a family he was quite excited about, as I said before. You can find this family on the edge of the city, almost exactly opposite from where you are. She chuckled again. A bit ironic, of course. But if you take the center street directly outside to your left, follow it down past the center fountain, and then down the road as it continues on, you'll find a large tree with its leaves still green and with a statue of Etha. That is where you should go. Thank you very much, Evium said. It is not a problem at all, my dear. We of magic must stick together. The world isn't as friendly as it used to be. She gathered up several dirty dishes and made her way away from where they were standing. Evor noticed a slight curvature to her ears. She was half-elf. I just hope that after this is all said and done, we can get back here with Rungar and he can tell us what he needs to, and everything will be solved and we can earn a nice drink, Ordak said, rubbing his hands together and nodding. You will get your drink in time, Evorn said. Evern tapped his staff twice, and Rossi rustled from underneath the bar and quickly slithered up the staff and onto his shoulders. He led them back out of the tavern and Evern worked to follow the directions the half-elf had given them. The road itself was made of cobblestone, with neatly placed flower boxes outside of almost every door. The architecture was not dwarven, but it seemed to have been influenced by the northern neighbors. There was block-like carved stone atop the buildings, with many angles to the stone, almost dwarven but not as precise. 
It was nothing like Taria, though. This place was older. As they came to a center rotunda where many other streets seemed to dump into the same area, they noticed the image of a moon in the center fountain. Surrounding the edges of the fountain were small torches, not lit right now, of course, with it being the middle of the day, but within the water bubbled up and fell over cylindrical-like rocks, and the image of the moon glowed. This fountain looks elven, Aviam said, but this place is not elven. Neither is it dwarven, Evern said. It distresses me that people would be trying to push away the cultures of magic here. Even worse, that those of magic felt targeted, felt like they could not just live their lives. This is definitely a concerning matter for the lands as a whole. But so is Misla. We must choose the battles that we can actually win. Are we for sure that we can even win this battle? Ordak asked. Avern glared at Ordak. Do not speak words like that or ask questions that give me any hint that you do not believe we can win the battle ahead. He pointed at Ordak. Just because we don't know how we're going to do something does not mean we're not still going to do it. I've never given up before. I've never given up on the Stormborn, and I won't give up now. Do you understand that? Ordak said nothing. The frightened glare looking back into Evern's eyes was enough. Evern snapped back to walking the way they were. We just got to keep the course, keep doing what we need to do, keep taking chances. He sighed, thinking to himself, until perhaps our chances either see us to victory or we're all dead. He led them down the street opposite the fountain, continuing down the path as before. Far ahead, he could see the boughs of a green tree in the distance. They were going the right way, at least. The wind shifted around them, and Evern could smell sweet basil and mint. There was an apothecary ahead. I could see what they have, combine it with some of the substances on the Nakri. It would be better than having no potions at all. As Evern turned into the shop, the others stopped just at the door. I didn't know we were here to shop, Ordak said. Silence. I need some things. The shopkeeper looked up. It was a woman with bushy dark hair. Oh, a shadow elf in my shop. What a sight. Evern looked up to her and went back to rummaging through a few random boxes of herbs. My name is Gaiwa, and I am happy to assist you with all of your potion-making needs. Is there something you are looking for this day? No, just need a few base supplies. He was moving through turmeric roots and slivers of dried mushrooms. Actually, he said, looking at the woman, do you have any dried silver caps? No, I'm afraid not, she said, looking at what he had already gathered. As he went over to the counter, he realized he didn't have much in the form of payment. He hadn't had to buy anything in such a long time. You and your friends are a bit strange for a traveling troop. Evern looked back at the others. Yes, they are. Gaiwa laughed. I have had the worst dreams as of late. I saw you, stranger, I saw you. She motioned for him to go. You will do greater things than a mere shopkeeper in the coming days, I feel it. He pulled out a small pouch of coins, but she shook her head. No, just go, Shadow Elf. Please, I have been preparing things myself for more turbulent times, and, well, you take those. Evern sighed. My apologies, good Gewa. I normally am a bit more prepared and am used to sourcing my ingredients myself. I do find myself short on time, and I visited your shop too. I do not need explanation. Just do what is needed to protect the dear children here. There are many, many that I have heard crying in my dreams. Evern stared at this lone shopkeeper and smiled. Thank you. I will do what I can. And tell your friends they can come in and get whatever they need. Oh no, none of them should be messing with herbs. They might get the idea to try to cook something, he shook his head. Potion craft is not for the faint of heart. Gaiwa nodded. Indeed, good elf.
May Etha watch over you. And you. He exited the shop. Good? Ordak said. Yes, he said, putting the herb pouches into his pockets. I remembered I had part of the ingredients to make some new potions in the Nakri, and I might as well take advantage of picking up the missing herbs I needed while we were here. So no snacks? The half-orc sniffed. No, how old are you, orc? Melia and Aveum both laughed as they continued on. As they ascended a small hill, past many more small apartments and buildings nestled into one another, they came to a collection of houses very much unlike the other ones they had passed before. These houses were smaller, made out of the earth itself versus the brick of the rest of the city. It was here that they saw both the large green tree towering above them and the statue of Etha. Aver noticed that the statue itself was glimmering in the sunlight, even though the overall sky was pale and gray. Avium approached the statue of Etha and bowed slightly and closed her eyes. So, he is somewhere around here? Ever noticed a distinct quietness to this part of the city. It struck him as he looked around, seeing birds chirping in the high boughs of the tree in the melody of a soft singing voice unseen in the small courtyard. As Ordak and Melia slowly made their way toward the strange abodes, he looked over to Avium. This place seems like it shouldn't be a part of the city. It doesn't match in any form. Avium smiled. This is something of the elves. I feel that this place is much older than the city itself. There is something holy about these stones, and it is beyond that of simply the statue of Etha. They stood for a few moments, and Evern tried to figure out which door they should knock on. But before he could, one of them opened and a man emerged. The man was holding a baby, and at first, Evern didn't think anything of this. Lots of people had children. But then he realized that the man was Rungar. It is a good day to finally see my friends. Our path has brought us together, though. I wish it were not under the circumstances as of late, he said to them, approaching them with the baby still in his arms. I am happy to see you all here, but I do immediately have questions. As do we for you, Evern said, looking down at the baby. I did not expect to see you with a child now. Rungar laughed. A child of the future, no doubt. Rungar looked behind him, and several others emerged from the abode, a male and a female, along with at least two more children who looked to be around ten to twelve years. I had to come see for myself, Rungar said. I had to see what the rumors told me. He shook his head. I didn't think I would find any of my people, Avern. I honestly did not think that any Rusi still lived. After so many died in the wars before, and so much time had passed before I even knew what was going on, not only do I find Rusis, but I find the baby. As Rungar approached Evorn with the baby, Evorn looked over to the child's parents, who were holding each other and smiling. Do you know what this means? It means my people have continued on, that I still can defend my people just like I did before, just like I did in what feels like a true lifetime ago. I'm happy for you, friend, Evern said, though I cannot say I know how you feel. When I look in your eyes, I can tell that this child is dear to you. Rungar sniffled, the tear running down and landing on the baby's cheek. He rubbed the tear from the cheek, and the small child gripped his gauntlets, trying to grab the jewels set in the metal. It looks as if he wants to be like his hero he doesn't know, Avium said. He has many years before he could ever claim these gauntlets, but it would make me more than happy to one day pass these down to a young one such as this, one to hold our future in his or her hands. But not yet. Rungar smiled. Little Garoa here has many more years before I think he could even lift these gauntlets. The baby's mother came taking Garoa in her arms as he began to get fussy. It's about time for your nap anyway, she said. She looked over to Avern and Iavium, and further on to Ordak and Melia, whom both seemed to be checking out the tree. We are honored to have those of the high races here, 
she said. I have told Rungar some of what has transpired in the city, and he says that after his work is done with you all, you will help us move somewhere quieter. May I speak with you alone, Evern? Rungar asked him, his tone changing from the jovial spirit he had before to a much more solemn one. Evern nodded, and the two of them walked away from Evium and the other Rusis. It is amazing that I have found such a place. The magic in this city is old, a merging place of many older powers. The sacred pools within the city have proved to act as a wellspring for the Rusis. Apparently there have been many generations who have lived here in peace. He sighed. But while I worry of what goes on in Taria and Misla, now I worry for my own people and the place they have called home for generations. I came here seeking information in the old archives. I found what I sought, but after getting the letters meant for Fadis and the others, I knew I had to get in contact with you. Much has happened since we left Taria. Has the Stormborn fallen? No, but I am not sure I understand his actions. He is upon Misla and alive as far as I know. Brye died a few weeks ago as we attempted to save Eveum. Rungar looked down, taking a deep breath. I'm not sure what to say. Avern touched him on the shoulder. There is nothing to say of it. But what is it you seek? Have you found some old magic? Misla comes, my friend. Marog is an entity beyond any I have faced in my life. I do not tell the others, though I know Avium knows. I have seen what I think is the end, and what wasn't meant to be, but now it threatens all the lands and all our lives. I've been to the temples of the gods of the north. Many more have begun praying to the gods, and more have fallen away in their beliefs. There is a hopelessness in the air, a belief that things are not going as they should. I will not speak details here, for I fear that a future new enemy watches in the shadows. Some spirit? Evorn asked. No spirit. I can deal with spirits. Our enemy is hiding in the alleyways and dark places, watchful shadows spying on us at every turn. Their tongues spew lies as their rhetoric becomes as horrid as the actions in their minds. There is a rift between the race of men and that of magic, and it's becoming more and more evident to me the longer I remain in the city. We will return to the inn. There, I prepared a way to protect us from outsiders. Rungar looked back at the other Rusis. These are my people. I will do everything I can to protect them, even if it means losing my life. I've done enough evil while under the influence of that ring. I will make amends for that for my own soul. I'm telling you, Milia, this is not an elven tree. This is a black oak, and there is nothing elven about a black oak. We have these in the Shadowlands. What are you all debating now? Evern asked. She says this is an elven tree, Ordak said. I'm simply educating her. The orc is not educating me. I'm just pointing out that the etches and the stone-carved runes at the base of this tree are elven, thus making it an elven tree. It does not matter what kind of tree it is if it's imbued with elven power, Milia stated. It is indeed an elven tree, and it is also a black oak, Rungar said. A tree carried from the Kiva Valleys, the homelands of the Rusis. The runes are totems of luck. So it is both Elven and Rusis. You're both right in a way. Both Ordak and Melia scoffed at one another. I'm thinking I need that drink, Ordak said. I think I need one too, Melia said. We will return to the inn so you can have your drinks, Evern said. Rungar went back over to the family with the baby and knelt before them. I assure you that no matter what trouble befalls the city, you are my kin. I will do everything within my power to protect you. We did not believe you still lived, Rungar, the man who Evern assumed was the baby's father said. We have lost much as a race, but we must never lose faith. You have literally held the future of our people with that child. I see a future with many children, Perhaps we can even claim a city of our own in the future. There have to be more of our people out there, and together, after this is all over, 
Perhaps we can work together to find them. Rungar stood and smiled before joining Evern and the others. As they made their way back to the inn, Evern walked beside Rungar. I do not see the Stormborn with you. No, you do not, Evern said solemnly. Does he do something else while you have sought me? I would very much like to speak to him. Evorn sighed. Valrin has gone to Misla. Is something in motion? Perhaps we do not even need what I seek. Evern said nothing. He didn't tell you? Rungar asked, surprised. He did not. Much has happened. In truth, and don't tell the others this, he said, lowering his voice. I don't even know what side Valrin has taken. He delivered himself to our enemy, and then our ship was directed away. I couldn't have stopped him if I wanted. They came up to the fountain and began around the right side. Evern watched as Melia and Ordak jumped up onto the edge of the fountain, causing several nearby geese to honk and flap away. While I bring little good news, what of what you sought? They paused for a moment, and Avium joined them. I have found what I sought, but it isn't as simple as rummaging through old books to find a spell. I think that is what King Hothel thought. But Rusus magic has a complexity unlike other things. Some would say our magic is not real magic at all, not when it does not come directly from our hands like ice or fire. No, this is a lost magic in the vein of dwarven ingenuity. Rungar scanned their surroundings, seeing a small host coming their way. But this is not the place to have such a discussion. The hosts were wearing red robes and holding banners of white and black. Each of them also held curved golden staffs, and as they formed a half-circle near Evern and the others, the Shadow Elf prepared himself to fight. Another two of the hosts came running up with a large box that they set at the center of the half-circle, and a man with a long white beard stepped up onto the box. The people had begun to flock toward this makeshift assembly. People of Radenba, the strong rock of the northeast, hear our proclamation and revelation. Listen to what the god of man has spoken. People of the north, a shadow of the old ones of the old gods, reaches out across the glacial seas and threatens your lives. All the while the elves of the west have fallen under the shade of darkness, and the woods have become the hunting grounds of bloodsuckers. Lo to the ones who do not keep faith or fall back into the old ways. I am the future. I am the one to whom you should look to for your salvation. Evorn stared in disgust as the people of Radenba bowed to this assembly. Lo to the ones who speak out against the race of men. The Protectorate will rise out of the north, a grand and strong empire meant to ensure the placement of men as not a subservient race of the lands, but as a great power. The God of Man will bless all who have faith, even in the darkness of what comes. Have faith in what comes. Evorn looked over to Rungar. His fists were bald and his gauntlets were glowing, ripples of energy rolling off his hands. There are none who can save you fine peoples of Radenba, but the God of Man. Make your offerings. At this point, a large chest was brought up from behind the half-moon of the red-robed hosts. The people of the town began tossing gold coins and other valuables into this chest. Rungar stepped forward, lifting his hands. Praise be the gods of the north, the true gods of the lands. The many commoners of Radenba turned, staring at the ruses. He threw back his hood and then bowed. I praise not a god contrived of the race of men, but ones who have stood for the people of the north and all the living realm. The truce gods, not this abomination that your ilk present. It was clear to Avern and the assembly that it called for offerings of exactly who Rungar was talking to. Truly you have reason for blasphemy in the presence of the order of men. I am Rungar, a Rusus of the old world. There was a collective gasp, for the legend spoke of Rungar and his trials against the ancient Dwemhar, and ever knew that to these people the mention of someone of that long ago was both a shock and near unbelievable. A charlatan, one of the order of men said. 
Do not listen to this man and what he claims. Know that we are your salvation in the coming tides. And what do you plan to do when a rock of fire and water comes ashore in the coming days? Rungar asked. When that which comes upon our lands threatens the cities under your protection. Praise be to Wura! Someone from the crowd shouted out. Praise Kel and Meridas, the ones who guard against the void demons of old, another person said. People of Radenba, the order of men shouted, do not fall back into the ways of magic, but believe in what is to come and the might of the Protectorate. Our armies will protect all cities. The city-states of the North have unified under one banner for what comes. This man of tricks cannot protect you. Guards, seize him. Immediately, the city guards swarmed Rungar, but before any others could act, the Rusi surrounded himself in flames. He lifted his hands, lightning surging off his gauntlets. I am not your enemy, and I will not harm those who act under force of oath. Stay back. The guards faltered, looking at one another, none wishing to push forward. Avern glanced at Avium, who stood ready with her spells circling around her fingertips. Ordak and Melia had their hands on their hilts. Seize him now, the man of the order shouted. One of the guards jabbed his spear toward Rungar. The Ruses grabbed it, causing the wood to burst into flames and shrivel. Kill him! In the name of the God of Man, kill him now! But the guards fell backward, throwing down their weapons. Brothers, together! the priest shouted. The red-robed cult revealed wands of silver, lifting them up. A curling red magic surged upward, forming a great beast of blackness. The God of Man has come upon us. Bow or be destroyed. The people screamed. The clouds above Radenba turned black, and Rungar floated upward. At this point, Ordak and Melia had drawn their blades, and Evium floated up just behind Rungar. Evorn and Rassi stood ready, but Evorn knew Rungar did not need their assistance. The people lay upon the ground, children cried out, and infants wailed. The God of Man is angry and will not tolerate such blasphemy, the priest shouted. There is no God of Man, only those who pretend. You are a failed race, Rungar said, but there is wisdom among you. Do not take a path to alienate yourself from the ways of magic and the gods who have protected these lands for many eons. The great beast summoned by the priests reached out toward Rungar. The Rusis screamed, sending a blast of electrified bolts snapping through the air and striking the beast. But it did not recoil. It did not bow. It did not break. The creature reached out, fogs flowing from its body. The passage between realms is thin, the priest cried out. Servants of the true god are but nearly upon our world, Rusis. Rungar floated above the people, staring down the creature. You must submit to the will of the god of man. There is no other way, the priest said, or he will destroy you and your companions. Avern could see the fogs rolling over top Rungar, and the Rusi shot out from underneath the grasp of the creature, landing among the priests and slamming his hands into the ground. Bolts of white lightning shot up, striking each of the priests. Evern expected for him to stop, but the Rusis didn't. His bolts grew in size, enveloping each of the priests, causing all of them to fall into trembling masses as their skin was burned black and they reached out. Rungar ceased his spell. The priests struggled to stand, and the entity they had summoned reached down at the cowering townspeople. Avorn and Eviam rushed forward, summoning their wards to shield the people. Rungar turned toward the beast. Evern had expected it to flee or vanish when the priests were struck, but it did not. Misla comes, and with it comes my kind. The way between realms is but a thin pathway that few of our kind can walk, but we have come upon your world and we will not stop. None can harm me but I will let you live so that horror may be upon you in time. The entity vanished, turning as a wisp of clouds and flowing away. The winds blew in from the north,
bringing with it more storm clouds and a warm breeze. Misla, Evern said. As Rungar looked over the priests, he looked back to the terrified townspeople. He went to the priests, kneeling. The way of magic is not oppressive, but you summon something not of men, but of the gods of old. He went to each of the priests, his gauntlets glowing gold. He was healing them, and this seemed to surprise even Evium. Healing magic, she said. Once you can master the elements, you gain access to much more beyond that of simple destructive magic. Rusis have many things that most of the world never knew of, and it is of that I have been searching. More guards from the city had come, but they were doing more for the people than seeking to further the wishes of the priests. A tall, narrow man with a red cloak appeared with many of the guards. I am the lord of this town, and demand to know what has happened here. Evern bowed. A little run-in with a demon or something. It has been dealt with. The priests of man were attacked! Evorn looked back to Rungar, who was assisting one of them up. A misunderstanding, one of the priests said, his own face scarred from the Rusus's lightning. Your city can fend for itself. If it is destroyed, know this Rusus has brought damnation to you. The order of men will not protect you. The priests hurried away, moving toward the northern gates of the city. What truly happened here, Rusus? the Lord asked. I let you into the city vaults and you bring darkness here? I only answer the call of need, Rungar said. My companions and I will depart shortly, for I seek to protect all here and elsewhere. You do not buy into this god of man, do you? The Lord shook his head. My faith is in the north, in Ether, but there is much talk of the other in the city-states. Keep faith, Avium said. The gods will not abandon us. She protected us, a townsperson said. She and the other one, they shielded us from the beast. Then Etha does guard us, the lord said. Radinba shall offer praise and offerings to the gods of the north. What we lack in fighting men we shall entrust to the gods. Does this place not have a standing army? Evern asked. Our soldiers have departed for Lokam. Their families are proud, but we have united to protect the entire coast, not just our home here. Rungar nodded. Good. I depart soon. I have found what I sought in your vaults, and I will return it when I can. Old trinkets are of no value to me, but I have kept it since this city was found to have the vault. I know not what I have, to be honest. In time I will help you with that, if I can, Rungar promised. For now I go with my companions back to the inn. The Lord bowed. Know that you have a home here, Rungar of the Ruses. I would offer my own estate, but my wife is ill. Many more have fallen ill since the change in the air and the coming of what you say is a great evil. My condolences, Rungar said. The inn keeps me well. Please instruct your people to offer praises to Etha to cleanse the city of the filth of the demon that was here. Burn sage in the cooking fires. He motioned at Evern and the others, and they began away from the center courtyard as the Lord began to address the people further. Do you not want to hear what he says to them? Ordak asked. It doesn't matter, Rungar said. There is little I can offer but guidance to these people. We have work to do. Part three. The Rusus answer. They returned to the inn with haste, with the exception of Melia and Ordak, who went to the bar for a drink. Evurn and Aveum went upstairs with Rungar. It is better the other two do not know the details of what we must do, Rungar said. We can trust them, though, you say? Evurn nodded. Ordak has been a friend of mine for some time, and Melia has not given us any reason not to trust her. Good, then, Rungar said. I tell you, it is good to see a friendly face. Since I left Taria, I have had little positive interaction. This anti-magic sentiment is strong. King Hathul has been friendly, but my reception elsewhere has been less than great, to be sure. 
How does the war go? Aviam asked. If you're asking if Fadis and Kirla live, they do as I understand it. They struggle to determine a way to stop the rapid spread of vampirism, and they cannot find the queens. Castle Taria is a strong point, but in the lower valleys the dwarves and elves have faltered many times. They build a wall in other places, but I do not think that the war will be won with walls at this point. When Sailmark burns its own forest for a clearer line of sight for its Dwemhar weapons, you know the war is at a tipping point. Though Fadis has built up the rangers of Taria into quite a force, even in the short amount of time he has been pushing his place in the war. But enough of that. Rungar reached into his pocket and pulled out a strange triangular device. This is what I sought. My mind is not what it was when I was younger, but there is a weapon, a device that we had planned to use against Ayaklo. I think it is still intact. You think? Evern asked. I do, but I cannot be for sure until we get to Kiva. Kiva? As in the mountains west of Sailmark, north of the Vindus Sea? I had thought we'd have a realm ship in Valrin. We have a ship like it, but it is an older version. Then we must take it and depart. There is much neither of you know of the great cities of the Rusis, but there is one that is hidden in a valley, one that even the Dwemhar didn't find. I have the way to it, and this, he said, motioning to the triangular device, is our key. And this weapon will work against Misla? Eveam asked. Misla, as I have seen it, is but how Iclo was when it first came from the clouds. A burning pillar, a sign we thought of the gods until it vaporized our first city. We had prepared our weapon, but then Iclo was brought down from within, as you and I all know from our time before. Ever nodded. I had never heard of Rusi's weapons beyond that of magic. Elemental magic is but a taste of the power of elements and such. I was of the Templar warrior class in my time, but just like the Dwemhar used crystals, we had our ways. Though perhaps not as refined, we had plans. It was captured Dwemhar technology that gave us the ability to attack Ayaklo. We used suits of iron and crystal, literal vessels that we put around our body to get into Ayaklo, but this will not require us to get within Misla. We cannot risk failure, though I fear what magic will come of this weapon. What is it? Evern asked. It is like that which is fired from a crossbow but fueled by gases and fire. It carries a weapon within itself, a stronger weapon than iron or magic alone. Misla is not of this realm. It is still within that which Marag comes from, or is. Misla will enter our world, Rungar said. With it, the energies it brings will strike the northern coasts, and I fear threaten to swallow up the land. We will be ready, but we will not wait. I believe we must move as soon as possible, or risk further pain and suffering. Evorn sighed, standing up. He walked around the narrow room the Ruses had called home, and Avaim pried his mind. I wish you wouldn't do that. My apologies, but we can both see you are troubled. Valrin may have his own plan, but we don't know that. But this weapon will just disable Misla, like what was done to Ayaklo. Rungar shook his head. This weapon was meant to destroy Ayaklo. That is all I know. All you know? Evern asked. This was your idea. It is my only idea. I cannot say for sure if it will work or not. I wasn't even sure what was going on when I left from under the veil of the Black Moon. The moon is still as it was? Aviam asked. It didn't end. It hasn't. Taria is under a shadow that remains dark now. What sunlight was there before is only shining down for a mere moment of time. It is what powers that which threatens the lands even before Misla and the changing seas. Now, it is like those of these lands are squished between two rival forces. This isn't even talking about the dead creatures washing in from the oceans. We pray to the gods, but yet the world still falters. Evern said sarcastically. Do not doubt them, Rungar said. I do not. The gods may act, or they may not. With so much at risk, 
we cannot put any faith in that which we cannot see. Ordak and Melia were coming upstairs about the same moment that Evern and the others were coming down. We wondered when you were coming to join us, Melia said. Got a game of cards about to start up. Figured you'd like to join us, Ordak said. Hey, Viam, you'd be particularly good, I'm sure. He winked. No time, Evern said. We depart back to Srun. Evern could tell his words annoyed the half-orc and thief, but he didn't have time to worry about such things. As Rungar departed ahead of them to get his own horse around the back of the inn, Aviam and the others mounted theirs. We missed the plan, Ordak said. I know. Those drinks could have waited. Right, you surely are, Melia said. They were sour. Not at all like what I like. I thought this place traded with dwarves. Proper ale is getting harder to come by. We had our issues in Silir, but that made sense. Rungar came riding around the corner on a white horse with strange green eyes. It is time to go. We make haste back to Srun. Follow directly behind me once we get out of the city. This horse was the strangest Evern had seen. Even when dealing with the Falakar horse riders of the Shadowlands, who prized their pure breeds beyond anything else, he had never seen a horse that, unless his eyes were playing a trick on him, had actually glowing green eyes. A never mare, Avium whispered to him. A what? Never mare, an ancient breed from legends. I have no idea how he has one. A gift, Rungar said, from a sacred grove in the mountains east of Taria. There you'll find many secrets and even a hold of snow dwarves who have a penchant for staying unknown in an ever-shrinking world. Snow dwarves? And vampires, but not the kind like we war against, a more refined clan. But that is another story than what we need to focus on here. Come now. He spurred his horse, a green mist trailing off his back hooves. Leading them out of the city, he turned them down the road and slowly began galloping ahead of them. Evern was just behind him, making sure to follow as he had said. The faster the Nevermare went, the more green dust flowed off the back of the creature, and the faster they all seemed to be traveling. Evern kept a close watch on the road ahead, but he began to see the stars shifting slightly above them and the moon trailing across the skies. Before he knew it, they were at Srun. That was no more than a few minutes, Melia said. How did we get back so quickly? The Never Mare were supposed horses of the gods. They could move across the lands with haste, but that was only from the point of view of the riders. Yes, I simply sped up our journey, Rungar said. But in the mists of the Never Mare, your body is restored beyond that of any mere sleep or tonic. We will remain renewed and strong for many days, a blessing of my own for those who go with me to that which has been lost. As they came to the perimeter of Srun and could see the torches burning atop the massive structure, Evern spied several other horses with stout riders coming in from the east. As they all began to dismount and begin up the road to Srun, one of the stout figures, who was one of the only ones holding a torch, peered toward them. If that is not the crew of the Ayla Sunrise, then I'd be better to have my beard trimmed and my hammer broken. Nurokas, Evern said. Hammer songs have come here? Oh, yes. The dwarves are moving up the coasts all the way to the eastern mountains. But once I heard the elves were sending True Song this way, we had to ensure that the dwarves did not abandon our ally, King Hathel. Haradar's forges are alight, and we bring shipments of spears this way. I did not expect Valrin and the crew, though. But where is he? He is away, Evern said. We work with another to assist the Stormborn. The hammer song approached and bowed slightly. Nurokas of Haradar, friend of Valrin and the crew of the Aela Sunrise. Rungar, he told him. Rungar, the Rusus. I know. Everyone thinks I am dead. I am not. Hello. Nuroka smiled, then let out an exuberant laugh. By Throka's beard, this is a surprise. Come, come, let us speak with King Hathel and then have a drink. I would much like to hear what has transpired. 
We cannot, Evern said. We have dealings elsewhere. Rungar looked to them. I will advise the king of our plans. Go, prepare your vessel. I will come as soon as I am done. Rungar departed. Well, my hammer songs and I intend to be ready for whatever Itsu tricks are in store. Itsu? Evorn asked. The priests of man. They claim they have their own god, but it's nothing but an Itsu. The Itsu cannot enter our world, Aveum said. Well, they are. Our sages claim that the stars have opened up a portal near this thing that comes from the ocean. The elves speak of a great desolation upon the world, and not just that which is in the west. The dwarves of High Rock haven't been in contact with us since the first whispers of vampires. We had planned to join the fight in Taria, but this took greater concern. We will sort this all out, just like we did with the pirates in the glacial seas, Naroka said. Evorn nodded. They were surely dealt with. They were. Rugag runs their fleets now. He's sworn fealty to Haradar and protects the northern coasts. The dwarf pirates assist us? Aviam asked. Seems there's nothing to pirate with the oceans warming. We're paying them a bit, but they seem to have had a change of heart. We'll take it. He smiled at Milia. Quite a dame you have. I do not remember you or the orcish one, but good to meet you. The dwarf took a swig from a pouch. I brought some victory ale, too. We can't have it go to waste by dying. I'll go speak with the king, settle in my people as best the dwarves need. You go get that ship ready. As Nurokaz departed, Aviam and Evern looked at one another. It doesn't take one with Dwemhar powers to tell that I think he intends to join us. Avern led them around the cliffs and down to where the Nakri was still moored. Now there were dozens of other vessels of varying sizes. Of particular note were the largest of the ships. There were four of these vessels, and they were almost the size of the Nakri. Aaron waved at them from the deck of his own ship. As Ordak and Melia attended to the Nakri, Eveum began looking through some stacked boxes near the ship. My friends, I have brought supplies for your ship. Not much, but dried fish is always good. I even tossed in some pipe grass and ale. Thank you, Evern said. He noticed that Aaron had an even larger assortment of weapons in his ship now. From large spears to a stack of large iron balls stacked meticulously at the aft of the ship. Oh, you see my little surprise. A bit of dwarven ingenuity. They came in earlier. We plan to make a line of these to protect the coasts in this region. You sail into them, and your ship becomes a broken flaming corpse carrier. Well, a carrier as it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Might even work against the sea monsters. Did you find Rungar? Ever nodded. We did. We will depart immediately to try to enact his plan. Rusus alchemy, some kind of weapon. Aaron took out his pipe, lighting it in one of the torches along the dock. As he looked out across the ocean, he looked back to Evern. We have fifty sailing vessels here. Another one hundred patrols the outer perimeter. We are making two fleets. One to protect Srun itself, and the other to sail into the storm. Into the storm? Aaron puffed his pipe. Into the storm. I'll be leading that sailing trip. The Protectorate has few actual sailing ships. The dwarves have even less, though a group of pirates have pledged to protect their coastlines to the east. I'm not too trusting of pirates, but it is what it is, and I'm not the king. So you're the only seaborne response for the north? Aaron smiled, looking down. My father used to say that we didn't need anyone else. That a few good islanders with favorable winds and keen blades, he laughed. You could take the entire ocean with that, but I've seen these monsters that have been popping up. Rugag stopped here not too long ago. Rugag is the leader of the dwarven pirates and... Oh, I know him. Well, he's on our side. He said that beneath Misla hides a massive fleet. It seems that it may be larger than my own. I only saw creatures, but I wasn't looking to scout it, Evern said. The Meridah's priest Makli and the leader of another pirate fleet, Karak, they faced off against the fleet, 
but I believe it only part of it. They do not fight as the ships you are used to. They use energy-based weapons. They can cast magic from afar. Aaron sighed, looking over at his ships. That sounds about as I expected. I just lacquered the railings a few weeks ago. Looks like they'll get messed up again. Yvorn looked towards the great fogs veiling the island. Aaron, you speak of fleets. You mention some to the king. I have been alive for many, many moons, yet the island nation is a mystery to me. You are not just some islanders of the race of men. I've seen enough to know that. What is the secret you hide? He bowed with his pipe in the corner of his mouth. Evern, that is a fine ship you have. I hope that when it comes time, you'll be in the water beside me. Aaron completely avoided the question. Ever nodded, sighing. He knew he'd get no other information from the Admiral. I'll do my best. Evern looked over to see Rungar and the dwarven hammersong Nurokas approaching them. Time to depart, Rungar said. And the dwarf? The dwarf is joining you, Nurokas said. My hammer songs will prepare what is needed, but Rungar here might need a bit more muscle. He leaned in with a wink. I'm that muscle. Ordak looked up at that comment, which was rather loud. Evern could tell that Ordak took this personally, and the dwarf smiled, looking directly at Ordak. It was clear Nurokas had no intention of trying to hide it either. What do you want, orc breed? Looking to kiss me? Nurokas said with a jovial tone. No, just wondering why a short-bearded dwarf is joining us. Nurokas jumped onto the deck of the ship. I'm not too sure of you or your lady friend here, but Aviam and Avern, not to mention Valrin, made quite the impression on me. If I can assist Valrin in a more direct way, point me that direction, but I will go with y'all. We're all friends, to be sure. Good to be with you, orc. Or I guess half-orc. You look too tall to be a cave sniffer. He bowed deeply. I'm just a measly dwarf. I won't get in the way and I don't have a short beard. You're a hammer song, Melia said. Not just a measly dwarf. Right you are, Nurokas laughed. We need any allies we can get, Rungar said to Avern as they walked toward the Nakri and they both observed the crew. He volunteered? He did, Rungar said said he knows you and your crew. He does. We had a short run-in with him and his kind quite a while ago. Hammer songs are fine warriors, and King Hathul spoke highly of him. I have not been to the Kiva region is a very long time. I do not know what exists there now, and hammer songs were the greatest of warriors in the dwarven line the last I can remember. It was dwarves who sealed the void as I and Riakar fought the demons. He sighed. Those were much simpler times. Simpler times are what we see when we look back, ignoring the times that seem overwhelming in the present. I guess we're just getting older? Evern laughed. I guess. Ship's ready, Milia shouted to Evorn. And where'd you find such a strange woman? Rungar asked. Strange? She's excited about something that most certainly can lead to her demise. The race of men, with all their problems, still have the heart of an eager fifth race. A desire for adventure, worth, and what not. You know, I remember a time before the race of men. They boarded the ship, Rungar and Evern going to the helm, as Ordak and Nurokas brought on the last of the cargo that Aaron had given them. In a few moments... They cast off and turned out to sea, the crystals on the ship coming to life and a low hum roaring beneath them. The Ayla sunrise was quieter for sure, Rungar said. As they began heading northwest, bound for Taria waters, they looked back to see the torchlights of Srun. You said you remember a time before men? Evern asked. I do. They served their purpose, to be sure. Stopped us from fighting as we did. Then we fought bigger wars in more desolate places. It's what annoys me of what happened in Redinba, but they are not completely wrong. We have brought suffering to them in our time. We do not fight for the naysayers, 
We fight for those like Srun and those who mean no ill will. Rungar coughed and looked back across the waters. But that's the actual issue with the race of men. We must fight for them even when they're wrong. You must, Evern said. Evern shifted the path of the ship, watching the winds engorge the sails. The moon was rising in the distance, and it had a unique purple hue, a strange color. Strange of a shadow elf to be this far west. Faris told me you were in the glacial seas. Some forget where they came from. Others try to forget. That is what I'll say of it. My allegiance is to Valrin and the path of the Stormborn, to Ivium, to Ordak, to even Melia. I cannot fight for every soul that resides in the north, and I already carry great dishonor with me. Rungar leaned on the deck of the helm, looking down to Avium and the others working to organize the supplies. You may carry a dishonor from another time, but that doesn't dilute the acts you do this day and tomorrow. The past is not what we think it is in our mind. We keep the past alive with constant thoughts of it. But even that of our past has moved on and made a new path forward. That is how I must believe and embrace in my own mind. I lost many in the fall of Rinnegris, but then I look at others, like that baby back in the village. What was his name? Garoa. I look at Garoa and others rumored to live in hiding, and I see what I still fight for. I hope you never see the Shadow Elves of the East in a state of complete annihilation. I hope your cities are never raised before your eyes for the ideals of another. I honestly thought I was alone, save for the other one. He paused. Wait, Bri. Where is she? Bri gave her life in this fight against Marog. She died above the seas where Ayaklo was. Avorn looked to Rungar, who slowly slumped down with his back against the rails. He buried his head into his gauntlets and then grimaced, slamming his left arm down into the deck. There was a flash of frost from his fingertips, and Aveum, Ordak, and Melia looked up. Rungar used his other hand and shifted fire into ice, creating a bright ball of energy before tossing the energy straight up. Evern followed this strange magic, watching as it went higher and higher before it became like that of one of the many stars. It grew bright blue for a moment and remained the brightest star in the sky. Did you just create a star? Milia asked bluntly. I guess that is what you call it, Rungar said. Many of the stars you see high above you are remembrance marks for the Rusi's race, a gift given to the night sky in honor of those who fell. It was once something that was blessed upon only the greatest of Rusis. There was a time when I could look up and point to those who were my friends, those who were of my own line, and those heroes of the times before my life. He shook his head. But I can't remember any of those. So I give new ones as I see fit. That one was for Bri. The one who woke me up at Castle Taria allowed me a new path. He stared at his gauntlets. These hold the last of what I remember of the Golden Rusis magic. At a time before now, Rusis could craft a river's path across a field, change the phases of the moon, and even control that of the Nether Moon. Nether Moon? Avium asked. There is no knowledge of the Nether Moon in this time? Rungar looked at each of them. Milia lifted a bag of tea and carried it beneath them. Truly, you know of it, wizard? Rungar asked Evern. I have heard of a force, an invisible source of energy for some who use magics, but I have never sought it, he told him. I have heard the name, I guess you could say. Not even you, Evium. You use Rusis and Dwemhar magics, yet you do not question the Black Moon over Taria. The Nether Moon is an object of great size that comes and goes in path with our own moon. It moves through the vast blackness beyond our living realm, and it is the power of the Nether Moon that blends the realms into one another, a creation of a passageway that allows the gods and those of higher magics to move through the realms. It is the light we see in our dreams and upon death. It is a sentient being, some say. But that is along the lines of belief that every tree can walk the grounds in which they are planted. Tree walkers are real, Ordak said. 
There was one on Ayaklo. Rungar laughed. Oh, I know they are real, but it is more the point that all the trees will get up and walk. Has such knowledge been lost to the world? I assume the elves know, the high elves, Evern said. The wood elves of Taria no doubt may know, but those of most realms do not put as much belief in the old esoteric as compared to that of newer teachings. Runic magic has also fallen away of favor. Now, some only care of using a wand to throw fire and killing something. The finer details of magic are not so common. Melia returned with a pot of hot water and several cups of blended herbs and tea. She made her way, serving each of them. Good for a thief, Ordak teased. I worked the tavern before my thieving days. Kept me from being pulled into some bed back in Siller. That and my dagger. What do you think of all you have seen, child? Rungar asked her. I think the world is complicated. That there is more than what I understood back before I met the crew. You started talking about a nether moon, and I knew it was above my mental capacity, so I made some tea. Rungar nodded. Well, you must fight such thoughts. Huh? You act subservient to those above you, but that was never as it was meant to be. Your race was created to teach us, the Rusis, the Dwemhar, elves and dwarves, of compassion, of how to foster a greater creation. In time, I believe a blending of all races and magics is the future. You must rise beyond what you think of yourself and learn the greater actions. It is what I told Kirla, the rogue now with Fadis and the rangers of Taria. Embrace your new magics. Do not fear that which we will all face together, but use it to draw out greater powers. Greater powers? Milia asked. I think you must think I've put some special herbs in your drinks to try to trick me like this. I'm a woman of Cilir, a thief. I've cursed the gods and praised them. I've slashed the throats of those who needed it. But I have no magic beyond being rather decent with a wand. Rungar grinned. You must work to learn your powers, whatever they may be. You have one who is in touch with the mental power of the Dwemhar on this very deck. You should work with one another. See if you can find what your greater powers are. The Hammer Song, who had been quiet up until now, puffed his pipe as he approached. All this talk and still, I'm wondering if we have time to be sailing so far. All this talk, and this is the first thing you care to pipe in on? Ordak asked. Was that a joke? Nurokas said, biting his pipe in the corner of his mouth. Ha, huh, I hope we get to split some skulls together, Orc. No, no, I've been hearing you this entire time, but all of it's nonsense. Nethermoons and walking trees. Talk to me about smelting and fine ale. That is the magic of the world. But I've been looking at this ship. We found a ship like this once on the northern coast, right on the edge of the eastern mountains. It was mostly wreckage, but... You see, it had this thing. That is the most definite description, Master Hammersong, Milia said. Well, it was a thing, uh... He moved his hands in a circle in front of him and coughed on his own pipe smoke. A glowing ball. It was all that really remained of the ship. It was in the center mass of the ship. Wait, Rungar said. Silver? It was, until we broke it with a hammer. Then it nearly killed two of us in an explosion but I haven't seen anything like that. Rungar went down to the first large mast of the Nakri, putting his hand on the wood. He didn't say anything, but just shook his head. He went to the next mast, the center mast, and smiled. Evium, come here! She ran over to where he was standing. Put your hand here. Do you feel it? A focus node. But these were just for meditation. I don't think... Wait, you believe it could do something for the ship? I know it will. I have seen these in the Dwemar cities. It was a focus point for meditative powers. It worked to protect their cities. This ship is Dwemar regardless of who actually built it. Focus here. Give it energy. Perhaps we may make a quicker path forward than we expected. Evern watched from the helm, seeing Evium's hand begin to glow as she held on to the place on the wood and took several deep breaths. 
The ship began to hum, and he felt them shift even faster through the water. Good work, Rungar said to Avium, nodding to Narokas. Now we will make haste. I didn't even think that would work. Narokas laughed. Milia and Ordak just finished off their teas and shook their heads. Leave it to the Rusis to add a bit more strangeness to the gathering of the crew, Ordak said. Ever nodded. It is good we have all come together, no matter the ending. We draw near the Taria coastline. Part 4. Shroud of Necromancy. Avern could feel an oddness in the air. Something else, not a shift in the winds from warm to cold, but a stillness. They made a point to ensure they avoided the foggy lands around the Cape as they sailed. It was Taria, but it felt not as it had before. They were edging close to one of the capes that they had to circle around to continue their voyage. The seas were calmer here, so much in fact that without much fanfare, Nurokas, Ordak, and Melia retired to the sleeping quarters beneath the helm. Aveum took a place at the front of the Nakri to meditate, and Rugag lay down on the deck beside Evern, staring at the stars. You're not tired? he asked the Rusis. No, not at all. I haven't been able to sleep well when I have slept. I actually haven't been doing that much to require sleep. This sleeping at night commoner act is a bit strange. Rusis do not sleep. I spent enough time around Rusis to know that is not true. Rusis sleep. I do not. It's a difference in training. I would generally stay up for many, many nights. Back when Riakar and I used to guard the Eon Gates in North Lorraine, and... He paused. Evern looked down at him. Rossi had been curled up near his feet and began to slither around the Rusis. I am sorry, Rungar said. It is sometimes difficult to realize the world is so different than it once was. I know the pain of losing those you grew up with, having a life beyond the current. But go on. I have never heard of Eon Gates or Lorion. It doesn't hurt to hear of such places. Rungar sat up, cracking his knuckles. Lurion was the name of the northernmost landmass of the Living Realm. It is what is now the Glacial Seas in a way. The islands you know were the mountain peaks. The cities I knew are now home to fish. The Eon Gates were passages between the void and the light of the great poet, Irusada Vadin Bakra, as it was called, the eternal creator, the source of energy in the world. From that realm came the first void demons, and in such was the charge of those of the Ruses and Dwemar to throw down the beasts. What happened to the Eon Gates? They were sealed, with Dwemhar towers to float high above the surface of the Living Realm as protection to ensure they remained sealed unless opened by a Dwemhar Templar. No Dwemhar live in full form. Eliyu was the last, and he said he could feel none others upon the realm. Rungar laughed. Dwemhar are always so sure. There are always ways to hide, he said. But there is no reason to open those gates, even if one could find them. I don't plan on it, Evern said. I've had enough of time travel and portals. Give me a good fight and a clear path. As they sailed on past the cape and the high wooded cliffs, the mountains rose with snowy peaks and seemed to go on for as far as Evern could see. He had not personally ever sailed this way, but the further north he went, the more he saw of the near unending mountain ranges. If I didn't know better, I would worry I'd never see a route further west. The far north, Rungar said, it is in that labyrinth of high mountains and frozen valleys that the gods bless the coldest of colds to blow down from the glacial seas, an inhospitable region to be sure, save the snow dwarves. Snow dwarves, a strange variation. They are great tunnelers. They've connected many tunnels from their home in the mountains to roots in Taria, and even underneath the Great Bay of the North. They are safe from most everything, I believe. Except Misla, Evern said. It wasn't a completely random comment. He saw a flash of yellow lightning to his right. Far in the distance, he spotted the looming threat of their enemy approaching over the waters. 
Rungar stood up. Yes, but if I'm right, I'm confident we can bring that place down. It won't end the fight, but it will protect the lands from the threat of what I dealt with in Iclo. Ever noticed a thick veil layered over the fog, almost as if cloud cover stretched from the edges of the cliffs in this region up directly into the sky? It was not like this before. As they had passed the area before, they could see mountains in the distance. There was some fog, but this was indeed something else. This is the Vale, Rungar said. It is like a towering wall around the lands, encasing and trapping those who do not know the way out. Your friend the ranger has done much to protect the people, but in the places where this Vale holds, none may pass. A bit more than a mere ranger can deal with. He is no mere ranger, Rungar said. He searches for a way to kill the queens of the vampires, a tactic I was helping him sort out before I was drawn away. And what drew you away? Evern asked. Rungar went to the right side of the ship and put his hands on the rails. A calling, he said. A calling beyond killing bloodsuckers. I no doubt am good at what I was doing, but I had heard whispers in the air, a sense of what I told you before, the Eon Gates. I knew there was no way for those to be opened, but I could feel something entering the realm. I told Fadis of my issue, and he bid me depart and to sort out what was troubling me. He assumed it would be something to help him, I think. It seems it was something much more. They progressed down the coastline, keeping a western route to the north of Taria. Even though their journey was taking them to a place Avern had never gone, he still found himself drawn to Taria. It was strange to him. Even with all the events that had led him to the glacial seas, he had never felt driven to act and return to his old home. Yet, this place that was relatively new to him beckoned him like the call of a gull over the salty spray of the ocean. Nonsense. At least that was what he told himself. Rungar had begun to lie on the lower part of the deck, and Avium had since gone to lie down. He had never been one to listen to feelings like this. Though his own training as a shadow elf when he was younger was almost a direct relation to what he was actually feeling now. With all he had seen, he still tried to keep his focus on what was real and tangible and furthermore, in this case, what he needed to concentrate on. But to say his mind was on just directing the ship across the sea would be a lie. He had not stopped thinking about Valrin. He wondered if he had been captured, if he had been killed. But there was no way for Evern to know for sure. That sure as the gods of the North didn't keep him from thinking about it, though. Evern wasn't too sure where exactly on the target coast they were. While this was particularly worrisome considering he was the one piloting the ship, he knew that he still had land to his left. The mouth of the channel would be an obvious one, and as it was currently, though he saw nothing but darkness and fog to his left ahead, he saw a bleak darkness while behind him the sun was beginning to rise. He was still going the right way, and as the cliffs rose higher and higher on his left, he felt uniquely tired. The truth was that he had been awake for quite a long time, and while Rungar had come by several times and offered to take the helm, Evorn had refused. But just a few more moments passed, and no other than Evium came up with a cup of freshly made tea. I knew you were going to stay up all night, she said with a sigh. But I see we are drawing closer to our destination. Closer than I expected us to be at this point. Oh? Evium nodded. I can sense the channel up ahead. It's still a good ways away, but it is something other than the bleak darkness of that which is under the black moon. Taria is not in the best of conditions, Evern said. Though Rungar speaks positively of our friends, I can't help but wonder how they truly are. She handed him his tea and sipped her own. Well, I would argue that we're not in the greatest situation ourselves. It seems all of us are struggling to some degree. Melia said, suddenly coming up from below deck. Did you not sleep well? Evan asked. Oh, I slept well, she said. 
but the orc is complaining that there isn't enough wine on the ship. Tell that oaf of an orc that he doesn't need to be drinking anyway, Evern said. The water suddenly shifted around the ship, causing Evern to grip the wheel and forcing him to turn to compensate. Strange tides? Avium asked. Yes, Evern said, grimacing. It's like the entire ocean is shifting to the north. It's difficult to hold on. As quickly as it had started, it stopped. Evern looked behind them, looking for any sign of shallows or other strange abnormalities in the water, but didn't find any. A random whirlpool? Milia asked. Perhaps, Evern replied, but it doesn't matter. We're through it, and I can see the edge of the cliffs even in the small morning light. We have indeed made good time, and perhaps we even have the gods pushing us along a bit. Very soon, Rungar and Ordak were now on deck, and though he was still complaining about his lack of wine, it did not stop him from beginning to run along the outer edge of the ship. I feel like I never run anymore, the half-orc said. Back on Ayaklo, I was running all the time, but ever since I've been on this ship and the other ship, I'd really like to stretch my legs. Milia laughed. Did you not have enough time stretching your legs when we were surfing back on East Rock Island? Yes, yes, but I need to get used to doing it all the time. I think when this is all said and done, I want to live in a giant field. Then I can run everywhere I want to, not having to worry about being stuck on a ship. The plains near where we are going are grand and expansive. Most do not think of there being such large grasslands in this part of the world, but they are indeed there. I have heard very little of the Rusi cities, Aviam said. To be honest, most of what I have learned has been either about the wizards and sorcerers of the Shadowlands or the Dwemhar cities. Rungar smiled. That is not too surprising. To be honest with you, there isn't much about our people that was known outside of our own circles. It is part of the reason I'm confident our secret city has remained just that. But if it is a secret city, how are your people not there? Ordak asked. Rungar looked down. Perhaps that is a mystery I will solve when we get there. I do hope I can get some answers to what was lost and how. It was a strange occurrence, as Evern crossed from the glacial seas and directly into the path that would lead him to the Vinda Sea, the narrow passage he had been seeking for some time now. The sky to the south was blue, but for the bright sunlight of the morning sun. As it were, Taria was simply a shrouded place of darkness. While it was many weeks since the black moon had risen and the vampires assaulted the forces of men and elves, it was clear that it was no passing cycle of the moon. But their focus was on the vampires and the events there. They were crossing this narrow straight on their way toward the Cava Mountains. It is strange to me, Rungar said. You would think after so many years... Lifetimes, really, as I looked across these waters and at the lands before us, that it would be different. But strangely, it feels like it did back then. The rugged mountains directly ahead of them were a mix of dark black crags and lighter ones with snow on their tops. Many people wouldn't believe that there are many thermal pools on the mountains. You can tell just by looking at the ones ahead of us that the rock underneath prevents snow from accumulating. It was with those thermal vents burning with eternal fire down below that we harnessed that power of flame and twisted it with our own magic to create the grand cities we did. So like volcanoes? Milia asked. I guess you could say that. In a form, they are volcanoes. They just have not erupted. Our entire realm has molten rock beneath the surface. But it is only in certain parts of the lands that this molten fire is easily accessible or, in the case of a volcano, fully exposed. Though my people have beliefs that there were sleeping mountains, mountains that had fire just like all the rest, like the actual volcanoes you speak of, but had not yet exposed this truth to the rest of the world. Still, there were many forms of life around these mountains, and most of them were friendly to us. The swamps had rather interesting hominids, if you can call them that. Swamp people, fish people, or something like that. At one time there were many mutual temples between the Dwemhar and the Rusis, 
at least in the lower regions of the mountains. But that was well before the wars, and they were the first to be decimated in the opening skirmishes. How long did the Dwemar and Rusis fight one another? Ordak asked. From my point of view, they never really stopped. I can't say when the war actually ended. Ivorn noticed a shaking in the wheel of the ship before suddenly like before, but with much stronger force, the water shifted underneath the ship, pulling them in almost the complete opposite direction. Sea monster? Rungar asked. I... Ivern paused. That which was tugging them before stopped. It is something from the ocean, the tides themselves. It happened before, but this time it was stronger. While this far they had not come across any other vessels, Evern spotted several large ships at anchor some distance away. While they were keeping a distance from the ships, they noticed the sails of the ships were down. Evorn saw that beyond the ships there was a small village of some kind. You know this place, Rungar. It is not a place of the Rusis, for sure, and even from afar does not look elven, and it is built too high up with two large outside buildings to be dwarven. It must be a village of the race of men. Friendly to our cause, Milia asked. Doubtful they know too much of it, Avaim said. The tide Evorn had thought was just a simple passing pull on the ship began to tug with a stronger vigor. Though he had half a mind not to take any deviation in a straight sailing path, he soon found himself nearing the rocks of the village that the others were discussing just a bit before. I swear it's getting windier out here, Ordak said. I don't know what else to say of our predicament, but this is quite a negative one. Perhaps not being so negative about it would be preferable than what you're currently doing, Rungar said. As the two of them went back and forth, even turned the wheel of the ship and found himself suddenly engulfed in wind. He struggled with the wheel, attempting to keep them from running aground as the waters churned and tossed them. Run us aground, wizard, run us aground, the dwarf said. I've seen tides like this near my land, and if you don't do so, it will suck you right around the cape. Evern did just that, turning the wheel hard, and the entire vessel was sent sideways onto the beach. As he turned the wheel and the water continued to recede, he dropped the anchor. The ship was resting just off the coastline, a good distance away from what would be the natural coastline. As Evern watched the water pull away from the rocks and extend the beach out even further, he sighed. This was nothing like what he expected this journey to be like. Though nothing in his past few weeks was normal by any standard, even a standard as strange as his. Evern looked at their predicament. Melia and Ordak found ropes and secured them to the railings before jumping over the side and making their way across the dark sand. Rossi slithered out to see what the commotion was about. The serpent hissed. What? Did you have a better idea? Though Ever knew this was not exactly the plan he had thought would have happened, he couldn't really do too much when the sea simply left him. Well... We're not too far from some place that smells really good, Ordak said. Melia laughed. Of course, the first thing you think about when the ocean vanishes and we're moored here is to find something to eat. Eat? I'm figuring on a nice drink. Avium shook her head at both of them and looked to Nurokas. I'm sure you can handle the strangeness of coming with us? I've been a hammer song for so long. I'm accustomed to the strangest of scenarios and circumstances. The dwarf laughed, though I will say I'm not used to doing it on a ship. Well, here's your chance, Rungar said. Evern joined the others as they began a slow climb from the seafloor where the ship had been left on tightly packed sand and large black rocks that lined the coastline. The wind here, though it had periods of warm drafts coming from Misla, was frigidly cold. The barren landscape with very few trees was the general sign of how windy it was here. As they began the climb up the rocks, coming out to some form of a pathway or road of tightly packed dirt, Evern looked up to the nearest tree line and noticed that they were all blown in one direction. Further up, he could see tall pines in the mountains. And even further, 
they could see the mountains of Kiva, the place they were headed to. Turning toward the path that led them directly into whatever this village was, Ever noticed construction ahead. While many of the buildings in the city looked quite large, there was no grand keep or tower. These walls made of layered stone were being built to keep someone or something out. As they approached the gates, they were stopped short by two guards wearing a simple breastplate with leather bracers and pants. Around their heads were thick furred caps, and it was clear they expected no one to come this way, for they were both holding cups of stew, though one did shift his hand to his weapon as they approached. What business do you have? Before Avern could even begin to speak, Rungar stepped before them. He bowed. Our business is peaceful. We were caught by the changing tides. Our ship was dropped onto the sea floor. We seek shelter until the tides turn. Both of the guards scanned the assortment of characters before them. Where do you hail from? Sailmark? Somewhere further east? Avium bowed, now standing next to Rungar. We come from many places, but we come in peace. Is that not enough in these strange times? The guards looked at one another and shared a few quick whispers before both made motions with their hands for the others to continue. You make a fair point, my lady. I advise you to seek out the harbor master. He should be up to give you a correct guess on the time in which the tides will turn. For the last seven days, we've had this issue with ships getting stranded in over a dozen places. Some have never come back up to the top. Once you enter the village and you are just short of the harbor itself, turn right and head toward the lighthouse. There, you'll find a place to get out of the weather. I do suggest you seek out the wizard who came just less than a few days ago. He seems to be one of your kind of people. Ordak sneered. Our kind of people? Evern smacked Ordak. Quiet. They proceeded to the gateway that was already open, and of course, as Evern looked at both the guards, he could only think of the lack of security they truly provided. He'd never seen such poorly garbed and armed guards. They entered the village, though they still did not know exactly where they had found themselves. There weren't many people out and about. Though the weather wasn't the best, most of those outside in it were busy in the harbor, and there were more than a few heated discussions over the states of many vessels sitting with only their masts sticking out of the water. Evern and the others proceeded further inside the harbor. Looking ahead, there was clearly a path to the other end. The guard had specified for them to go to the right and to the lighthouse. Evorn could see the lighthouse, and it seemed that this particular place might have actually been the oldest structure here. My memories have returned to this place, but it is not as we see it now, Rungar said. This is a haven for magic users of the race of men. Always a strange thing to say considering their magic is not innate like Arusus, but this was a holy site, not Dwemhar not Rusus, a place of the gods. I believe it was Ether. Either way, it is a place for magic and a place for magic derived, but it seems that now such a site has just become home to the lighthouse. Well, lighthouses serve their purpose, Nurokas said, and fine drink sometimes, as Ordak brought up. Not a bad idea. Evorn paused for a moment, even as the others began down the path ahead, leading to the lighthouse and some type of tavern or inn beneath it. He knew Rungar seemed rather confident, but more confident than he expected, considering even the Rusis didn't know exactly where they were. I guess just recognizing that this place once was a holy place is enough for him. As Evern brought up the rear, Avium backed off and began to walk beside him, I can feel that you're worried this will take us down a path other than that which we were already on. Is it that obvious? Never mind. He sighed. I do not see this as a delay we shouldn't have. Right now, all things are working toward the will of the gods. I feel it. Evan shook his head and tapped his staff a few times on the ground beside them as they went. That doesn't actually make me feel much better. He chuckled. It's not meant to make you feel better but more so that you understand that I feel we are on the right path. In fact, 
The only time I felt like we were on a path we should depart was when we went to Ayaklo. I still think that the assassins were not the way Valrin should have gone. I can't say for sure, but I feel like nothing else would have happened if you hadn't have gone there. I would not have been lured by my mother. And well... Avern stopped walking. As the others began going into the bottom of the lighthouse through a rather large wooden door, Ordak looked back at them, and Evern motioned him to go on in. Avern looked at Evium, seeing the tears in her eyes. It doesn't matter now. That is the path we took, and no amount of time travel or blending of the rounds, or whatever we have done the past few weeks, can change that path. If you would not have dealt with things, then you would be dealing with it sometime in the future. The evil that was your mother, or more so, what your mother became, would never simply fade away. Perhaps we dealt with it at the best time. I don't trust the gods, but I do trust that actions become exactly when they are supposed to. We cannot control that. The gods cannot control that. It's why they hide away, soaking in the realms, dreaming of the power they once had. Not one person can control the true fate of the world. The only thing we can do is act. Bry did exactly that and single-handedly saved Valrin in a moment they should have plunged in beneath the surface. It was what had to happen. Avium smiled. It's odd that I hung back to encourage you in your turnaround to encourage me. That's what companions do. They embraced one another. Turning to the lighthouse, they both continued, curious of what was within, and Evern in particular thought of the wizard. He'd heard of wizards before within this region that was mostly down to the far south, the city of Fadabrin. As they entered into the bottom of the lighthouse, pulling the door open, it was much heavier than expected. Evern's senses were delighted by the smell of spiced tea and some form of seared meat. As they entered into a rather quaint setting that looked less like an inn and more like a reading area, they found their fellow companions already seated, with both the dwarf and the half-orc enjoying a rather large glass of ale. Already getting started, Ordak said. Mind yourself, half-orc. You don't need to drink that much. Indeed, Nerokis said. I'll cut them off after two. I don't much like people when they get drunk, and I hear orcs get drunk faster than dwarves. Well, that's a rather hurtful thing to say to your drinking friend. Not even Melia is drinking with me right now. Melia sipped her tea and looked over the rim of the glass at him with a raised eyebrow. But I do enjoy drinking. I also enjoy a bit of tea. This weather made my throat sore, the constant shift between the hot and cold. The honey is indeed the best I've had. A woman emerged from a side room and bowed to both Evern and Aveum. She likes the honey, Ordak said. Very good, I knew she would. And I trust the ales are good? She asked. Of course, Nuroka said. We appreciate your service and how quick it was. I am Linnea, the woman said, keeper of the lighthouse and historian for our happy little city. Evorn, and this is Avium, he told her. Our ship became stranded, and we were told to seek out the harbor master. That is my husband, but with everything lately he has barely been home for food, though I told him if he didn't come home tonight, I'd dump out his prized rum. She laughed, but he will be back this way for dinner very soon. Many ships have been getting stranded with the shifting tides. His job is not an easy one. From what we understand, this is a new occurrence not relatively common? Aveam asked. She nodded. Yes, unfortunately. It has blown many ships off course. I see more strangers coming to these parts than I've seen before. Even worse, I hear rumors of a great calamity in the northern oceans, a true evil but I try not to put too much faith in the word of random priests who make their way through here. I fear that is all they deal in. Fear. There is much going on in the northern oceans, but we are journeying west. I'm hoping we can get back to our journey as quickly as possible. While I don't know the exact timing of the tides, she said, 
as she backed behind the bar that ran along the left side of the room. It's typically sometime in the early night that the waters will shift back this way. It's been disrupting the fishing, for sure, but as you were probably told, there have been many vessels to go down and stay that way. Can I interest you in a drink? A bit of tea, perhaps? Aviam nodded and Evern shrugged. I'm not quite in the mood for either. I am curious of this wizard I was told about. The woman began rummaging through the bottles, finding a canister with a silver top. She set it up on the counter and began to make a VM tea. Oh yes, the wizard from the far south. Not an elf, but he smells of elven berries. Strange man, to be sure. He apparently was headed opposite of you, to the north. He is a rather friendly guy, but a bit peculiar, to be sure. He came on a ship that sank with the returning of the tides, and while most of his crew was working to procure a ship, he has stayed in the upper observatory for the last two nights. Has he not come down once? Aviam asked. No. Heard scraping on the floor up there, like if you take a broom handle to the floor when you're trying to get a speck of mud off the planks, but I haven't disturbed him, and he hasn't requested anything. I assume these wizard types to be a bit strange. I didn't really ask too many questions. He didn't seem the type to do anything nefarious. Evern sighed. Well then, I may go pay him a short visit myself. He looked to Avium. I'm sure it's nothing, but if you hear me scream, I'll be sure to send someone to help. Evern and Avium shared a small smile between one another. As Avern turned toward the stairwell in the center of the room, leading directly up to the upper portion of Lighthouse in the observatory, he looked down to the others enjoying their drinks and carrying on. I hope this is not just a peaceful calm before the horror. Evorn came to the first turning of the flight and looked out through the opening in the rock of the structure to see a balcony of sorts outside the main room where everyone else was sitting. He paused for a moment, seeing the sea beyond, as he felt a strange sense of dread in the air. He looked up the stairs above them, seeing that they led straight into a dark passage. Rossi jumped out of his cloak and onto the ground. What? Are you going to head back down with the others? Have yourself an ale and a bit of tea? Or are you going to stick with me? Rossi hissed at him, not like his typical hiss as if he were annoyed, but more so a hiss of betrayal. Well, I don't speak for you. I feel an odd presence in the air, and suddenly you jump down. I can only imagine that you were going to slither away and leave me to fend for myself. Evorn began to walk upstairs with Rossi, now moving up the flat edge of the actual stairwell at a much quicker pace. As he went up this way, he could see the difference in the stone, and the fact that parts of this lighthouse must have been made of the structure that was here before. But what actual structure was here, he did not know. With this place existing as long as it had, he had no doubt that this could have been anything from a temple to a mausoleum to something completely abnormal, which he would expect. Being that it was a holy place, it likely saw more bloodshed than most of the land around it, and as such, he did wonder what a wizard of the South would be doing for several days unattended in such a place. The air was colder up here, at least much colder than it was in the lower portion of the lighthouse. As Evern pushed himself into the shroud of shadows that hung almost thickly in the air, he pushed it off as nothing more than his mind playing tricks on him. Rasi, stay back behind me. I'm not too sure why I feel this way, but I think there is much more to this wizard. I hate being right about feelings in fate and what not. Sure, the tides change and suddenly our ship rests on the bottom of what was once the ocean not a few moments before we came upon it, and of course there would be some nefarious acts happening where we happen to end up. At least it is not a monster. That last bit of his thought he quickly pushed from his mind. As things always worked, as he was acting alone or trying to do something completely opposite, trouble would find them. And he did not want to deal with any monsters or titans, but he would put no thoughts to it being something particularly evil. Instead, he did his best to surround himself with thoughts of this 
was no more than a sleeping wizard. At least Avaim would be happy that he was thinking positive thoughts. As he reached the top of the stairwell, there before him was a wooden door with a single silver circular handle. He reached out to it, barely touching it with his fingers. He felt a tingle that went from his fingertips into his nail and up to the first and then second joint in his hand. He retracted. Rossi quickly slithered up his leg and got up to his shoulder, hissing at the door and then nibbling at Evern's cheek. Stop that! He reached out again with his hand, thinking it perhaps was a fluke that he felt the strange tinge before. Again, he felt the same. This time, the feeling went all the way up to his elbow into his shoulder. Surely this is not a simple barrier spell. It feels as if it's electrified. I can imagine a spell like that shrouding the door in such darkness. This wood is darker than the wood of the rest of the place. Perhaps it is just that much older? He wasn't going to tempt fate further by attempting to touch it for a third time. He used his staff, focusing the energy toward the tip and interacting with the magic of the door. It was a technique his old master back in the Shadowlands had taught him for getting through wards without completely destroying them. His old master, who himself was a most powerful wizard, described such an act as using a butter knife to pierce through fresh bread. He recalled the very words his master had spoken to him. You imagine that your staff is but a knife, and before you is the warmness of the bread. As you slip through it, yet as you pass through, the ward will be closed. This bread, soft as it is, will show very little signs of your passage through. If this wizard had nothing nefarious going on, he would instantly believe that Evern was a threat if Evern forced his way in. Though further, it was very strange that the innkeeper had not actually come up and checked on him, or perhaps he had been here longer than she knew, and she had some form of mind transformation spell on her. I don't like this, he said to Rossi. Either way, let's visit our friend here. He pressed his staff against the spell covering the door. With just a little bit of focus magic, he carved his way into the ward. This bit of magic was not something that just any mere wizard could master. This was similar to a type of spell useful for sneaking through the castles of the Shadowlands. Given at the point that he had learned such magic, he was not in any official capacity or of status within the Shadowlands, and had little need to sneak into said castles. While most wards were strictly to blunt or block magical attacks, this one used to push through doorways was something a bit different. As his staff split the ward, he slipped in, passing between the void that was the spell and the wood of the door before pushing his way through the door itself. The room on the other side was shrouded in a black fog, though at the very center of the room was a desk made of redwood. Above the desk was a massive glass roof with currently a view of the gray skies. He knew he was walking in the middle of whatever this conjurer had cast. Blackness billowed around him, and he kept his staff lit with the soft white glow. My friend, Wizard of Fadabring, I have come to check on you, he said. It was at that moment to his right, a woman emerged holding a staff not much unlike his, and wearing flowing purple robes. Do you? So you listen to the innkeeper, yet you do not blast open the door? No, wizard. Should I have? Or should we discuss the spell you put on her to make her think you are a he? The woman smiled. Indeed. I've been doing a bit of research myself. Something outside the laws of the college in Fadabrin. My compatriots would not see my studies as, how do you say, legal? Evern kept his staff up. Though the woman had shown no direct aggression toward him, the blackness whirling around the room was in no way calming to his senses. Legal is one way of looking at things. Dark? the woman asked. I'm from the Shadowlands. All magic is dark. I question why you surround yourself with such a nefarious and potent level of blackness. I knew the magic warding the doorway, but if I did not know better, I would say you are summoning something. The woman looked him up and down. You're not from Fadabran. You're not an assassin. Why are you bothering me? My ship was left on dry ground quite suddenly just outside the city, 
Evern said as he began to walk toward the red desk, and the woman began to walk around the desk from the opposite angle. I'm on my way to the Cava Mountains, a bit of research to do myself. Not much that way except ruins. Ancient Rus's cities. Not much for any wizard of the Shadowlands. Why are you even in this region? Evern stared down the woman. Lots of questions between us for not even an introduction so far. Call me Kenza, the woman said plainly. Call me Evern. She cocked her head, staring. Don't you Shadowlands types have some other name? A clan name? Evern just shook his head. It is not important. Evern leaned over the red desk and saw an open book with several astrological symbols he did not recognize. Do you not understand what you see? Kenza asked. I understand that you're doing something here that you'd prefer others not know. If you lied about your gender to the innkeeper, I have to imagine you've been here longer than just a few days, correct? Indeed, she said with a smile, closing the book. I've been here for three weeks. A friend of mine back in Fadabrin, rather peculiar wizard, saw into the future and saw something dark from the northern reaches here. Just my journey from Fadabrin around the far western cape of the Desert of Lost Sands and finally across the sea to here was much more precarious than I expected. Initially, he had sent me to investigate that which was going on in the glacial seas, but as I came upon the Vindus seas, I realized that the predicament was much worse than we had believed. You ask what magic I'm setting up, and considering you didn't blow open the door, I don't think you're here to kill me. Still early. We just met. You could try, wizard. Well, since I didn't just blow open the door you pointed out again, perhaps you care to explain yourself. Furthermore, explain why you have essentially hidden here for several weeks, doing whatever manner of things you are doing. Kenza smiled, motioning for Avern to follow her to the area where she had been standing before. Here, Evern saw many more books open on a long wooden table of the same design as the desk. From here, too, he looked out the window to see the city and many ruined ships sitting at the bottom of the harbor. I'm here to shield these lands, Kenza said. Evern looked at her. And you treat it as if what you do is illegal? Indeed, some would say it is. I set a necromantic spell from here to the border of Sailmark. It has taken me some time, but... I prepared a rather defensive army, if you will, to protect these lands. Whatever comes from the north is not natural. I do not even believe it is of our realm. We have seen great destruction. Furthermore, and you've done nothing but support this by your presence here, I might add, I saw the light coming from the Shadowlands across the seas all the way to these shores. I figured I should position myself here of all places just in case that light took form as something. And you appear to be that. Evern smirked. I do not consider myself much of a light, but if you're practicing necromancy in these lands, I question why those in Fadabrin wouldn't simply embrace this. Necromancy, when used responsibly, is a viable defense against many intrusions both of the physical and the spiritual world. Kenza laughed. I am happy to see that there are others who feel this way. That is not the belief of those who rule Fadabrin. Evern shrugged. I have no advice to give you. I cannot say if I am a source of light or darkness, but I'm trying to help the one called the Stormborn. What comes from the north comes from a different realm, and I will not stand here and explain all the finer details to you, but just know that the power emerging from the clouds and shifting the winds from cold to warm, destroying every aspect of our land, is just but a taste of what's to come. It is an ancient Dwemar, a dark spirit who has taken physical form. The weapon he brings to our realm is capable of burning cities from above. Kenza's rather stoic and confident demeanor seemed to shatter. She gulped, taking a deep breath. What kind of power is this? I have heard of dark wizards and found them. I've even heard of the vampires in Taria. What is the cause of this madness? Greed jealousy, and one old Dwemhar, who sought to perfectly pull all the darkness from himself to ensure he did not fall to said darkness, but that which is evil, much like the good, always tries to find a way. In this case, with one with studies such as you have, 
I can explain that evil forces, the entity that was the Dwemhar, inhabited a vessel, and that vessel lived on. The reforms of magic I do not understand. It created a body through the sacrifices of many. Now, it has somehow managed to bring something from another timeline, another reality that is beyond our own, into this one. Kenza looked down. Evern could tell she was searching her mind. He didn't expect her to have answered any of this, but it seemed that she did know something, and quite surprisingly, she pulled out a small black book. What is it? Evern asked. Kenza was flipping through the book. Coming across a certain page, she tapped the page three times, and an image appeared out of the book with a wisp of green smoke. Evern could see skeletal remains flowing up into a central figure. I know the spell is necromancy, as you might not be surprised to know, but normally it is a person who practices necromancy, who either focuses the energy of other living beings, or his own magic into himself, or herself to create a lich. But the spell would not work for simply malevolent energy to take physical form. It would take something beyond mere magic, something perhaps from the gods, but no gods of the north to do this. Avern stroked his chin, looking over at Kenza. Do you think it was a god, just not the northern ones? Do you think the Itsu to truly be involved? I know that my task in all of this is to protect these shores and much of the southern regions. In the vision of one of my masters, they saw the dead overrunning this place and quickly coming like a cloud down to the south. Within the dead, they saw masks, floating masks. More so, there have been whispers of the nether moon. The evil that became that which we call Marog inhabited a mask before it had a physical body. Its servants wore masks to control their every action. Even my companion was under the control of Marog at one time to the powers of rings that were forged in the Dwemhar forges of Aieklo. As for the nether moon, that was but a story told to young gullible wizards. Some believe that, but you can feel something in the shadow of the black moon. A form comes beyond it, growing in power. Some say it was a lost god who took up presence beyond the moon. So much is strange these days that even this seems possible. Evern stroked his chin. I do not know. What we know and teach one another is simply as we all understand it. Kenza sighed. I do not give you much reason to trust me, but I thank you for doing so. I feel like in the future, alliances such as you and your crew and myself will become more important. Eivor nodded as Rossi jumped out of his robes and began to slither around on the floor. An albino snake! How wonderful! Is this your companion, Eivor? Yes, this is Rossi, and he has been beside me for many, many years. Kenza knelt to pet the snake on the head, which actually surprised Evern, but Rossi allowed it. Perhaps if you mean no harm to the people, you could release them from the spell you put on them and simply exist here for a time. These people are not a threat to you. They're simpletons, but need protection from greater evils. They will not bother a magic user such as you. I understand your point, she said, standing back up, but not everyone comes in this village, especially now with the changing tides in the sea, with good will in their hearts. For now, I will keep it as it is. You can tell the innkeeper whatever you like, but I will remain here until whatever comes from the north passes, though if you're going into the Cava Mountains, I recommend you and all your companions keep guard against necromantic creations. Though there isn't much else there, it is simply a place of necromancy in the eyes of those in Fadabrin. Many who practice such arts spent time there, and though I have yet to do it myself, I would hope you'd be on guard to such things. Thank you for that bit of information, Evern said with a bow. Part 5. An Echo of the Lost. Evorn began back down the stairs. It was strange to him to be leaving this magic user as he did. While necromancy was not uncommon in the Shadowlands, even there it was not exactly a preferred way of magic. Though he had no personal issue with it, in his younger years, he had hunted many necromancers, and when he hunted them, it wasn't just a capture. Passing back down the stairwell, 
Leaving the dark magic to float in the air behind him, he hoped that Kenza would do as she said, and at the very least choose not to continue the enchantment she had on this village. But the pure fact that one had taken such action, especially considering how rash an action it was, to protect the city, villages, and the region in general was concerning. As he made his way back down, Aviam saw him and set down her mug of tea. So did you find the wizard? Ordak asked. I did, and she can remain as she wishes. She will not be of help to us. The innkeeper looked over to Evern. So, she's okay? She? Melia asked. But I thought it was a he. I thought it was a he wizard. He wizard? Ordak laughed. You imply something like he's not a normal wizard. He is a he wizard, he repeated, placing extra emphasis on the he portion. Evern went to the innkeeper. What do you know about this wizard? Well, she is a mage from the south. Her name is Kenza. Evern smiled. Yes, and she is well. She means no real harm to you, the harbor, or anyone of this village. As he began to make his way toward the sitting area with the others, Aveum simply stared at him. Of course, he knew exactly what she was doing as he looked toward her, and she simply nodded. Evan was surprised that Kenza had so quickly kept up to her end of the supposed deal, if he could call it that. To be honest, Evern found her blatant honesty quite refreshing, though he never really gave many necromancers a chance to be honest in the past. As Evern took a seat on a wooden bench off to the side of the others, he could smell a fragrance in the air that was not prevalent. At this point, he noticed that there was a small platter of grilled fish that had already been well gone through by his companions. But almost untouched by most of the others was a bag of tobacco, to which he helped himself to, feeding his pipe and looking over to Rungar, who was deep in thought, his hand up to his chin, and his eyes focused on the floor. It was only a few moments before Rungar noticed that Evern was looking at him, and the Rusi stood up, and without saying anything to anyone else in the room, headed outside to the balcony. Though, of course, such a random act by any of them would have aroused suspicion. Evern shook his head as Avium went to stand, and instead quietly excused himself to follow the Rusis. Avorn made his way across the room and to the opposite side of the door. Here there was another door that led out to a balcony with a view of the sea. He found Rungar leaning over the rails, and before he even got within ten paces of the Rusus, Rungar turned around and his eyes traced up the tower. I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't expecting to immediately need to rush into combat against that necromancer, he said with a nervous laugh. So easy for you to sense I did not tell the full story, Evern said, using his staff to ignite his pipe and puffing several times to light the tobacco further. He exhaled a plume of smoke, and Rungar just turned and looked out to the sea again. Both of the men remained silent for some time, before Rungar made a point to look back behind his shoulder at the tower. The city is rancid with death magic, but I saw no undead. I knew it had to be a protection spell. So what's her name? Kenza. I guess it doesn't really make much of a difference. All the necromancers I knew back before the time shift in my mind are no doubt dead. I don't believe necromancy to be an acceptable form of magic even in these dark times. Evern sighed, coughing on his pipe smoke. We have necromancy in the Shadowlands, lands I spent most of my time hunting, said necromancers not engaging in such activity. But unlike some races, Shadow Elves do not see forms of magic as being good or evil. It's more about their use. In this case, I believe she uses it for the right thing. Apparently, some seer or psychic or something down in the city of Fadabrin has seen the darkness. She has seen the darkness. I guess in some form, all of us must do what we think is necessary. Is that not the mantra that you and your kin took on when Ayaklo was upon you? Rungar nodded. But it is not something that we did joyfully. It was an act of desperation. 
Perhaps you should have embraced necromancy before then, not as an innate skill of the ruses, but like others who have to use magic or choose to use magic, you could have figured out a way. I can hardly see how necromancy would have helped us against a weapon such as Ayaklo. Evern just looked at him with a raised eyebrow, smiling slightly because he knew the Rusis was right. There was a few more moments of silence between them, and Evern took another long draw of his pipe before exhaling and tapping the bowl of the pipe on the railing and looking out. If you will blast the top of the tower with fire magic, I'll support you with whatever you need, and we can take her down. Necromancers are powerful because they have the ability to raise the dead. It's just a simple matter of not adding to their numbers as you attempt to kill them. Rungar laughed. No, no. We need any spellcasters we can muster on our side, I say. He paused. You are a strange shadow elf, Rungar said. My people did not have much doings with the shadow elves sect, but I heard some stories. Don't listen to the stories. They are boring compared to what we really did. Both of them laughed. Evern stared out at the ocean, the layering clouds dark against murky water. The tides were still out, and their ship was still at anchor, yet lying on the floor of the ocean just outside where they were standing and looking out. Maybe we shouldn't have lowered the anchor, Rungar said. Why not? Evern asked. We don't want the ship floating away. It's not going to float away. It is sitting on the seafloor. At this point, it will just sink if the oceans return as quickly as it fled. I mean, I could slow the water, but it's still a poor decision. Well, I'm not really a captain, and if the sea swallows it up, that'll be truer. I'll have no ship. As they both laughed once again, Milia suddenly appeared between them, looking out toward the ocean. So, this is what two guys like you do? Stare at the ocean and make jokes about our demise? Yes, at our ages, it's the best use of our time. Ivorne smiled. Hello, Milia. How long have you been there? Not long at all. Ordak said for me to go get you because he had three too many drinks. It seems the harbor master is here. Ivorne, Rungar, and Milia made their way back into the lighthouse. Walking in, they were greeted by a warm smile from a large bearded man holding an even larger spear relaxed upon his right shoulder. Yet another unfortunate mishap. I would like to welcome you to my village. While I'm used to strange happenings, the happenings have been a bit too strange right now. He laughed, looking at everyone. I do hope we figured out a way to get some of those poor boats back up above the surface, the innkeeper said, leaning in to give the harbor master a kiss. Well, well... I just don't know. I'd say it's not the easiest thing to lift up wood and iron from the muddy seafloor. But, he said, looking in turn at each of them, my guards tell me that your ship is rather odd for these waters. I took a quick look myself, seeing it resting on the seafloor as it is, and I'd have to agree. You're already a strange crew, and you've got an even stranger ship. I'm Evern. Captain of the vessel. We're actually headed west from here, but the sudden change in time really threw us off. I understand from the kind words of your wife here that the tide should return sometime in the evening. Avorn, that would be correct. I am Rorim. I come from a rather long line of harbor masters, if I can say so myself. But you actually lucked out. See, most of the ships that have sunk around our village and the waters directly around the harbor were trying to get out. You were trying to avoid us completely on your little voyage to the west, so thankfully, as long as you're on board your ship and you do not sink down deep in the mud, you should have no issue actually getting up and rising with the tide. But by my reckon of the light outside, I do believe you have a bit more time here. As I now understand, quite suddenly. But I forget everything anyway. So maybe I already knew. But we have the lovely woman protecting us from some darkness approaching over the waters. I have to imagine that it's not Taria. That place has been a wreck. I actually don't even know what to think of that. Have you heard? Vampires. Vampires climbing all over the place. Rather disgusting. He laughed, making a sudden whooshing sound from his mouth. Dragons. 
We need dragons to toast all those stupid vampires. We have heard of Taria, Evern said, but there is not much we can do about that. There is greater need for us, and we hope to find some solution to the West. Rorim made a point to begin moving chairs around the bar itself. Both Ordek and Melia began to assist as Rungar remained off to the side with his arms crossed as Evern figured out this standoffish nature was pretty typical for the Rusas. I can't say too much of what's west. I used to fish out that way, but it was normally not a good area for bigger fish. The water hasn't been good that way. They say the Cava Mountains curse the sea, but I'm not too sure of that. You can still get some okay fishing, but we only go that way when there's a really rough storm in the glacial seas. But still not as good as actually going to the glacial seas. You see, I was to be a fisher when I was a young lad. Now that cold is a bit too much. But we've had warmer winds from the north than I've ever seen. I imagine the changing tides has something to do with that. I haven't seen anything like this ever in my life. This is not like anything that has come before, Aviam said. We will not trouble you for much. Your wife has already done much for us, Evern said. Good, good. Please tell others of the fine establishment we have here. Most people, when they think of this region, they think of the Seer Islands. They're nice, I guess, for an island. I remember being a young boy and going there for the gladiatorial games. But they don't really do that anymore. As the small talk carried on, a few small drinks of a strange red wine were passed around, and the innkeeper gave them each a bowl of some type of fish soup. Evorn thought it was a bit spicy in the wrong way, considering he enjoyed spicy food. But even Rungar seemed to eat this. As the light began to fade away and darkness fell, he was actually surprised that the harbor master didn't ask more questions. As a bit more time passed, Rorim began looking out toward the ocean and motioned with his hands for everybody to get up. I do reckon it's time for you to get to your ship. Though I've enjoyed the conversation and the pleasantries, I do believe it is time to go. As the others began making their way outside and back toward the ship, Avern and Aviam hung back with the harbor master. As he stepped outside the lighthouse inn, he shut the door. For a moment, Ordak looked back, and Avern motioned for him to continue on. I do not want to fight with my wife, Rorim said. They say a great pillar of fire, smoke, and fog is in the northern oceans. They say whatever it is that is shifting everything in our world, many claim that the end is coming. We'll do our best to make sure that doesn't happen, Evern said. But you're just one crew and you're not even going in the right direction. What could you do going to the west? There's nothing but broken stone ruins there. Did you see the stoic man? The one who kept his arms crossed most of the time except to eat your wife's stew? Aviam said. Course. Seems a bit shady. I've wondered if maybe he was holding a hostage. Avern and Aviam both laughed. No. That is the one called Rungar, the Ruses of old, the one of the stories, Evern said. I thought he was dead. There is much that even we have learned in the past few weeks, but he believes he can stop whatever is coming from the north, as you understand it. We are going to the ancient city, somewhere hidden away that he knows of. Rorim shook his head and hands. I don't want details. I don't want to know anything about it. Someone's coming here and following you and wanting to know something else. They won't be able to torture me, because I won't know. But I will say a prayer to the gods for you. Avern thought this man was a little eccentric, but he didn't say it out loud. Avium simply giggled to herself, and he knew immediately that, of course, she was in his head. I appreciate your prayers, Evern said, even though it cringed a little bit to think about the gods. They exchanged a few final farewells, and Ivorn and Evium hurried to join the others on the ship. They chuckled at one another as they made their way back through the gate of the village. At that point, Evorn realized that at no time did they ever actually learn the name of the village, but in his honest opinion, it really didn't matter. They made their way several paces down the road and turned off into the darkness where they could hear the water beginning to rise, 
moving with a hastening pace. Evan thought of the task at hand, their actions to keep everything safe for those who could do nothing. It was a higher calling and a noble act. But this wasn't about him. In his mind, this was about Valrin. Approaching the ship, he accidentally kicked a crab scurrying across the sand as he discovered that looking down, he was actually standing in ankle-deep water. Nuroka shouted from atop the ship, Water's coming in! You would think you are dwarves with the slow pace you two are walking. Evern and Avium hastened their pace, making it to the two ropes and pulling themselves up. Milia helped pull them both up and then pulled up the ropes. Avern made his way to the helm as Ordok and Nurokas pulled up the anchor. He could hear the sound of rushing water, like a small wave growing in size and ferocity. He looked back up to the tower where he knew Kenza was. He imagined that she was watching on, unsure exactly of their path, but ready and waiting for whatever she needed to do to protect the lands. In Evern's heart, he had to hope there were many others like her, others waiting to defend, tarrying between the darkness and the light, allies to the entire living world, not just a flag, a king, a kingdom, or some other arbitrary level of servitude. He knew what was coming would be beyond what even he himself had experienced, and for a moment, that scared him. Damn it, Valrin, I thought we'd finish this up the way we started it, away from everyone else, all of us together against Marog. All right, I'll do my part, but you sure as all of the gods are pricks better be doing yours. If you're alive... Suddenly, the ship lurched to the left and right as the water shot around the front of the vessel and he could feel the rudder shudder. Rungar focused his own magic down beneath the ship, forming ice to curve the water through the sand in such a way that it lifted the ship from beneath. Evern gave everything he had, making the ship veer away from the coast. In a few moments they were in the current itself. The dark shoreline was rushing to the right side, and its focus was not in a particular direction, but simply keeping the vessel running aground. Evan began to feel the ship evening out in the tides. The ship labored through choppy waters, and the sails of the ship were twisting and blowing in the wind as the gusts tore across the northern seas. They were moving with haste toward a general western direction. Finally, they were heading in the direction they needed to go again. In the back of his mind, Evern was hoping that the delay did not cost them any more dearly than it already had. It worked, Rungar said. At the very least, we will make it toward our destination. As the Ruses took to his typical perch just to Evern's left, leaning up against the railing, Avium joined them as well, taking up a post to the right, almost in the exact same spot Rungar was, causing Evern to shift his eyes left and right, looking at both of them. Since when did I become the focus of everyone's attention? I just noticed that you seem to be taking to the captain role quite well. Aveum laughed. Ordak and Nurokas went below deck and are attempting to determine who can outlast the other in a static arm wrestling contest. Milia is apparently an expert in such things as well, though she denied wanting to actually arm wrestle either of them. A static arm wrestling contest? Evern asked. Apparently, the idea of the game is not to simply beat your opponent, but to tire out their arm until they can't use it. Sometimes, Avium, I think that those of the future, my current present, Rungar sighed, lost a bit more than just wisdom over the years. Yes, well, you can try to hide from the stupidity, but the stupidity will always find you, particularly if you adopt an open mentality to anyone visiting, Evern said. As I understand the story, Avium said, it was your little serpent Rossi that attracted Valrin and the others, as I know you are mentioning that particular situation. Evern grumbled something to himself under his breath, impartially hoping that the other two would just leave them alone. Besides, Rungar said, if he adopted such a mentality, it would essentially mean you have to kill every single person you come across. Well, Evern said, lifting an eyebrow and staring at them. One might argue it would be a simpler life. And you are a shadow elf, 
Aviam said. You'd have plenty of food at that point. Disgusting, Rungar said. I've heard such rumors as of late regarding the Shadow Elves. You tell me cannibalism is true there, that you actually eat people? Shadow Elves used to be known for their blood magic, but I didn't think those other rumors were true. I have, I will again. As of late, I've only used such talk to antagonize the dwarves, particularly hammer songs like our friend Naroka's. The dwarf jerky is quite good. Okay, well, with that image in my mind, I will see myself below deck. Perhaps I can get some sleep. Hopefully their little arm stamina contest is done. As Rungar disappeared beneath the deck, Aviam leaned against the helm, now not looking directly at Evern, but staring up at random stars above them. Evern looked to her, wondering of her thoughts. She seemed hyper-focused and a bit erratic. Wait. She can sense that thought. He tried to shake it off, making a point to brush a bit of water off one of the handles of the wheel, but at this point she crossed her arms and kicked her leg up slightly as she leaned against him. I swear you people seem more concerned about me than is healthy, he told her. Well... I half expected you to blast the wizard out of the top of the tower, too. I know conversations are never confidential when you're around. Not really. I am a bit more in tune with my Dwemhar powers as of late. I can tell you what you don't know. Oh? He took a deep breath and shook his head. I assume that's quite a bit? Not as much as you might think. Melia, well, she is enjoying the adventure. A bit frightened, but who wouldn't be? Ordak is about the same as Melia, but has a deep confidence in your actions and Valrin's. Nuroka's duty. He believes what he is doing is the best that he could do. He's very unsure of our path, but he's not too sure of the path he takes otherwise. For him, it's more of a gamble. He figures it's worth it to try with us considering our past history. I'd say I prefer sea pirates. Seems simpler. Avium smiled. Yes, you and I both. But with that said, I can say we both have the same feelings of all of this. We're just hoping that it's not pointless. That Valrin is not dead, or worse, has joined the enemy. With that, she became silent and just stared at him. How? Evern began, but did not finish. I know, Evern, but he's been on both of our minds. Nothing about his actions made any sense. Just before that he was fighting a demon, and then you said he learned on the island his true heritage? Maybe that had something to do with it. Those moments I was blocked out from his mind, I couldn't see what I wanted to see. He seemed to have blocked me out, but I saw his most inner thoughts. One was to get to Misla and two was to make sure we were directed away from Misla so that he would go alone. Ever nodded and didn't speak. There was nothing to say. Truth was, they could not know for sure what Valrin's intentions were. They could only do what they were doing now, resist, fight. By the way, Aviam said, you're going to get some sleep, right? No, I must get us to where we need to go. It's not like you can physically remove me and force me down below deck. Hmm, she said, staring at him with a smirk. Damn it. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Avern opened his eyes and blinked, looking around to see Ordak sitting at the table and realizing that he was below deck. He had no recollection of how he got there or even going to sleep. Avium, he said. He couldn't believe she had actually done it. Of course, once his mind cleared a bit at suddenly waking up, he realized that he remembered the numbness he'd felt entering his mind as she continued to smirk and stare at him. But you've been sleeping so well, Ordak said. Avern sat up, seeing Ordak a bit clearer now as he wiped away the sleep and from the corner of his eye. He noticed Nurokas writing something on parchment. One should not knock out the captain of their ship without their permission. Evern said. But have you ever actually been made a captain? Nerokas asked. I understand the Stormborn never slept anyway. But he's all... Dwemhar or something. 
Besides, you haven't been sleeping that long. Not at least how long I would have slept had I been up and doing what you had been doing. What was it? A day or two you'd been awake straight? He shook his head and snorted as he picked up his pipe and began cleaning it out with a pick. I need at least three days to rest, two kegs of ale, and at least two and a half hogs to fill myself before I feel good. Evern stood up and walked over with his own pipe as Neurokus began to fill his with his own supply of tobacco. The dwarf quickly offered the pouch to Evern, who happily obliged. As Evern packed his pipe, he looked to see that it appeared the dwarf was writing verses. As Neurokus saw that Evern was staring at his paper, the Hammersong moved his hand over the stanzas he had written. You do not need to be reading what I have written, good wizard elf, sir. Evorn lit his pipe with his staff. It might surprise you, but I have some experience when it comes to the written word and poetry. Nurokas leaned back with one hand behind his head, flipping the parchment over to where Evern couldn't read it and sticking his pipe in the corner of his mouth. Well, this is not quite the level of academics or deep scholarly study of language and linguistics as you might have read, dear wizard. This is a lovely work of poetry for my love. Love? I did not think Hammersongs could take on a wife or husband, Ordak said. I never wanted to follow all the rules. But who is to say this is about one particular person? It is about what I would perhaps hope to find. I can't keep splitting skulls for the rest of my life. He laughed. Surely you understand that. Ordak nodded. Of course. There aren't many of my type or those of other races who might mix with my type, so I wouldn't be able to write but purely fictitious stanzas, if I could write. You spent this much time with the wizard, and you can't write? I've spent very little of my life as a so-called wizard, Evern told him. Ordak is a skilled fighter. If he wasn't, he wouldn't still be alive. I think we can all agree that a good drink, a bit of love... Fictitious or not, mind you, he said, pointing with his pipe, and a little time spent not killing things would be preferred. Perhaps soon, Narokas said, sucking a bit more smoke into his mouth. But even after whatever this is, we're doing here and will do in a few days. By my own beard, I hope we're done for a while. A bit of peace. Whispers are constant. I'm done with rumors of war. The race of men has begun to spray folly, wishing for war. There is little good in war. Aver nodded, the truth as such being what it was. Neither him nor Ordak could say anything opposing the dwarf. But Ordak, the dwarf went on, I have seen many a devilish dwarf with good hearts take wonderful wives. You must not despair, for there is always one for you, even if you don't see it. Keep yourself in the proper mind and they will find you. Evorn looked up as someone opened the door. It was Rungar with a smile on his face. We're here! All of them immediately got up and headed outside. Evorn didn't think it had taken that much time for him to sleep, and he figured there would be a longer journey to reach their destination, but he exited and looked out to see the grand mountains in front of them. Though there was no town or harbor to pull the ship into, Avium was guiding the ship toward a single stone monolith along the coast. Avern went up to the helm, looking at Avium, who was continuously smiling at him. How did you sleep? Suddenly, he said plainly, giving her a small smile back. Not much of this old world is familiar to me, Rungar said, but that monolith before us was once a grand statue. This entire region is Rusus land but it appears that like most things, time has overtaken this place. I must hope that the secret of my people remains a secret. Evern took the helm, moving them into shallow water and noticing there was a waterway that went up into the land, the remnants of an actual harbor from the looks of it. There should be a good place to dock, it appears. Though all the buildings are gone, I can see the remnants of the stone still sticking out of the water. At one point, we had a canal system that went up to one of our cities, quite a contraption that would actually lift the ship from sea level and take it, while keeping it in water, up several levels to a constructed river of sorts. 
I have never thought of Rusis as particularly ingenious with technology, Nurokas said. Such a contraption I find surprising. Why? Rungar asked. Because all Rusis you see now are cloak-wearing strangers in a town? You ever wonder where the dwarves learned what they know? Evern looked between Nurokas and Rungar, realizing that if it were any other dwarf standing upon the deck of the ship, he'd be leaping axe first into the Rusis. But the truth was, Nuroka seemed thrown off but engaged by the comment from the Rusis. Just as Rungar said, ever noticed that there was a remnant of some form of a dock, or at least a reinforced dockside area here. As he guided the ship up toward it, lowering the sails, both Nurokas and Ordak jumped off and started pulling the ship closer to land. Perhaps you should wait until we're a bit closer next time, Melia said, noticing how far they actually had to jump. You did good to learn that no one should ever question a dwarf. We can leap incredibly far distances, Nurokas said. Some of us do it over and over. Some would say we tire really quickly if we do that. The ship came to rest and as Avern looked at the mountains, he could only imagine the secrets beyond even what they would see in their journey ahead. It was like he was looking at a drawing on a parchment where he could feel the presence of what was trying to be expressed. Evern disembarked. Stepping onto a brown gravel beach, he shifted his staff between his right hand to his left as he glanced around, noticing the lack of life in such a desolate place. But it wasn't as he'd expected. Though he searched for it, he could not find any intelligent life in the traditional sense. The oddness of it all was evident with the lack of birds, insects, or even fish in the water. Well, we got here in one piece without too many hiccups, said Ordak. I mean, we had one massive hiccup. Our ship was down to the sea floor, and we weren't really sure what to do. But other than that, it all fared pretty well. Melia was walking ahead of the group, ascending a small hill to what remained of the stone road, which was half eaten by the earth and overgrown with more of the brown pebbles. There is strange coloring on the rocks. The mountains look to be a dark silver, even black in some spots. But looking here, she said, scooping up a handful of the pebbles, this appears to be of a different rock. Rungar, the stone look familiar to you. Did your people build a stone like this? Rungar knelt. Taking the stone into his hand, he quickly dropped it. Brushing his hand off on his tunic, he glanced around rather quickly. What is it? Evium said. It's stone from the desert to the south, the Lost Sands region. It's a binding stone. So what is it? Evern said, taking his staff into his hands, as he could tell the tone of the Rusis had changed from just questioning to fear. I don't remember. Part six, the hidden city. Ivorn sighed. All right, then. Just like every other place we go, watch dark places, light places, watch above, below, around, he growled. Just watch everything. You know the way from here, Rusis? Rungar nodded. That I do. There are only so many paths into the mountains, and by that I mean there is only one. He pointed ahead. The bleak pathway, with not so much as one growing plant or scurrying bug, brought them all the way up to the face of the mountain. It was here, directly next to a large silver monolith, that Rungar stopped for a moment and put his hand on the stone. The stone itself was weathered and had chips missing from its surface. Still, it stood out from the rest of the mountain. It seemed that the necromancers Kenza had mentioned had some form of reverence for it, too. There were multiple skulls set before the stone, and the remains of white candles strewn about. As he said something just under his breath, he kissed his finger and placed it on the stone. As the others came up to the stone, they paused, and Rungar noticed. He motioned for them to follow. It's just an act of good luck. While much is changing these lands and of my home, that stone has remained and will remain until the end of time. It is supposed to be the stone of creation a birthplace marker for the Rusis race. This is where the Rusis believe the first of our kind woke up when the world was still new. Though, 
He looked around at the somber surroundings and particularly the necromantic items. It has nearly been forgotten already. A few know it is that when I'm dead, even fewer will know. Let us all hope that's not any time soon. Avern looked over to Avium and back to Ordak and Melia, who were going on about something between the two of them. When Neurokus noticed Evern was staring, he quickly switched his massive hammer from his back to his hands before nudging Ordak in the back. Go on, he said. Plenty of time to talk on the voyage back. Calm yourself, Hammer Song. Millie and I were just discussing our plans to open up a nice tavern, but I call it the Silver Rock. Like most taverns, we'll have the best ale, good meat pies, coffee with cinnamon, of course. Not to mention the best beds, great for laying down after a long day of fighting, and I am sure those'll be just like this rock here, a place of creation, if you know what I mean. Melia giggled. Yes, I'm sure that'll be the same type of creation as when the great poet created the races. She punched him in the shoulder. Come on, you two, Evern said. Evern sped up, following directly behind Rungar. The path ahead was not one you'd expect to find in a mountain, nor was it something like you would see in a tower, for there were no stairs or carved windows. Instead, there were cuts in the stone that led high up into the mountains. Evorn couldn't tell how high, but it was no doubt something that wasn't done in the afternoon with a chisel and hammer. From high above, somehow the light of the sun was captured and directed downward. It was reminiscent of Dwemhar ruins, but it was not a place of glowing stones, but of natural light. There were several parts of this pathway that were darkened, and in other parts there were multiple slits in the rock, but no light. For a good distance, at least far enough to where they couldn't see from where they had entered before, they had light. In time, they came to a portion where the passage narrowed, and there were narrower columns above their heads. It was here they found actual broken-down structures of some kind. Rungar did not stop, though, which surprised Evern, but he wasn't complaining. They were progressing quickly, and Evern began to feel the pathway climb upward ever so slightly. It had been some time, and they eventually came to a portion where they could hear the wind blowing very sharply. Though the sky had not been clear when they'd arrived on the border of the Kiva Mountains, here the sky was a pure dark gray, like they'd ascended into a completely different place. But still, the rocks all looked the same. It was here they found more of the copper rock that Milia had pointed out when they'd arrived. Rungar knelt at the stone, once again only touching, and only for a moment before dropping it, dusting off his hand. I'm not familiar with what you spoke of before, Evern said. The binding stones. Are they a form of Rusi's or Dwemhar magic that I'm not familiar with? The longer I think of it and now come upon again, I do not think it is of the deserts like I thought before. I think this is something of my people, perhaps not when I was still coherent as a Rusus, and the last of my kin still fought to protect this place. I don't know, and it bothers me. They came to a rather large opening, a place where, instead of following a passage, they came to a circular rotunda of sorts. There was another path leading higher up and around the corner, that Evern couldn't see. As the others began to file in, Rungar went to Avium. You find your powers as potent as they were what we entered this place? Rungar asked. I feel resistance, she said plainly. I feel it more here than I did down at the shore. Rungar nodded, seeming more confused to Evern, almost like he would have preferred a different answer. What about anything else? Feel anything malevolent or otherwise unnatural? I can't say for sure, Rungar. Evern had never seen Rungar this unsettled. The fact that the Master Rusi seemed to be slightly out of breath, running his hands down his robe as he glanced around into the shadows around them, paled in comparison to the feelings Evern could feel rolling off the man. Nurokas, Rungar said. The dwarf approached the Rusis, and Rungar put his hand on Neurokas's shoulder. We have to keep a tight guard. I brought you for a reason. The Rusas said nothing else. Okay, 
We'll ascend the walkway directly above us. It will curve over to the left, and it should give us a view of the valley. And what will we see from there? Milia asked. You'll be up to see something, Rungar stated. Now follow me. They were moving again. Although they were not running, their pace was quicker than it had been before. Rossi jumped down from his perch on Evern's shoulder and quickly slithered to a point directly beside Rungar. Down, snake! Evern could tell that much like Rungar, Evium seemed unsettled. The fact that both the Ruses and the Ruses Dwemhar among them were not as confident as they normally were was a bit of an alarm to him. Like a bell ringing in the early morning to the shouts of soldiers on the wall of the city, he knew something was coming. He knew there was more to this valley, and there was a reason Rungar had brought Nurokas. But as it was right now, he did not know why. As they came up to the highest point directly above the area they'd been standing before, Evern looked down and noticed intricate carvings cut into the walls. Further they climbed, coming around the edge and moving up toward the left. There was a single smooth stone pathway this way. Evorn did his best to hurry up to where the others were now standing looking down, and he caught Ordok looking back at him with a saddened expression. As he caught sight of the valley, he saw that which saddened Ordak. The valley itself stretched out directly in front of them, carving a large section that otherwise would have been endless peaks in every direction. This was no place of life. There was nothing green in this valley, no birds flying above them or even ants scurrying across the ground. There was but a single river of blackened water, if one could even call it water, that cut through the valley. But it was beyond this river, beyond several broken columns and a broken bridgeway, that there was a blackened and ruined mound of rock. It was unnatural hill, and as Avern looked to Rungar, the Ruses fell to his knees. My failure is complete, he said softly. Those who went with me, those who joined the Golden Templars in an attempt to take down Ayaklo, they knew they would probably never see their homes again. But in the embrace of death, as it were, was what would assure that. We did what we did so that our homes, our people could live on. I swear to you all it was not like this then. The grand cities of the Kiva Mountains are nothing as they were before. I knew I would see this but didn't know to the extent of the destruction. Aye, Nurokis said, I've seen such destruction of my own peoples, the great dwarven homes, the palaces that we had near the desert of Lost Sands. He placed his arm around the Rusus as Rungar began to cry. Avern looked down, holding his staff crossed in his arms as Melia and Ordak both turned away. Avium, however, closed her eyes and was staring elsewhere. Is that what Iclo did? Melia asked. No, Ordak said. That looks like dragon fire. I've seen it melt such things. It looks like whoever destroyed these Rusis used dragons. Avium's eyes jumped open. She floated off the ground, stretching out her hands. As Ordak drew his blades and Milia drew her own, Evern glanced to his left and right to try to see whatever it was Avium had. What is it? he asked her. She did not respond. Her eyes were open but white and unnatural, her body bent backwards as if someone was stretching her. Avern had not seen Avium like this before. Rungar looked up at her. Curse this! he shouted, jumping up to his feet, summoning fire to either of his hands. Before anyone else could do anything, he struck Avium in a blast of fire. Evorn swung his staff around, his own magic preparing to strike Rungar. But as he did, an ethereal form snapped off Avium's body, rising like a white smoke before slowly trailing back further down the path before them. Avium was unburnt as Evorn dropped to his knees to pull her up off the ground. She opened her eyes. There is a presence. There is someone here. The ground began to shake, the stones rattling. The smaller rocks from high above came tumbling down. Ordak pointed. Nurokas, to the front of the line. We will carve a path through them. Rungar hadn't told them what they were facing. It did not stop the entire host from moving with haste directly behind the hammer song and half-orc. 
As Nurokas lifted his hammer into the air, a slight tune, a tone of melody, flowed from the head of his weapon. The thundering sound, or whatever approached, was becoming louder as Nurokas burst forward, disappearing behind the edge of the walkway ahead. Avern felt a sudden and strong, resounding quake beneath his feet. Coming around the corner, Evern saw six massive forms lying on their backs. The hammer song was in the center of them, his weapon buried into the dirt path before them. The creatures were still alive, whatever they were. Rungar immediately summoned a shattering display of lightning that turned whatever their forms were into dust. Evium no longer needed Evern to help her, but for now, the enemy seemed to be defeated. Our guardians, Rungar said. These were Rusi's guardians? Narokas asked. They were for a time. He walked over to one of the piles of ashes and rubbed his hand through them. These were native creatures to these mountains, like a typical wolf made more of stone than of flesh. But these here are different. These were dead. They're dead now, Narokas said. No, they were dead before your hammer fell. These were reanimated. This was necromancy. A necromancer? Milia asked. Not too big of a surprise, considering we were given some hint of necromancy practice here, Evern said. You're right, wizard. But these creatures were bound to serve only ruses in life or death. Still, though, there were some whispers in my people of the dead magics. Some even say the great goddess of necromancy, Mortua, was a rusus at one time. But that is something I cannot know for sure is true. She was a god before I drew the breath of life. So you are saying that there is a Rusis here? Avium asked. No, I'm saying that they are only loyal to Rusis, and these attacked us. If there is a Rusis here, he may have been taken by the enemy in some way, or driven mad by his isolation. I would assume any living being we find here to be the furthest thing from a Rusis that there is. Rungar sighed, motioning for the others to follow him. There is a smaller city down a narrow gorge ahead. It is here our path will change, but if these beasts attacked us along this way, I suspect their master is ahead. While Narokas remained at their front, they remained on guard. If another group of those similar beasts attacked, they would no doubt hear them on their approach. Now, with the threat of Arusis attacking them, both Evorn and Ivium kept a much careful eye on the cliffs above them. The sun was beginning to dip down in the west. The valley was quickly falling to darkness. Though with all this, the clouds remained the same grayish tone, and as darkness fell over the valley, lightning shot out of the clouds, striking the barren land of the surroundings. The wind had picked up, and a cold chill was in the air. Ahead, Avern could see two large pillars with a broken gateway at its center. Beyond that, he could see structures. As they approached the gateway, Rungar went up to the remains of abandoned armor lying against the wall. Evern could tell there were no skeletal remains yet with so much time passing. He did not expect for any bones to be left. Rungar pulled an arrow out of the armor and held it up. Elves, he said. It was the elves who killed this man. Elves? Nurokas said. I have never known of elves to go to war with Rusis. I recognize the fletching, and it's not just any elves, but elves from the city of Sailmark. Those I have personally fought with, defended, protected. Keep focus on the task at hand, Evern said. The king who is now in Sailmark is nothing like the king there before. Furthermore, we do not even know for sure the reasoning behind elves being here. Rungar spun, staring directly at Evern, pointing. It is clear to me. They killed my kin, like everyone else seeks to do, like everyone wants to do. Rungar dropped to his knees and slammed his fist on the ground twice before standing up and shaking like a dog shaking water from his body. He took several deep breaths and then looked to Eveum. You still feel it? Just like before? No, it's stronger. I can also feel something else. Many elves died here, but not from Rusis. 
Whether it was Rusus matters little now. We'll proceed forward into this place and ascend to the Trigate. Rungar turned without saying anything else. To say his actions were strange would be an understatement. They entered the city, if you could call it that. Passing through the broken gateway, Evern noticed that it wasn't structure so much that he saw, but simply more ruins. A remnant of what once was, columns with carved effigies and a few precious stones still glimmered in the bleak light. There was a stench in the air. The path under their feet was a smooth stone. It seemed that the Ruses did not make roads like dwarves or elves, and it was even similar to Dwemhar. The roads were perfectly smooth, almost like glass. They came to a fork in the pathway. One path went straight, leading to what looked like a twisting path vanishing into the darkness ahead, while another went right and deeper into the city. It was here Avern could see a single crack, a large rock in which the entire city was built around. Rungar pointed. This is where we go. As they began to walk again without anyone saying even a word, Evern brushed a bit of the debris away from what he thought was a gleam of silver underneath the rubble. It was crystal. He knelt and touched it. It was the road itself. Yes, many of our cities had crystal streets. It's highly conductive and allows our powers to flow unheeded by rougher materials. Avern stood up just as Milia knelt to pick up a piece of crystal. Stealing, Ordak said quietly, but not so quiet that Evern couldn't hear it. No one's going to miss it. It can probably fetch us a few barrels, I'd think. Drinks on me? Ordak laughed. Yes, let's steal from the City of Death. That seems wise. This is no necropolis, Ordak, Rungar said. And Melia, if you care to carry out something of value from my cities, perhaps you should pick something of true value and not a piece of the road. Ordak punched Melia in the shoulder. The rubble rattled to their right, quite suddenly, but Rungar didn't stop. In fact, now he was moving faster. There were more sounds to their left and right, small growls here and there. Nothing like what had felt before, with a rumbling in the giant stone wolf beast that Narokas and Rungar had taken down by themselves. Rasi suddenly returned, jumping up Evern's robes and hiding away. A mere second later, Ivium's spells crackled to life as she floated above the entire host, casting a blast of fire into the unseen enemies that surrounded them. The dead come, Narokas shouted. Avern passed his staff between his hands. Being the person in the far rear, he looked behind them and found what Nurokas had said to be true. Undead, snarling, gaping maws of creatures with long arms and faces filled cracks swarmed towards them. Where eyes should have been were black sockets, a dull yellow light within. None of these creatures had weapons, but these were not the traditional undead like Evern had seen before. These were creatures twisted by magic, their physical form some unholy echo of what they once were. Evorn cast magic at the ground, summoning many large earthen spikes that acted as a fence in which the dead ran upon. Though he stopped several with such a defensive spell, the others simply crawled over and began running toward them. Avium quickly took these others down with snaps of white fire she shot across their throats. More creatures swarmed them. Melia and Ordak were back to back. They took turns, shifting positions in a circular way. As Melia slashed one, Ordak would finish it off. Then Ordak would slash another, spinning and allowing Melia to strike. As the undead came faster, they kept their pace but began simply parrying the creatures away. Rungar floated up where Aveum was, keeping a concentrated blast of fire upon the path ahead of them as he sent fireballs left and right. They were holding, but not progressing. Nurokaz! Rungar shouted. Push forward! Push forward to the stairs of the crag before us! Nurokas began doing just that. He swung his hammer, blasting back the undead many ranks in front of him at a time. The sheer number of adversaries they were facing was outrageous. Evern stopped casting earth magic. 
It wasn't doing anything but making a wall in which the creatures to climb before jumping down upon them. Evorn slammed his staff into the ground, sending shock waves of fire, several blasts ripping to the rubble and knocking back more and more of the strange, ghoulish creatures. Suddenly, the creatures stopped attacking, but the host did not do the same. They pushed forward, Neurokis smashing his way through the now motionless bodies of the creatures. They were making their way directly to the stairwell, a blackened pathway rising out of the ruined city. It came to a rotunda over the giant fountain, at least what remained of a fountain. There was no water here, yet strangely the fountain began to run red with blood. There was a whistle, a strange bird call. They were attacked again, this time being forced up onto the fountain as more of the beasts erupted from the ground. Columns of fire shot up from the ruins around them, flame like large tendrils reaching around and snapping down upon the found. Avium and Rungar cast a barrage of icy spells, blasting back the fiery tentacles. The ruins began to churn underneath them, and an unholy stench perforated Evorn's nostrils. They were now forced upon one another, casting their spells within mere paces of others. Millie and Ordak could do little more than simply stab at the closest ones. The ground began to rumble, and a roar echoed around them. These were not the stone wolf beasts. In the distance, Evern saw their foe. It was a massive troll at least four times the height of any of them. It had crystal upon its armor, and upon its back was a rider of some kind. The rider was short, stumpy, almost like a dwarf but not nearly as large. Avium, Rungar said, with me. Both Rungar and Avium shot up into the air, gripping one another's hands. Their power surged as one, and they both sent concentrated blasts of ice and fire, enveloping their enemy with flames and making a sheer wall of ice, like a static ward, to cut a perimeter around them. The air became so cold that Evern could see his breath, and as he could no longer see their enemy. Frost and snow blew around them, and it looked like a structure was forming out of the magics. As Evern saw Rungar drift back down to their level, he watched as he began casting another series of ice spells, forming a broken walkway that led up to the top of whatever he and Avium had suddenly constructed. Evern and the others followed up to where Avium and Rungar were still casting their spells, and suddenly made the realization that the Rusis had actually built something in the ruins of the city. You built a damn tower out of ice? Nerokas asked. If I told you I was making this plan as I went, would you believe me? Rungar asked him. Nerokas laughed. Yes, I would. Though it was a strange happening, Evorn noticed that the creatures could not make their way up the sheer icy wall of the tower. The troll and its rider had stopped some distance away. Though there were several large fires burning from the spells cast upon the ground, this was not why the troll had stopped. At this point, Ever noticed that the troll, too, had a slight yellow glow in his eyes. The creature upon the troll's back stood up, climbing up the head of the troll. Whatever this was did not have the allies like everything else. It was wearing a helmet made of feathers, and in its right hand was a staff made of the same similar feathers. You do not bring blood sacrifices? A high-pitched voice asked. I do not. It is not the way of the Ruses to sacrifice, Rungar said. What are you? Why do you attack us? The creature removed its headgear and revealed two very large green ears. It was a goblin. Evern had not seen such creatures in a very long time. They inhabited the Shadowlands in large colonies, but they were very reclusive. This one, however, seemingly commanded some amount of power and was able to use rather powerful magic. Do you think it can talk? Ordak asked. You have had a long time to guard this place, Rungar shouted. Why do you still watch over this place? The creature cocked its head, staring toward them. It pulled out a looking glass and peered at Rungar. The creature continued to look at them for a few moments, seemingly curious of what Rungar had said. Do you not remember me after so long? Do you not remember our talks in the high mountains? 
the creature put away his looking device and seemed to pick up the reins of his creature, moving them slowly closer to the tower. Evorn honestly wasn't sure if the creature meant to get up closer to begin attacking again, or if he was actually understanding Rungar. Back in the Shadowlands, these creatures had so little contact with those other than their own race, it was assumed they didn't know the language of any other species. In a few moments, the creature had made his way through the herd of necromantic creatures, and then once again stood upon the head of the troll. Rungar! the creature said with a squeaky voice, and in a tone like he, A, had a sore throat. My good friend, Jog. Rungar, you live? I do not even know how many winters it has been. It has been many, old friend. I dare say that nothing has changed, but everything has changed. I have kept my duty, Templar. I have never given up. Rungar smiled. I see that though I do question your methods. Have you taken up the study of necromancy? I did for a time. It was a strange magic, and these outsiders gave me a staff in which to channel it, but I never forgot that this was our sacred land, land that me and my kind shared peacefully with the Rusis. If anyone outside these shores question it, I am the one who did it. Did what? Rungar asked. Killed all the necromancers, all of them slowly, they defiled our sacred lands. They cursed the stone wolves, turning them into voracious beasts. I did what I had to to cleanse our lands. I tore down the stone pillars they used to pacify the old Rusi's energies that we channeled through our home. Although the defenses fell, it was just me. But I have stayed strong with hope that one day I would be able to report back to the Templar and perhaps be told I have done a good job, that I had done my duty. Well... Perhaps we can discuss such things if you call off your army. You know, since you realize that we're not the enemy. Jog laughed. I tell you, I know you are not the enemy, but who are these followers of yours? Surely not Rusis. Well, maybe the one, but I sense a different magic upon her. I am Rusis, and I am Dwemhar, Aviam said. And before you have any rash thoughts about Dwemhar... Know that there are few of them alive now, too. I don't have anything to say of Dwemhar. Dwemhar took much from me. If I must speak of Dwemhar, I can only do so with a curse. But I am capable of understanding that many years, truly, many lifetimes, have passed. Jog took out a small whistle, and though they couldn't hear anything, he blew into it, and his massive army of undead fled, moving, in almost the same ferocity that they were attacking, into the mountains, into the shadows around the ruins of the Rus's town. Well, if this isn't one of the weirdest things I've seen, Ordak said. Really, Melia said. This actually seems fairly normal compared to everything else. Evern looked over at Rungar as they began down the makeshift tower he had created and pulled him back as everyone else exited the tower. I know you know this, Jog, but I did not know their race could live so many years. Do you not find that strange? Of course, but I can also sense that one must have a reason for remaining, that there might be more to him than he has told us. Jog is one of the few non rusis I could say I would truly trust my life to. If he has remained here and alive, I will not question his methods. Evern didn't have much to say to that particular answer. The Rusis was clearly confident in his friend, even though Ever knew this particular creature had a lifespan of only around 250 years. It was strange, but Evern could do nothing but continue on for the time being. Evorn and the others emerged from the tower that was now slowly melting, as Rungar's magics were, of course, temporary in this regard. Jog met them with his troll mount sitting nearby. Bomb was clapping wildly as he ran up to Rungar. The goblin bowed, taking a moment to do some type of hand motion over each of his wrists. Your greeting was well received, sir, Rungar said. We do not have much time as we journey to the Trigate, but is there anything you can tell me of where you know I seek to go? None, except I do not know if any Rusis may get into that place, and the entrance stones have long been lost, Jog said. 
but if I ascend the highest peaks around here and look in that general direction, and the polar lights are glowing high above in a hue of red, I can still see the steeples mirrored with the starlight. With all the destruction that was brought upon our people, I do think we somehow protected the sacred place. Well then, perhaps there is still a chance. A chance for what? Jog asked. Rungar looked over to Evern and then back to Yog. There is a new threat, Rungar told him. Something like Ayaklo, but not. We are working on the weapon that I can only hope I can still get access to. How did you survive? Jog asked. Every other Rusis I knew of died. Though I've heard rumors of some living in distant lands, none others except you ever returned to this place. I would know. I know who comes upon this place at all moments. I wish I could tell you, Jog. I went upon the great floating monstrosity and attempted to destroy it, or at the very least disable it. I do not remember everything during that time, but I can say that I'm here now. There are Rusis, real live Rusis living in other places. I'm going to protect them. No matter what, be it that I give my life doing so, I will stand by our people, just as you have remained here, even though you had no hope and no one except the dead to keep you company. Jog sighed and then coughed. I think we should take a moment. I think we should take a bit more than a moment, and then maybe you come up to my home. I might answer some questions that I know you have. I think we need to just keep moving. I really do not want to take longer than I have to. I trust... Evern spoke up, cutting them off. I think we should take a look. The sudden interruption by Evorn threw Jog off completely. The small creature looked with terror at Rungar and then back to Evorn. You dare speak to a Golden Templar with such carelessness? Jog growled. His troll pounded the ground and Jog quickly took to his mount. Rungar lifted his right hand. Stop! he said plainly. But he has dishonored you. It is not dishonor, not any more. I did not want to distract us from our task at hand, Evern. Evern nodded. I understand, but he wishes to show us something. There must be reason. Rungar sighed, licking his lips a bit before looking up the mountain. Then it is settled. I will take the one who dishonors Rungar, Rungar's other followers, and the great Rungar himself to my humble abode. There, well, I will just show you. Evern and the others followed just behind Rungar as Jog led them to the derelict ruins, past several undead skulking creatures lying near the rubble. Do they just lie there like that? Yes, they sense something living. They come to me, and I decide what is to be done. Actually, I thought you were wizards from afar, coming to seek revenge after all the necromancers I killed. But then I figured out you are not wizards, not all of you. He led them up a very narrow pathway that snaked back and forth directly up the mountain. This pathway was scattered with random small bones and even a few dead fish. At least something lives in this land, Milia said. Follower of Rungar, Jog said. They are but offerings from the lowly dead creatures to me, he paused and my master. Evern's first thought was to ask who this master was, but considering they were getting up closer to what appeared to be a cavernous entrance, he assumed they would know soon enough. Besides, Rungar would ask if he wanted to know right now. Though Jog had moved with a surprising pace up the mountain itself, while Nurokas and Ordak lagged behind quite a bit, they had reached the top of the pathway. Here, there were two strange statues made up of random blocks and sticks. Both of them were made in a somewhat bastardized appearance of Jog. You have statues? Rungar asked. I do, erected by my followers. You should get your followers to do the same. Jog laughed. Look, Ordak, someone else who gets statues built of them. Evorn teased. Ordak, who had just made it up, looked at the statues with a mix of disgust and overall tiredness from the climb. Wow, those are hideous. I'm sure yours were much better, Milia said. Quiet! Jog yelled. 
Jog took a few steps ahead of the rest, motioning for them to stay behind. Then he made a point to stand up very straight. We are in the presence of my master in the form in which he remains. I will not have any dishonor toward my master. Once the truth of what remains here is revealed, you will understand. He looked directly at Rungar and bowed. Even you might be surprised at this. These words were strange to Evern. Who or what could possibly surprise Rungar, he thought. There wasn't much to this cave either. Just to the right, behind one of the statues, was a small living area, if it could be called that. There was a small alcove of rocks with ashes underneath, seemingly a cooking area from the looks of it. There was another rectangular box that looked to be made of rubble from beneath the cave itself, something from the old city. Here to there was also a small desk and several books that Evern couldn't quite make out from a distance, and beyond that, as they moved very slowly just behind Yogg, they came to find themselves staring at what looked simply to be a dark wall of the cave. Do you think the little guy is just a bit off? Ordak whispered just behind Evern. Evern slowly nodded but kept staring nonetheless. Now we bow, Jog said, motioning with his hands to lower themselves down to one knee. Evern, of course, was just following as Evern did, doing only what was necessary based off Rungar's actions. Though he had stared at maps of the Kiva region many times before now, he never expected such oddities to be found here. Even more so, he did not expect to ever travel here. Kiva was known to be barren, and those rumors were not exactly wrong. But it was here in this cave, this place where Jog had led them in the strangest of circumstance. To be sure, there was indeed something that would surprise not just Rungar, but everyone. There was a small amount of light, a sudden glow in the darkness. Evern could see a thin outline of what appeared to be a figure slumped against the back of the cave. Around this figure were small glowing stones in different hues of blue and red light that were still and dark upon the ground, now flying and spinning very slowly. There was a man here, at least it appeared to be a man. Evern could see the figure's legs and torso, and even strands of gray hair with the smallest of crystals within them. Two arms, two hands, bony but present. But the man's face was the most peculiar of sights. The man's face pressed into the rock to where it looked like it was part of the rock itself. I... Rungar gasped. Master! Jog went up to the skeletal form entombed partially in the stone and kissed his hand before placing it on the head of the figure. This is the sacred and holy master, a seer of our people and the master of the elements. Evorn stared at this motionless form, pressed up against the rock and glowing from whatever magic must have remained in his body after death. It was at this very moment that Evorn saw the face within the rock move. Has one come of the olden times? the face said. Evorn watched as the fingers of the figure began to move and crack. I can sense one. I can sense one who has not been here in so very long. Rungar slowly made his way closer to the skeletal form. I am here, Rungar, Golden Templar and faithful Rusis. The face that was of skeletal form and glowing from just before had a spectral presence that rose above bone. For a moment, it seemed it was simply a man pressing himself through a thin veil. The man fell back into his own bones. The spirit, no doubt weakened, but somehow still very much alive, seemed to smile. Rungar. He was one of the proudest, one of the greatest bearer of our sacred gauntlets. I do wish he were here. Rungar reached out, touching the hand of the skeletal form. I am here, master. I am here. It is Rungar. I am here but the lights that were around the skeletal form began to fade away, and Jog sighed. I have been with him since the end. I have guarded this place since death gripped his body and the powers of our people that reside in the rocks. The corpses that gave their energy to this land flowed into this holy place and preserved him. It has only been within the last few moons he began having trouble remembering. I have kept what form remained 
and done what I could for him by cleaning what remained of his bones and even seeking out incense that I thought would be pleasant for him to smell. It is how the necromancers were attracted to this place, and he wiped a tear from the corner of his own large eye. I think it was his power that protected me when I went into battle to defeat them as they had come to do nothing but destroy our lands. So here I remain, and here I will continue to remain to honor him. Rungar, who had been on one knee from before, now took to both knees and bowed before his master. I will honor our people. I will honor them as I have always done in this life until the point of my death. Master, know that I will see the glory of our people renewed if by my power I can do so. For a moment, there seemed to be a sudden glow from the skeletal form's eyes, and then nothing. The cave became dark again. As Rungar stood up, pushing past the others and embracing Avium, he led her outside the cave, and Evern made a point to keep the others away for a few moments. He embraced her, and she did him, and as the sky became darker, there seemed to be a glimmer of moonlight that shined down upon the narrow valley in which the Rusus ruins below had lain defended by Jog for such a long time. I say it now, Avium, and to all of you, Rungar said, now looking at the rest of them. I can never forgive what happened to my people, what the Dwemar did to us. And though I do not deny wrongdoing by the Ruses, it is now, and no doubt just the next few days, Dwemar, Ruses, Dwarves, and Elves will unite with the race of men. He paused. We must if we are to stop the destruction from coming to our world. Avern tapped his staff twice on the ground. I'm for that. There were exchanges of yeses and nods and confirmation. For a moment, no matter how fleeting it was, Evern could feel the unity in the crew. Almost everything seemed to be falling together, no matter how difficult he assumed their path ahead would be. At this moment, everything felt well. Everything except that they were missing their captain. We should continue on, Avium said. The Trigate, it is down below, yes? Rungar nodded. It is. As Jog emerged from the cave, Rungar knelt to him. Some distance away, Jog's mount sighed sadly. You know, Jog, come with us. Then, when we're done with what we need to do here, you can leave this place with honor. Jog cackled. I appreciate your offer. My home is here. I am tied to this place in both form and spirit. I am but an extension a connection to our mutual master there in the back of that cave, to our people. I have been blessed with a longer life than any of my kind. I will continue to guard this place as long as there is magic in this mountain to give me life. Plus, I could never enter the sacred part of the Rusa city. I will honor that still. But I do wish the best of fortunes to all of you, and know that the path from the city and back to your ship will be more than secure. Rungar stood back up. Very well, he said with a smile. Then I leave you in peace, friend. Perhaps when I am done with what we must do, I will return to this place and we can speak more. I would very much like that, my friend, and if you come across it, a bottle of elvish wine. Yes, a bottle of elvish wine. Considering how dark it was now, it was only by the light of Evern's staff and the soft glow of Rusis magic from Rungar and Avium that they found their way back down from the mountain cave and to the city itself. The climb down had not been nearly as tiring as the climb up, and though they paused for a few moments, they were moving at a rapid pace now toward a stairwell not too far from where the fighting had stopped before. Ever noticed that the stairwell seemed to be in the center of the city, and though there were several dark black obelisks surrounding this stairwell, it did not seem to go up to anything in particular, save a large wall. They began up the stairwell, moving quickly, and at this moment that Evern realized that of all the destruction wrought on the city around them, the stairwell had remained. It was made of a stone that was unlike the mountains around and the ruins surrounding them. It was highly polished, but to an exceptionally fine edge that was beyond most of the craftsmanship Evern could think of. 
This place was truly something special to Rungar and the Rusi's people, and he could not shake the thought that they moving up this place as they did would have been heresy in the time where the Rusis were still the strong race they once were. They'd come to the summit of the stairs, though there were several altars and troughs that only Evern could guess were once the housing places of great fires of some kind. It was here Rungar gripped strange sands that seemed to sparkle as if crystals in one of the troughs. He whispered something to himself, not even looking at anyone else. Even Ivium seemed to have difficulty either hearing or understanding what he was saying, but almost instantaneously, both the sand where his hands were and the sand directly across from it in the trough burst into a bright green flame. Now, with the fires glowing brightly, casting their shadows on the mountains around, Nerokas swung his axe, looking back down the stairwell, and Ordak, almost for no reason at all, drew his blade. Okay, guys, Melia said. He lit some fires. He didn't call us to battle. Fires have a tendency to draw unwanted guests, Nurokas said. Regardless of what Jog says, Ordak added. I assure you both, Rungar said, almost with an annoyed tone. You're beyond safe under the watch of Jog and my old master. Rungar made his way to the large wall the stairs seemingly led to. He placed his hands on the stone, and his gauntlets began to glow. In the darkness of the valley where Evern and the others now stood before what Rungar had called the Trigate, a dazzling light shot up from the top of the flat stone. Like a continuation of the ruins and glowing lines of his gauntlets, their way forward became evident as the rocks split down the middle, a seal unlocking but with the sound of a clear hum. I open the path in the name of the Rusis. May the way part open at my command and with the insertion of the key. Rungar removed his hands from the door, yet the light remained bright. There was a single square in the dead center of the monolith. Beside it appeared that of a triangle, a circle, and a hand. Rungar took out the key he had obtained before Evern and the others caught up with him. Rungar pushed the triangular device into the lock. The device shined a bright blue before the entire door darkened and creaked open. I would have thought you had to have all of the keys, Naroka said. This is no dwarven door, Rungar said. This place was meant to be a shelter and our fallback plan if ever the Rusi's people fell. Split into several groups, we were going to go into hiding, but no other keys have been inserted. With each key, the way is opened and the key lost. But all the keyholes are still open. When this place was sealed, not another living being re-entered it. There were a few within the city at all times, but... He sighed. I do not know. We shall see what we find. The doorway opened. Though it was not the entire monolithic stones, yet a smaller passageway, glowing gold and appearing as a traditional door you might expect. Though traditional it was, the doors were still massive and made of a polished, dark-colored wood. I will show you the splendor of the passage of the Trigate, Rungar told them all. As Rungar opened the door, a dazzling light shined forth. Evorn and the others followed just behind Rungar as they entered into the passage. Evorn saw what appeared as a long hallway with bright lights of red, blue, green, and silver. He felt a slight warmness to his skin, like he had been in the sun too long, and then all sense of pain fled. He felt pleasure all over his body, and then as his eyes began to adjust, the lights died down. The same gray sky as they had seen before now was here. A sun? Milia asked. Evern blinked, holding up a hand at the very bright light in the far distance. As his eyes focused around him, he realized they were in another valley, but yet surrounding the valley were the same night skies they had seen before. Ahead, atop a spire of jade green, there was a bright burning torch. It was so large that had the tower not been there, it would have been safe to assume this was the sun. Before them was a bridgeway that stretched high above a ravine that encircled a floating stone, and atop the stone were buildings. But while the buildings before them beautiful, 
an entire half-side of the city appeared as if it had melted. Down beneath them, like a green ribbon, what should have been a blue river was the foulest-looking bubbling riverway Evern had ever seen. The very rocks on the right side of the city appeared to have melted, and just like the valley before, this valley had no life. Rungar ran from one side of the bridge to the other, looking down while hurrying forward. It did not take a Dwemhar to tell this was not what Rungar had expected. What happened here? Milia asked. Not even I know that, Aviam said. It's got him upset, Ordak said. Evern kept his staff ready, unsure at what was ahead. While it was clear that Rungar was moving directly toward a doorway of silver ahead, none of them knew what to expect. As they came up to the large crystal doorway, Evern realized that there were three statues each on either side of the doors. The statues were mirrored on either side. One was holding out their hand as if offering a gift. Another held up their hand as if pledging to servitude or some vow, while another held a clenching fist centered on their chest. The guardians remain, Rungar said, looking at the statues. He looked over to Evern and Evium. These stone guardians remain as they were set when this place was created. No enemy has come here. Yet I see such destruction that I know there must have been something to pass this way. Perhaps dragons, Naroka suggested. The word dragon seemed to make Rungar curious. He stepped away from the door, looking out toward the mountain range and pointing. No, if you look ahead, you can see the beak of one of the silver birds. It was said to be much like the stone guardians, sentinels made to strike, even if our enemy came from the air. A weapon primarily meant for the Dwemhar, but one that would shred a dragon just as easy. Well, you might as well go in, Ordak said. Might as well, indeed, Rungar agreed. As Rungar placed his hand on the doorway, there was no light or sudden spark in the door, like at the Trigate. This door was not magical in any form, but there was a delay in Rungar's actions. Evorn could tell that the Rusis was hesitant, and Evorn could understand why. For this to be a sealed place, yet have some type of destruction brought upon it, for the smell of the air was not fresh and clean, but of brimstone, and something Evorn could not identify. It made sense for Rungar to pause. Evorn placed a hand upon Rungar's back. A lot has changed, my friend, but it doesn't change what we need to do. If there is something here that can help us and help what ruses to remain, we must get to it. Rungar did not say anything. He nodded very quickly and forced a small smile as he pushed open the door. The door swung open without any issue at all. Before them was a smooth crystal path, much more beautiful than Evern had imagined when Rungar had told him about the streets of the Rusi cities. Ahead of them were buildings, smooth and slender in build, spires that rose much higher than Evern had expected. In fact, it seemed that there was some form of invisibility spell or trick. To outside viewers, you could see these buildings looking from outside the gates. As the companions made their way in, Rungar looked down to long streets before them. One went to the right and seemed to go around the edge of the large central spire in which the large light blazingly shined above them. The other one curved around the left and seemed to go up along the actual spire. We go to the left, the old sanctum. What we seek was kept there. There were others in other parts of the city, but this one should be the easiest for us to move. They began around to the left a strange pathway that did not have the same smooth glass as the others. This pathway had golden brick layered every few paces. It appeared almost as if it was a dying path, leading them toward another place. Either way, as they began down the path, passing the empty buildings with closed doors, hinting at the life that was before, Evorn fell back to where Evium was. This is much a place of your people as it was for Rungar, though you never actually lived here or even came here. I know, Aviam said. I do wish my father were here, to see this place. Did he ever speak of it to you? Ever nodded. 
He spoke of a secret place, but he said I could never know, that just my knowledge of it would be a betrayal to the Rusis people. So I let him have his secrets because all of the gods know I have my own. Enjoy this time we have here. You're lucky to see such a place, as are we, not even being of Rusis blood. Aviam shivered. I do not know if I can call it lucky to be here. There is a feeling here, sickness or something. She paused. Something that causes sickness. There is an unnerving feeling, for sure. This place saw great destruction, and it was not from an outside source. The road began to snake around to the right, rising into the air as they began to move up the giant spire. Evern assumed this was the sanctum that Rungar had spoken of. But as they came around the spire, Evern saw something that he knew was not supposed to be there. The city as it had been, sprawling out away from the spire in a perfect circle, suddenly looked as if it had melted away, from the very base of the tower, into a central point that looked to be almost as if it were a maelstrom, but paused in time. It was from here there was a thick green and yellow haze just over the ground. A massive fissure in the city foundation itself seemed to release periodic explosions of a gaseous fog. What is this? Evern asked Rungar. Evorn's mouth was agape. He slowly shook his head and then gripped the banister that lined the walkway. That was where the grand observation deck was, the weapon that I look for within the sanctum. It was from where that weapon could be launched. It is also where we manufactured what was needed for this weapon. Is this some kind of strange magic? Ordak asked. I have not seen anything of this nature, Narokas said. This is unnatural. And the smell is worse here. Is this poisonous? Likely, Rungar told them. I can sense a burning sensation on my skin. This is no magic, Master Dwarf. This is a blending of elements, an art of magic, where many Templars studied what made up our natural world came up with something to defeat that of the Dwemhar. You see, the Dwemhar had access to spiritual and mental powers beyond anything the Ruses had. So we used what we did have. We used the power of flame, of water, of lightning, of rock, anything to give us an advantage. I am not saying we made all the best decisions in this time. Rungar began to walk, motioning for them to follow. We do not need to stay in the vicinity of this place for longer than we must. The sanctum is still intact, so I believe we can still get what we came here for. Though much has been lost in the eruption that happened here, it is clear to me that it is by our own Rusus's hands that we destroyed our sacred hideaway. But I think we can make this right. We can do something for the rest of the world. Evern wasn't sure what Rungar meant by all of this. He did not know of any weapon of magic that could cause such destruction and leave such destruction in its wake even after so many years. By Evern's reckoning, it had been several upon several generations since whatever happened here happened, yet still the earth beneath the city bubbled and broke. The air smelled worse than any poisons he had contrived with potions, any ingredients he had sampled to create some of the worst combinations that he knew in all his alchemy knowledge. He prayed whatever Rungar was leading them to was worth it. They came to a break in the sanctum, an open wall with a single set of two black doors. It was here Rungar led them. Moving to one of the rocks that made up the wall of the sanctum, he pressed his hand against it, casting just a bit of fire, and the stone became bright red. The doors opened and the stone began flashing. Get in! Get in! Rungar shouted. As they moved into an atrium of sorts that was much colder than the outside air, Rungar touched another stone, and the doors closed. Ivorn sighed, looking at the others, who seemed just as confused as he did at the rather blank walls of the interior. Though there was light coming from above through skylights in the spire itself, it didn't really matter considering there was nothing else in this long chamber. The walls were barren, the floors were empty, and there was only a single door that seemed to lead into the spire. This way? The only sound they could hear was that of their breathing and their footsteps, and as they went to the next door, they pushed it open without any further need of keys or locks, 
or even a bit of rusus magic. Ever noticed that the air was fresh here, not fresh in the sense of what you would smell on an island out at sea, but it was not the same seemingly poisonous fumes they were smelling outside. We'll have to pass through the inner sanctum to get right where I need to go. It is there I hope to see some clue as to what truly happened here and to the other cities. As I understand it, this weapon was not deployed. Perhaps it never needed to be used. I am not sure. It wasn't too long after the destruction of one of our first cities that my Golden Templars and I deployed directly to Ayaklo in an attempt to stop it. We shall see. As they went deeper into the inner sanctum of the spire, the walls became more ornate with elaborate drawings in a language that none present had ever seen. While the Dwemhar were everywhere, Rungar explained, us Rusis kept to ourselves. We did not delve deep into the earth or existing places that are now ocean. Most of our homes were within the mountains, and as such we've always considered dwarves to be some of our best companions. Here, here! Nurokas exclaimed, and so it was similar with the elves and the Dwemhar. It is why I believe the actions of the Rusis and the Dwemhar led to the issues between elves and dwarves in later times. Jealousies and fear from long ago typically cause greater issues for the children of warring races, even if it isn't something of memory, Evium said. I agree, Evium, Rungar said. They came up to a white door. This one had two torches on either side, yet neither of them were lit. Rungar went to the doorway and lit both at the same time with his magic. The door in front of him opened, and they proceeded forward into a large room with rows upon rows of seats rising up. There was a large center altar filled with just a little bit of water, enough to give a sheen surface upon polished stone. It was here Rungar went to a small pedestal, with many runic rocks set upon the upper surface. Not everything Rusus came up with was original. This is a bit of Dwemhar ingenuity, repurposed to serve the Rusus Empire. As Rungar pressed on the ruins, an image came up of a hooded figure. Speak, Codex. Rungar, Golden Templar, Commander of the South Gate. A hooded figure bowed, and then a hazy vision of the city as it appeared to their own eyes from outside the spire appeared. This is almost exactly like what the Stormborn has aboard the Ayla Sunrise, Evern said. Rungar chuckled. Like I said, we were quite proud to obtain this technology from the Dwemhar. As they watched, Rungar moved his hands across the ruins on the pedestal, eventually bringing up a map that showed the mountain ranges. He moved across the map in a way that marveled Nurokas, Milia, and Ordak, but not Evium or Evorn. They had both seen this kind of magic with the Aella Sunrise. But the longer he stared at a small image that was just above his hands, the more he typed upon the ruins furiously. They did deploy. They deployed the weapon. Where? Here? Perhaps that would explain the destruction, Aviam suggested. Rungar looked over at her and then back. There is a message embedded in the information. I will attempt to retrieve it. It was just a few moments after Rungar said this that imagery of several rogue figures appeared. We are deploying the weapon. Golden Splinter has launched. But through the fire and smoke, the monstrosity of the Dwemhar remains. This can't be right. I remember when this city was destroyed. This was the city destroyed by Ayeklo. They never deployed the weapon. Unless... He paused. Unless there was a disruption between communications across the distance. But if they deployed it and it didn't work, we... Rungar smashed his hand on the ruins. He winced, closing his eyes. Has this all been for nothing? He yelled. Did I come all this way for a weapon that will not help us? How can this weapon fail? My own father died figuring out how to break the base molecules of all existence apart, yet the weapon does not even stop the one thing it was meant to destroy. Rungar backed away from the screen of water. The imagery fell back away, and the room became darker. Rungar closed his eyes, taking several deep breaths.
He paused, working to slow his breathing. It was Rhea Carr who taught me this, who taught me that my anger would not be the path that would lead me forward. It was not these weapons that took down the city before. It was the Stormborn, he said, looking at Evern. We attacked the lower portion of Iaclo, destroying some type of crystal beneath it. Then perhaps this is information we just simply did not have before. If that is such, I will keep faith that this will work. Now, now that I know that at least the weapon can be used, I will attempt to figure out what tragedy befell the city that we find ourselves in now. Part 7. Destroyer of Realms These are all the major events of the city, he said, pushing one of the ruins in and bringing up a second smaller shimmering image. Here, here is the last recording that the ruined stones have record of. It was close to one hundred years ago. I see the temperature grew to an extreme in one section of the city before. He pointed at the screen, but none of them were able to read what he pointed at. One of our energy crystals, one that we stole from the Dwemhar, he added. We couldn't get any more energy crystals, so we took the material we found deep in the mountains and refined it into a form in which we could draw energy as we wished. It was this system that allowed us to create our weapon. Your weapon came from creating energy? Aviam asked. You cannot create energy as you think, Rungar said. Even with Arusis's power, we are not creating anything, yet we are destroying our own life force. It is why we get tired when we cast, and if we cast for too long, we can fall unconscious. While, of course, you can train yourself to do more, or in my case, channel through something like these gauntlets, he said, pointing to his wrists. We simply took our knowledge of one thing and dug deeper, using that energy to create even more energy from the division of that energy. I feel like I need to be drinking, Ordak said. Melia nodded with him. The weapon, Nuruka said. We are here for the weapon. We are not here to discuss energy and creation and procreation, and whatever else you Rusis feel we need to discuss. We have been here a while, and my knees are starting to hurt, not to mention my lungs. Whatever is out there outside the sanctum is not good for dwarves. It isn't good for anyone, Rungar said. The very air outside is poisonous. There is nothing we can do at this point but get what we need and get out. Will this spread? Evan asked. Is this the danger to the oceans and that beyond the mountains? Rungar shrugged. I do not believe so considering this is happening within our realm. I believe other places are safe. Even if not, there is little we can do beyond veiling the magic that is already here. But I do believe this place will remain in the state it is now. For that, I have a sadness that I can't explain. We Rusis never wish to hurt the natural world in any form, Yet I am happy that this happened here, and just saying that, he said with tears welling in his eyes, to say that of such a holy place, well. He turned from the pedestal and motioned for them to follow. We go this way. We came all this way, and from everything I can see, this area is safe. We will get the weapon and get back to our ship. Once again, they were moving away from the halls of the inner sanctum in the strange auditorium where they had learned of the fate of the Rus's cities and of that of this secret place. Evern still wasn't sure what to make of any of this. The knowledge of the Rusis was beyond that of his own. That didn't bother him. It was a different knowledge. It wasn't alchemy. It wasn't the mixing of herbs and compounds. It was something deeper involving the very energy of the world. Perhaps the Rusis had been on the brink of something much greater or far worse. It was hard to determine the truth of such things. He thought back to his own lands. The issues in the Shadowlands would be quieted rather quickly with what he saw in his imagination this weapon that Rungar spoke of could do. They passed through several more doors, following corridors lined with bright silver torches. As a corridor turned in a circular fashion, moving slightly downward ever so many paces, they came to a final door in which Rungar clapped his hands upon approaching. Good. I was a bit worried, but now I see this place is intact. It should be fine. But as he opened the door to lead them into this final room, they were met with sunlight. 
the sealed inner sanctum was not as sealed as they'd all believed. A sudden horrid fume filled Evern's nose, and before he could even react, both Avium and Rungar cast wards, sealing off the place from the air of the inner sanctum. What is this? Ordak shouted. The very air burns my throat. Rungar moved his hands, casting a sealing spell of ice, and after a few moments the entire passage was frigid. We cannot all proceed. Evorn, I'm going to need you to stay here to reseal the passage as Aviam and I move forward. Though I had brought Nurokus here to help us with the heavy lifting, thankfully Aviam's Dwemhar powers can lift the device. Her and I will be protected from the effects of the outside world with our wards, but I cannot risk anyone else. This is how it must be. What is that out there? Melia asked. It's what I was telling you about before. It is why this place smells so foul and part of the city has been destroyed. What we did to manipulate the Dwemhar crystal broke down and has poisoned everything. It is fine. I'm not sure if the devices are still intact, but if they are, Aviam and I will find them, and we will bring them back. We did not come all this way for nothing, friends. Are you sure we will be fine within our wards? Aviam asked. I think so. This isn't magic that we are dealing with, Avium. This is something of the natural world made in an unnatural way. We must seal the air that we are breathing and what comes in contact with our actual bodies. The wards will be more than enough. You wish for me to reseal the passage as soon as you're through it? Yes, that is it, Rungar said. Nothing else was said. Rungar led the way, burning through his icy spell as Avium followed just behind him. Just as Avium crossed into the now icy tunnel before them, Evern began to cast a ward, thus blocking the passage for the time being. Through his ward, he could see Avium and Rungar cast their own wards around each other and proceed forward. I do not like this place at all, Nurika said. It's like the poisonous mushrooms. Do you remember the mushrooms outside of that one tower in the Shadowlands? Evern was keeping his concentration on the spell at hand, doing his best to ensure that his ward remained as large as it needed to be to protect everyone. Yes, I remember. That was much simpler than this, if I need to be honest at this moment. Besides, those were disturbed because of your clumsy feet. Thankfully, the winds were in our favor. I just don't get it, the dwarf growled. Why would the Ruses create such a thing? Why would they do this? Would you not do everything you could to protect your people? Ordak asked. What did you say, Orc? Ordak growled. I am half-Orc. I need not repeat this again. Any people facing annihilation will do whatever they can to protect themselves. The Rusis did what they did, hoping just to preserve their civilization. And as you can see, it didn't matter either way. Their people are gone, and had they not been destroyed... Perhaps this destruction would have never happened. Perhaps this place would still be standing. But the Dwemhar destroyed them. Does it really matter anyway, Milia said. We are all in this together. No matter the race, no matter the history between us. I don't know about you great races, as you call yourselves, but if I know anything of the history of our lands, we do better just to work together in any way we can. You should listen to her, Evern said. This senseless arguing between us must stop. No, I do not mean just right now, but in general. If we are going to last in any form, it will be together and not fighting each other. The Rusis and the Dwemhar were two of the most powerful races, and what did they do? They destroyed each other and themselves. If that isn't clear by the events of the past few weeks, to at least you, Ordak, considering you other two are fairly new, I'm not sure you can be taught. The others became quiet. He felt like he had a bunch of children with him right now. As he held the ward steady, Rossi snaked out of his robes and slid onto his arm. What? You want to help? Rossi hissed and vanished again. The serpent has the right idea. I should just hide away, too. I might not have to deal with any of this. But I must keep doing what I am doing. It is the only way. It is what the Stormborn would want. Through his ward, he began to be able to see the others. 
AVM was walking backward, and Rungar had his hands outstretched wide, creating a war that enveloped both of them and something else Evern could not make out yet. There were a few moments where Evaeum and Rungar were talking to one another, and suddenly there was a large black pillar moving down the chasm of ice. As Rungar and Avium followed just behind it, and Rungar sealed the far end of the tunnel with ice, Evorn waited for the signal from Rungar and then lowered his ward. The strange black pillar floated directly past Avorn. He had never seen such an object. It was sleek, made of some type of silver ore that had been well refined. Ruins went up and down the entire body of this pillar in strange angled tips near the far end of it. In the center was a green orb. Avium was sweating profusely, but as she carefully lowered the object, she was able to get a break and began breathing forcefully to catch her breath. What is this? Nurokas asked. It's the device, Rungar said. We had six of them. This one was not yet complete, but I can finish it. I do not see how this is a weapon, Melia said. Looks like a building block, a very thin building block. Might be good for a fence post or something of that nature, Nurokas said. This device was specifically made to destroy Ayeklo. The interior is hollow. There are stones here on the back end that once ignited and formed correctly, it would propel flames outward and push the device itself into the sky. The guidance of such a device is part of the issue. But I will work that out. Work that out? Evium said. It is not a matter to discuss now. This device is safe. It does not have any of the contamination of that that is outside. We'll make our way with it back to the ship, and I will begin crafting what I need. Crafting? Sounds like a job for a dwarf, Nurokas said. Not the sort of crafting you think, Rungar said. He lifted a small metallic hammer, or so what looked like a hammer in Evern's opinion. But this device, whatever it was, was not something Rungar had before. You see my trick, Rungar said, pulling the hammer from where he had tucked it in his belt. This is our key. This has the exact materials I will need to continue to make what I need for this weapon to be complete. The most important part is the core. The weapon has that, and thus the explosive potential is there. We just have to deliver it where it can do the damage. Strange magic, Evern said. Well, I'll say it again. It isn't magic. Magic doesn't kill so many, or do what destruction has been wrought upon this city. This is barbaric, like a cruel stone carved from a circular piece of ore into a jagged one meant to cause destruction. I am ashamed that my people created this, yet if it helps us now, perhaps it'll be worth it. Still, to get to the point where one would create such a thing says much about the Rusis and the Dwemhar. Nurokas and Ordak worked together with Avium, and while the two of them used their own strength to lift the device up some, it was Avium who made it lighter and easier to move. The three of them worked together, with Melia doing what she could, but not having anywhere good to grip the weapon. They began out. Evern walked behind the rest, with Rungar leading the way. As they went back the way they came, reaching the outside again, Evern noticed that the winds had shifted and they could not smell what they could smell before. Though they circled back down to the original road, they faintly recognized the horrid smell once or twice. Rungar continued to lead them, increasing the pace as much as he could, while even making a point to switch with Ordak and Nurokas at separate times. Just keep a good watch, Shadow Elf, he said to Evern. We head back to the Trigate, through the ruined city, and back to the ship. That is our task. To say it was a quiet journey, going from the ruins of the village that held the Trigate, high above it through the mountain pass, back out to where the ship was, would not have been the most truthful description. While there were no far-fetched conversations or other musings, there were many grunts and quite a bit of sweat as they maneuvered all the way back to the Nakri. Coming to the ship itself, Avern watched as Avium attempted to lift the weapon onto the ship with her powers. It was too large for Ordak and Nurokas to carry it onto the ship, and there were no good leverage points in which to lift it in any other way 
that any of them could think of. I know what I can do, Rungar said. The Rusis began casting a spell, layering ice upon ice as he built a funnel of sorts in which to feed the device into one end and slide it onto the deck of the Nakri. Aviam carefully lowered the weapon onto the ice, and working together, they pushed it up onto the ship itself. Hold on, hold on, Rungar said. The Rusis made a point to get up on the ship and signaled for Ivorn to follow. As they pushed the weapon the last little bit, they carefully lowered it onto the deck. Now we'll tie it down. We do not need this sliding around the deck as we begin to make way. One by one, they were all aboard the ship again, and once Nurokas and Rungar had finished tying down the weapon, Ordak sighed, staring down at it. It's not very sharp. What are we going to need to put it on the front of the ship? Ram it directly into Misla himself? No, of course not. We just need to get near Misla. But I have much work to do before that time, and thankfully we got a good bit of sailing before we're back, or we might be in need of using this weapon. That's where your tool comes in service, right? Milia said. Rungar nodded. It is. He signaled to Evern, and Evern pointed to Ordak. Remove the lines. Prepare to set sail. Aye, Captain Person. Ordak laughed. As Ordak did exactly as he was told, Evern engaged the ship's energy source, and they began to move away from the dock itself. He manipulated the lever, the sails came up, and he began to move them from the shore. Now they just needed to get back to the Great Bay of the North. It was there they would make their stand, and there that Evern hoped he would understand what exactly Valrin was doing. They were making good time. When they had started off on their exodus from the Cava Mountains, the sun had not yet begun to come up. Now it was nearing the center of the sky and midday. While it wasn't much for anyone else to do, Rungar had been working tirelessly, managing to create some kind of mounting harness for his weapon. Avern had never seen such a tool like Rungar used. With this, he needed no raw material, no ore or smelting. He just simply moved the device along the deck of the ship. It was almost like he was carving wood or chiseling rock. It was as if he were simply creating as he went. Avern! Rungar shouted up to him. Avorn looked at him and nodded but didn't say anything. Look a bit up tight, even for a shadow elf. Do you care much for songs? Avorn laughed. I do when the occasion calls for it. I don't know if I would call this quite the occasion. It isn't like we're sailing about on our merry way to sell off a bunch of supplies for a ton of gold to lead to a cheap night of drinking and, as some of you lesser types might prefer, whores. I know you are not talking about me, my friend. Perhaps you mean the dwarf? Evorn smirked. No, no, I get it. We all have been a bit not ourselves. The truth is, as this little voyage has kept going, I've truly questioned the motivations of my captain. It was possession, you see. Many I have known have been under the possession of dark spirits. Never has one been driven mad to this degree. Are you sure is it madness? he replied, standing up and moving his tool in a different way now, creating a different section of the mount for his weapon. As I had understood it, it wasn't madness at all. If I think yes, I would say he was trying to protect you and the others. I think he believes he has something personal with that one you call Marog. He does. Evorn leaned over the helm to check to make sure that Evium was not anywhere near. He assumed she was somewhere below deck considering he had not seen her in some time. He hoped she was sleeping and not trying to work on something herself regarding meditation or what not. When a member of our crew saved the Stormborn, Valrin was never quite the same. He loved that one, that Rusis. Bry, Rungar said. I remember her, back in Taria. That night in the castle when I walked out surrounded by our enemy, I remember the look in her eyes, the terror... I have to imagine she was looking to me, having heard stories of me, yet seeing me as I was, letting her down. That is not how I understand the story. You saved everyone that night. Rungar chuckled nervously. But she saved me. There were many things that played a part in my return to sanity, 
but to me personally, it was a fellow Rusis. As for the Stormborn, one should not ignore the strength of love. You and I both know it drives one to do insane things. Evern said nothing to this. He didn't want to. Or maybe that's just another thing I remember, Rungar said, beginning to work again. There are many powers in this world, many magics, many technologies, even though some may now be lost. But is the power of one's emotions, that of hatred and jealousy, that of fear, but yet even as much that has been lost of the old world, I know one thing still remains true. Love is the greatest of the powers. Love can transcend death, create life, even protect those beyond protection. You keep this ship sailing as it needs to be. I will keep working to finish this weapon. Love shall protect the Stormborn. Evern gripped the wheel a bit tighter, correcting their course as they began to drift off to the south a bit and pondering the words the Rusis had said. He is a wise man. They were coming back across the village they had left before. Though he had half a mind to pull into the port for a moment, he feared losing any more time to a sudden change in the tides. Though, as he looked over at the lighthouse, he could see a veiled figure looking out toward him. It was Kenza. She was holding her position still. Having lifted the spell she had placed on the village, they had not carried her off and burned her or worse. He understood the fear and the ease of just casting the spell, but he also understood the power of simply being honest. He lifted his staff, making a small flash of flame in what was now a dusky sky. The necromancer cast a small spark of purple energy in response. I saw that, Aviam said, coming from below deck. Though he had seen her a time before after he and Rungar spoke in regard to Valrin and other things, he discovered she had been sleeping, but then decided to work on meditating with Ordak and Nerokas. So how did your lesson go? he asked, smiling at her. She simply closed her eyes and shook her head. Ordak is getting air, I guess. Nerokas knows something of concentration. He swears he's never meditated, but he was able to remain silent and still significantly longer than our half-orc friend. Well, they say the Hammer Songs are beyond any who train in any other form in the Dwarven schools. I remember a time when dwarves were looked at as nothing but those who hammered random metals together. Just how old are you? Ivorn jokingly attempted to smack her with his staff, and she brushed the hair away from her face. I may have been sleeping, but I was not completely unaware of the happenings upon our ship. Happenings? Don't act like you don't see it. But Evern didn't see it. He assumed Evium was mentioning something regarding him and Rungar. Melia and Ordak? You seriously do not see those two? A thief and the orc? They want to drink. It's really all they ever do, but it's what they want. Evern, Avium laughed. You might be significantly older than me, but I am much more aware of things. They like one another. It is an interesting relationship to come about in the midst of everything else that we deal with. It is good. We need good right now. It is only the good that will see us through the end. The air suddenly shifted warmer. As they were coming into the narrow passage on the outskirts of the lands of Taria, Evern realized the tides were shifting again, yet this time taking them in the direction they needed to go. The speed of the ship increased as water shot up over the front of the ship in a sudden splash. They were moving out into the deeper parts of the oceans with haste. The shift in speed was so much that those below deck came atop, and within a few moments they were through the strait and in the region that they would call the glacial seas, except it was not glacial at all. It was very warm. They began to hit stuff with the bow of the vessel, and Evorn noticed there was not some random wreckage or other floating debris, but fish, hundreds of them, dead. It begins, Aviam said. Misla is truly killing our world. Evorn adjusted the sails of the ship. They were moving east at a good speed. Rungar stood up from the device that he had been toiling with for a long time and looked to Aviam. It is done. We must simply get the device upon the other device.
Ivorn continued to guide the ship as the rest of the crew untied the weapon they had gotten in the Rusus city and float it carefully with a mix of elemental spells beneath it and Avium's Dwemar power holding, not to mention Nurokas, Ordak, and Melia doing their best to guide it directly onto the strange sled of sorts. Rungar took out his tool and seemed to fasten the device to the other device. So is it done? Evorn asked. Yes. As you see it now, this device will allow me to direct the flow of the fire for this weapon. The entire device will shoot off. It will be loud cracks and lots of smoke. We aim it into the belly of the beast. If Misla is a direct replication of Ayaklo, we aim for the center crystal beneath it. Doesn't that mean we have to sail under Misla? Ordak asked. It does. Taria was like an even darker foreboding place on the return journey. Avern looked up at the clouds. Having spent many days in the glacial seas, he'd never seen clouds do what these did. While there was still a seemingly endless wall of fog that surrounded Taria, there seemed to be striations in the clouds, almost like channels of water flowing into the vast and obscure colorings it was coming off that which was Misla. It almost seemed as if that which was over Taria was feeding or being fed by the energies of the clouds around Misla. Misla was much closer now. It was like a carved form of rock poking through the clouds and the grayish color where before had been brown stone and yellowish clouds. Furthermore, the oceans seemed to be calmer, a stark contrast to that which they had been experiencing before, but tumultuous waves and strange currents. Evium had gone to meditate on the bow of the Nakri, and as the winds began to snap over the deck, shifting an obvious cold to hot, she opened her eyes and stood up. As Avium went to one of the railings on the right side, she looked over and down into the water, and then back up. Evern, there seems to be a transference of power passing through this area. The natural world reacts as hot and cold in these strange colors in the clouds. I had thought there was something to that, Evern told her. Something indeed. I have never seen anything like this. A few moments later, Nurokas came up, holding a bowl of some kind of stew that he had apparently made in the past hour. While Evern hadn't thought much of the dwarf coming up with the spear and the stucco fish that had been swimming beside them for some time, he hadn't actually seen the dwarf prepare food. What? You're not going to eat my stew? Evern stared with a raised eyebrow as Rungar followed with his own bowl. Come now, Shadow Elf. Me and Nurokas cooked it ourselves. Freshly roasted, one might say, Rungar said with a wink. He took the stew handed to him in a small stone bowl and took a single sip. The truth was, he wasn't that hungry. Looking out, he saw the flags of ships he did not know, strange designs to be sure. But they did not appear elven. That is not a flag I know, Ordak said. That's not saying too much, Evern told him. You've been on the island of Iclo for so long, I don't expect you to know all the flags of men. Those ships are not elven or dwarven or of the island nation. Milia stared out. That's of the cities of men, local, I think. It's one of their largest cities. I had a few high-value targets and made quite a bit of gold in that city. But those six or seven ships are most likely their entire fleet. They are part of the Protectorate, and they never had much use for going into the northern oceans. It's part of what made our escape years ago so easy. Rungar laughed. Though I do not condone the actions of thievery, I cannot deny its usefulness. I believe it as you say it, Milia. Not only are there ships of the race of men, but of more interest are headed our way. Though Valrin had mentioned of their voyage through Taria and the very stringent rules, Evern had not seen any of these vessels before. Though his ship was not flying any particular flag, or even a flag at all, he kept his distance from the ships. If they wanted to actually stop him, they would have to catch up. I did not know I was on a pirate vessel, Nuroka said. We are in open waters. We fly without a flag. They're right to assume us a threat. It would be better for us to slow down, drop sails, and speak with them. 
We do not want them thinking that this vessel is the enemy's. What do you think? Evern asked Rungar and Avium. If you're asking me, Rungar said, I'd say keep your heading. Either way, they won't catch us, but perhaps they can give us information, considering there is a thick fog layering the oceans. We do not know what engagements have already started, or if any engagements at all. If we drop sails, I can send up a spell into the air to make it look as if perhaps we need assistance and not come immediately attack. Avern wasn't used to having to deal with authority of any kind, but considering they were all supposed to be working together, he dropped sails. Signal them, he said to Avium. I don't think they want any trouble with us. If they do, I'm more than confident we can take a few vessels of the race of men. Maybe these men, Nurukas said. But if it was those of the island nation, I assure you that dwarven ingenuity would make things rather difficult for a single one of these ships, no matter what power or ancient technology lies within it. I'd take that wager. Melia laughed, but against the other ship, the Aela Sunrise, that ship could take down many of the high ships of the island nation. I have heard rumors of that ship, Narokas said, and if all the rumors are true, that it slays dragons and titans without any trouble, that it took down one hundred dwarven pirate ships, well, I wouldn't want to stare down that vessel in a sea versus sea type of battle. Avium sent up a blast of white magic, a dazzling sight rising high above the waters. The small fleet moved toward them, and a singular vessel approached, coming alongside the Nakri. They tossed lines onto the deck, and Ordak and Rungar worked to tie them on. A man with a high helm of silver stood upon the railing of his own ship. Strange happening, finding such a vessel returning this way. I was told to expect something like this but in truth I expected a bit more. A weapon, something to give us hope. This is a puny vessel. Strong words for a landlover like yourself, man, Ordak joked. Did you buy the entire pride of the Protectorate Navy from a bunch of two-bit pirates? Evorn smirked at the teasing, but the vessels these men had were not some cheap fishing boats. They sat much higher in the water than the Nakri, with broad silver ballistae tips sticking out from the top level of the deck. They each had three large blue sails, and though there were only seven of them, much gold must have been required to make such vessels. The captain removed his helm, brushing his blonde hair back. I've known orcs as not the most intelligent of life, but I didn't think you were blind. These ships are the pinnacle of protectorate shipwrights, fashioned from wood found in the forests of Taria and tipped in dwarven ore, capable of penetrating a vessel even if it has been reinforced with dwarven armor. Now we know you're telling stories. Nurokas laughed. Ivern tapped his staff three times and crossed it in his arms, Rossi slithering out and around his neck, resting on his forearm. I am the captain of the Nakri. What do you need from us? We return to Srun. Captain, good to know. I wasn't sure. You wear no uniforms and you do not follow protectorate guidelines and sailing procedures. I've never been one for rules. Fair enough, neither have I. Took this commission as opposed to prison. I was actually a pirate in the southern gulf. But I have a bit of skill on the water that Lokam needed. We are an expeditionary force sent to watch the waters around Taria. As you likely know, we've had no communication with that region for some time. But I've been in direct contact with Aaron of the Island Nation. This handful of vessels and I must guard the western flank. Dwarves hold the eastern line, and the crazy bearded fool is guarding Sroon and the northern waters. They were attacked not half a day ago by a trio of monsters. Rose out of the depths and nearly made it to shore. Protectorate legions knock them back. Bastards don't care for the spears of men. There will be more, Averne warned. Sea monsters are only part of the danger that comes. We must continue on to Sroon. You know we are friends, so we'll be on our way. Head directly east, the captain said. You'll see the lights in the fogs. You can't miss them. After the last attack, something emerged from the water. Aaron claims it is a blessing from Meridas, 
but I've never heard of such a creation. It is where Aaron and the others are meeting. The captain noticed the strange ruse's weapon on the deck of the ship. Is that what you went to search for? It is, Evern said. I've heard stories of the Rusis. I've only met one or two, but I didn't believe there was a city west of here. Ruins, Rungar said. Nothing more. Keep your watch here. That is what matters now. The captain nodded. Good, good. Be on your way and know that I'm supposed to say something regarding the god of men. I'm not for that feeble crap. Kel watch over you. Throka be blessed, and may the goddess Aether carry us all into the end. He turned to his crew. Release holds. Return to patrols. Keep an eye on the horizon. Ordok and Melia worked to untie the lines on the Nakri as Evorn made his way back to the helm. It seems not all men are faithful to this false god, the priests of men push, Eavim said. He's not one of them. He's a sailor. Good man, no doubt, Nuroka said. Evern gripped the wheel, adjusting their heading away from the protectorate vessels. More fodder for what's to come, he said plainly. Rungar stood with his arms crossed just to Evern's left. If my weapon works, it will end this before too many die. That is what I keep telling myself. Keep telling yourself that, then, Evorn said. He looked up at the rolling clouds, a dark orange contrasted to a bright blue that was shrinking in against the coastline of the north. It was no passing sight to see how unnatural Misla was against their world. They continued sailing for some time, and Aveum brought Evorn some tea from below deck. Not joining them for food? Evorn asked. No, I don't find the thought of eating entertaining. He took the mug, watching the steam circle off the top before taking a sip. Cinnamon? Ordak, Avium told him with a raised brow. He insisted. She sat down behind Avorn, crossing her legs and closing her eyes. I've been trying to feel him. I can't. Evern said nothing. He didn't know what to say. I know he's alive, but beyond that... I cannot sense his place in all of this. If the weapon Rungar has is as powerful as he claims, I fear we may destroy our captain too. Ayaklo was disabled by us, but even before us, it must have been struck by one of these weapons. I'm not sure this will be enough, Avern said quietly. We buy Valrin time, that's what I see. If his weapon works and strikes Misla, I suspect we'll go into the crash city. Sort out what's going on for ourselves. That's what I see happening. Ordak mentioned the same to me. He wonders if we'll have the numbers to invade them. It's Marog and his ilk, not an entire Dwemhar city. But is it? What do we know? Avium said. Misla comes from another realm, an alternate version of Ayeklo, something Marog is bringing to our world to complete what Ayeklo could not. What if it has all that Iaclo was meant to have? What if the Dwemar from another reality come with him, and he's in complete control of them? I put my faith in the Stormborn. He knew what he was doing. He is my hope in all of this. We cannot rely on the gods to help us. At that moment, Evern caught sight of a bright fire burning through an ever-deepening fog that rolled over them. The air here was warm, much warmer than before and the smell of salt was suddenly strong, repulsive. As they turned toward the light ahead, they emerged through what felt like some kind of veil, and the air snapped cold. Before them was a massive tower of coral and polished stone, a structure so tall that there was no way they simply missed it before. Avern tapped his staff on the deck beneath him several times, and Ordak and Melia were the first of the group to come out. What in the gods is this? Melia asked. Exactly, Rungar said. It is something of Meridas, a rare creation. But that's what this is. The fish god must have decided to take action. The Nakri rocked beneath them, and Evern looked over the side of the ship to see narwhals swimming beneath them. The current took control of the ship, bringing it quickly toward a long line of reef with white docks where many other vessels were moored. 
The tower in which sat upon this massive construct had a large pearl high above them. Energy emanating out from the pearl whipped around them, powering whatever ward of spell was being used to keep out the warmth of Misla. The ship came to rest against an empty dock, and surprisingly locked into the dock, not unlike the Ayla Sunrise would at Dwemhar docks. Ordak, Milia, Evern said. Stay here for now. I do not want the ship left alone with the Rusi's weapon. No, no, I have something for that, Rungar said. He closed his eyes, putting his hands together before suddenly revealing multiple arms coming out of him in a circle. Then, as if that weren't odd enough, several ethereal forms of himself, hooded and with spells in their hands, took position around the entire length of the ship. An army. You keep an army in your robes? Ordak asked. Just a part of me, a creation of the mind's eye. Something a VM should know more about that eye. But it is a Rusis trick, nothing more. Not that they're helpless, quite the opposite. But it's a good way to keep unwanted types or prying eyes from doing what they should not. They disembarked, stepping out onto the dock. Evern led them toward two statues holding tridents at the far end of the dock. They looked like elves, but with long hair covered in shells. As they got closer, Evan realized that these statues were not statues at all, but a spell. They moved slightly, revealing their light blue skin and gills on their necks. Evern, one of them said, you and your crew have been the last to arrive. The others are above. Welcome to the Gathering of Souls. Part 8. The Final Option We're not souls yet, Avern told the Siren. The Siren bowed. Meridas welcomes the Stormborn's crew. Many have gathered from across the shorelines through portals to this sacred place. You have taken the path of the sea, and now the gathering is complete. Proceed upward, give thanks to Meridas, and then continue to the council. Avern moved past them, the crew following behind him. There was a single white stairwell leading from the docks to a door made of two massive conch shells. He climbed up the stairs, Evium just to his right. This place is not what it appears, she said. Was it the fact that it's frigid cold, or that it appeared where before there was just ocean that told you that? Both, she said and that I do not feel a connection to the world. We've left the realm we were in before. He stopped as he reached the door, giving the others time to catch up. While he did, he looked out toward the sea. He could see that the water beyond the veil around this place was churning and almost appeared to be bubbling. The sky above them was dark blue, almost as if they were not in the living realm at all, but someplace else. It was here he saw that there weren't many other sea vessels. He was certain he saw Aaron's high ship, but aside from a few dwarven ships, nothing else. They like their shells, don't they? Ordak asked. I think it's really nice, Melia said. These are some of the largest shells I've ever seen. It's a temporal palace, a place of the gods made for a meeting between races, Rungar said. Here, time has slowed. We are not part of the living realm for the moment. It gives us a safe place to actually discuss what needs to be discussed without fear of interruption or of events beyond ourselves. The last one I knew of was just prior to the flooding of the North, when the Dwemar attempted to drown out their own mistakes. Was that not an action of the gods? Ordak asked. It depends on who you ask, Rungar said. I might be a bit biased. Strange that this palace would be visible from our normal realm, Avium said. Yes, I guess if you wanted it to be secret. These places were not meant to be secret. Back then, all races held reverence to the gods, and this was seen as yet another proof of their power. A bit more proof of their power would be them taking Misla and tossing it toward the stars, Ordak said. Just knock it away. He made a punching motion. They could. There was some belief amongst Rusi's scholars that there were worlds beyond our own, that you could move through the top of our world into a world between worlds, where there were other bodies of life, 
other vessels moving through a great sea of particles and matter beyond our simple existence. But that was a different time when knowledge was prized beyond self-interest. A long lost time, for sure. Evern opened the door, and they stepped into a room many times larger than it appeared the tower was. Here, great whales swam in the air around them. There were fish of varying colors and several eels that snaked around Evern's legs, yet they were not in the water. A massive fish with a golden crown upon its head came into view. Ever knew this being, Meridas, in one of his many forms. He was gargantuan, larger than even the largest of the whales. He had a pod of narwhals swimming just beneath him, yet they appeared no larger than a mouse when compared to a horse. As they stood before the great shroud of the ocean, a vision, as it seemed, Meridas spoke with a low and booming voice. Evern and Rasi, Shadow Elf, Wizard, Crafter of poisons of Viarica, keeper of the Thanakri, and faithful sea serpent, Iaviam, daughter of Lorlam, and the one called the Scourge Siren, Dwemhar descendant, keeper of the powers of Rusus and Dwemhar, Rungar, golden templar, defender of the northern void gate, faithful follower of the ten divines, master of elementals, Ordak, blood of orc and man, warrior of the Shadowlands, drinker of coffee with cinnamon. Wait, are you kidding me? That's what I'm known for by the gods? Ordak laughed and shook his head. Makes me wonder what I'll get, Melia joked. Melia, Meridas continued, daughter of Finar, shard of the Broken Order, guild master of thieves. Avern looked over to her. He knew little of the Broken Order, but he had heard of them and their service to the Itsu. It was a cult known not in the north, but in the far south, pillagers of the sunken lands. Milia did not seem pleased with this reveal and lowered her head. Meridas paused. Several narwhals swam around Milia. You were saved from death. Do not let that of the past trouble your future. You fled from a life that would have led to true death. That is recognized by the gods of the north. Have faith. Milia looked up. No one knew that. No one needs to know that. Child, this is a place where judgment will not be passed. Your fellow companions all have acts they wish not known, but they are. You have made a choice to move forward. That is what matters. The narwhals nuzzled her, and she laughed as the playful creatures bobbed up and down in front of her. Meridas came at last to the dwarf. Nurokas, hammer song of Haradar, servant of Throka, Bane of Demon Lord Nakin, Bane of Demon Prince Rorda, Bane of Demon Defiler Throdar, Lone Defender of the Mouth to Haradar. Damn, dwarf, save a bit for someone else, Ordak said. They were demons. All my kin fled. I didn't have much of a choice, Naroka said. Meridas blew a volley of bubbles through all of them. The others who came before were quiet at my words. You six have interrupted these titles more times than any others in my creation. Do you not marvel at the sight before you? After all we've seen, Ordak said, nothing really surprises us anymore. Evern leaned out to look at Ordak. Though he didn't personally care much for the gods, he knew it better to respect them than to talk at random like Ordak. That as it be, I welcome you and all as previously announced. Misla comes to bring about our end. The very seas have shifted. Terror is upon us. You are among those chosen to prevent such a calamity. The gods watch over all. This is a place of reverence, a house of old meant for conversations. Rungar, you know of this, but this is not a festering ground for dissident. When at last all has been discussed, you may leave with the agreeance of the others. But once you leave, the protection falls. Use this time. Form your plans. Actions moving forward will form the ground for generations from now. Proceed forward. The room shrank in size and grandness, becoming half the size as it appeared before, with several candles along a lone altar to their right. Dwarf, Rungar said. Those were the names of demons. You slew demons? Where? We dwarves delve deep and greedily as some stories of us say. 
though I've never been much for sparkly stuff, I'm all for a fair fight. In the mountains that border the Shadowlands, there are places where there is a hint to a subterranean world, a place told of in some dwarven stories from our kin who live in the Shadowlands. It is there where the great pillars of the Creator of all things supposedly act as gateways to our world from a nether world. From that comes the sleeping blackness. These creatures claim to be of an ancient time, a time beyond, I guess, the formation of that which makes up you and I. I have killed the ones Meridas spoke of. Rungar bowed to Nurokas. I have never heard of any dwarf killing one. Though you must fight ones that were sealed beneath the ground prior to the creation of the great gates in my time, it is still something I would not have believed if not spoken by the sea god himself. Well, we can talk about it after this is all over. You can come to Haradar, have a good dwarven brew. Evern motioned. Come on, there's been enough talk. Let's see who we're dealing with here and determine how we're moving forward. There was another stairwell some distance ahead, down a corridor leading from the room where they were spoken to by Meridas. Here there was another doorway that opened as they approached. As Evern and Aviam entered, they noticed there were many more people here. There were also portal doorways on the far edge of the room, just behind the seating area. He had come about these in the Shadowlands, but in most cases they were in vampire lairs. It was a strange sight to see here. Looking around, Evern saw elves, dwarves, and several of the race of men. He noticed there were several sirens, too, people he had never had many dealings with. Then he saw him, a face he did not expect to see. Rugag. The crew of the Stormborn, Aaron, the admiral of the island nation, announced. The discussions between the many peoples went silent, and Evern led them forward. The room was a circle, formed around a great pool with glass high above their heads. There were torches with blue fire glowing in columns that encircled the room. Between every column there was a large glass window, and as such they could see a complete view in all directions. There was only a single bench, a long encircling seat, where all who were present were there as equals. Before them, on a table with many black clay pieces already lined up, was a map of the north. Evern scanned each of those present. Rugag sat with a host of other dwarves, including some who were most likely high lords of Haradar, evident from their silver crowns. Of the elves he saw few he even recognized, but then he saw a man in a white robe, not too unlike the priests they had dealt with in Radinba, a servant of the god of man. Aaron walked in a circle before the table. Now that we are all here, we can discuss what many of you had asked me in private. I am not a king. I speak for King Hathul, who was tending to the matter of the greater defense of the island nation and Srun. Lords of Narasond, the elf I know as True Song has taken up defense of the walls of Srun. You have sent one thousand of your kin to support us, and for that we are thankful. The High Elves of Narasond have foretold a darkness, one of the elves said. Evur noticed she had soft features and long black hair. Ever since our connections to Sailmark were lost, we have kept careful watch on the workings of the world. I have even been allowed into the great halls of Haradar, a personal guest of the sons of Harak. It seems that what may destroy us in time has united us for now. I dream of a world where the wars of the past are just that, and that my daughter can grow up in such a way that she does not fear that which I have. Lady Ailea of Narasan, for an elf, your daughter Beri, is fair and good with a bow, a dwarf said standing. I am Barok, a son of Harok, descendant of the dwarf Dici, and as the elf was a guest in our halls, I too have visited Narasond, seen the great torches in the mountains, and though my kin have made war with the elves, I seek none of that. The hammer songs of Haradar are ready. We have a small fleet of forty vessels, and have been joined by Rugag, dwarven lord, commander of the spine fleet of the glacial seas. Evurn and Eavium both worked to contain their resentment to this person. Rugag was well known to the crew of the Ayala Sunrise, 
and though Melia, Rungar, and Ordak knew little of this, Nurokas knew well of Evurn and Eviam's thoughts. Nurokas stood. Master Barak, Rugag is a lord by his own right. Like many here, he has enemies sitting in this room. But following the events ahead, Rugag will go before the thrones of Haradar to answer for Gurun Dothrak and his previous master's crimes. Aaron crossed his arms. I think we can all agree to work together for the time being. The threat to us as a whole is upon the Great Bay. While the dwarves will guard the shorelines east and south of Srun, I see the dwarven fleet as part of the claw I wish to snap around Misla. The high ships of the island nation have formed a battle line, stretching from our waters north of the great island all the way to the middle point outside the protection of this place. From there, the Protectorate of the North has some ships off the coast of Taria, and its legions have formed on the beaches before their cities. Perhaps we can hear from you directly. A man sitting next to the one in white robes stood up. He had silver armor, and though he joined Aaron looking over the map, he was noticeably shorter, and his small sword looked comical next to the large broadsword Aaron had on his back. I am the commander of the legions, men and women from all of the cities along the coast, a unified force meaning to protect all threatened by the evil in the clouds. Except Radinba, the man in white spoke. Except Radinba, the commander repeated. I do not understand, Aaron said. Is Radinba not a province under your rule? The commander was shaking, looking back at the man in white robes. Aaron looked between the two of them. The commander abruptly sat back down, and the man in white stood. Ever noticed that there was a presence about this character, a flowing spirit that, while not outright malignant, it stirred something within Evern's own mind. I, Tom, am of a sacred order of the race of man, Tom said. We have found truth on our own, a way to the light under new knowledge. Radenba was the site of a massacre of some of our officials, Radenba has sinned and shall be punished. Aaron pursed his lips, opening his hands. I don't get why that means that the city is not under protection. The criminals you speak of should be held accountable, not the city. You are correct, Admiral. Tom's eyes traced over to Rungar. Aaron looked over. At this point, Rungar stood up. Yes, it was me. I slaughtered his officials. They preached of their own god, the god of man. They considered it heresy that I speak of the gods of the north. They have persecuted my own kind who live within their very city. I do not know of your order, Rungar said, pointing at him. But those officials claimed they were priests and brought with them a demon of fogs. You know little, Rusis, Tom pointed. Radenba believes in the gods of the north. We do not. Aaron twitched a bit, sighing. I'm not here to force beliefs on anyone, but when the entire room outside of those of my own nation believe in the gods of the North, I'd advise those representatives of men present to resist the desire to preach a new religion. The legions stand ready. We have ballisti focus to protect the shore, Tom went on. Our fleet is small, but if this threat, whatever it is, comes within range, it shall feel the might of our legions. But tell me, Aaron of Sron, how does the island nation have such a fleet? The rest of the gathering stared at the admiral. Aaron looked over to Avern and then back to Tom before addressing all that were present. Sron has existed for many generations, a solitary beacon of the old world. The gods blessed us with that of a forgotten race and a single charge to protect the oceans from the vile of the world. That is what we do, my people, will sail upon the waters and do all we can to support the Nakri and the crew of the Stormborn. Little matters save that we protect that which is precious to all of us, our peoples, our homes, and all that we hold dear. The answer seemed suitable to all except Tom. Evern had questions, but he figured he'd know what was needed soon enough. It didn't change what he and the crew needed to do. He assumed that whatever secret Sroon and the island nation had, it was something acceptable to the elves of Narasond and the dwarves of Haradar. 
The fact that Tom, who was openly against the gods, seemed to want to drive division at this hour, made him happy. They did not have a true fleet in which to sail with them. Evern could tell Aaron still did not wish to divulge more than he had to. So far, that had seemed to work. What is the bloody thing? a random dwarf shouted. We all talk of plans, but this massive scourge is just floating through the skies. It's a weapon, Rungar said. A weapon of the Dwemhar, a city destroyer. If it reaches a position above your city, it can unleash a beam of energy capable of turning any construct of elf, dwarf, or man into rubble in a matter of seconds. How do you come by this wisdom? Alia asked. Ayeklo, an ancient flying city, once wrought destruction on my own kind. It was destroyed, but at great costs. Ayeklo is an island, Barak said. An island that, as I understand it, sank a few weeks ago. We cannot trust this charlatan. This is a demon, a construct meant to drive fear, Tom said. No, Melia said. I am of your race, and I once was the leader of a... She paused. A guild in the city of Celir. The outside of the island was hard stone, but the inner parts of the island were an old city. The place made no sense to me, but it was not just an island. Misla comes not from our world, but a linear one, similar to ours in every way. That is what emerges, not through the clouds, but through the very fabric of our realm, moving from one realm to another. It is close. Very close. If the old Ayaklo is the same as this that comes, does it not have a city too? Aaron asked. We don't know, Evern said. A shadow elf here, Rugag said. Strange, I knew one once. Burned his own house down to hide from the dwarves of the glacial seas. Even looked a bit like you. As Evern stood up, Rossi dropped down on the table, slithering across the map and hissing in the direction of Rugag. I am a shadow elf, but I bring no fleets from the Shadowlands. I stand with the Stormborn as a crew member of the Aela Sunrise, and currently I sail with the Nakri, a ship of the Dwemhar. My captain is Valrin, Stormborn of the Glacial Seas. He is on Misla as we speak. Evern ignored Rugag, and from his annoyed expression, Rugag wanted more of a confrontation. Your captain is with the enemy? A Hammersong present asked. He is. Captured? Another asked. No, he went willingly, but he has not joined the enemy. If any can stop this before it begins, it is him. One of the lords of Narasond, an elf with a long white beard, stood and bowed. I know of the prophecy of the Stormborn, and its tie to the greater prophecy of the glacial seas, the belief that saviors of all of us will emerge from there and carry us through a dark period in time where light has been extinguished and shadow rules. But this emergence, this Misla, is not part of that. As one with a gift of foresight and a dreamer of dreams, I did not see this coming. I saw a great darkness, a brooding evil that grows in parts of our world, a snake sneaking not too unlike your own serpent, to snap at those of magic, but not this. Who rules this city, and what has the crew of the Stormborn found in the wastelands of Kiva? Rasi slithered back over to Evern, moving up to his shoulder. Marog, an entity of the Dwemhar Elio, a sentient dark power made from Eli's removal of his own dark energies in a self-proclaimed path of righteousness. With him, a cult of mask-wearing followers, and even some controlled by old rings of power. There have been some that have faced these masked wearers. They call themselves the Ishta, though we know little else about them. If Misla is a city as we know Ayaklo once was, Marog brings the full might of the Dwemhar Empire down upon us, not to mention a fleet that has emerged from the edges of the world, with ships using magic as their primary weapons. Then, of course... There are the sea monsters of varieties beyond sense. The Dwemhar fell thousands of years ago, Barak said. I only know of their stories. Flying ships, not like the ships we have but of metal, and powerful psychics. It is said that some ascended while others did not. 
We seek to end this before it comes to that, Rungar said. In Keva, we found a creation of my people, a device capable of bringing down the entire city in one strike. Then we must use this weapon now, Tom shouted. Strike before it is too late. We must not strike too soon. The city is not within our realm, Rungar said. And I must admit that this weapon is untested. It was not a first-line weapon. He paused. I was... My kin were. We went into Iaclo in our world and fought to destroy it from within. Is this not an option? Barak asked. The dwarves of Haradar will join any willing to undertake this task. We have no way to get onto that place, Rungar said. What of the dragons of the south, King Nevron? Barak said. Nevron is a friend of ours, Evern said. But the last we heard, the islands were under the control of agents who serve Marog. He and his kin are attempting to find allies and perhaps liberate their home. But we cannot expect help from them. Then tell us, Shadow Elf, what we should do since you have no positive news of any kind. You have an old ship, a weapon that might work. Give us something actionable. We hold the line, Aaron said. Before the arrival of the Stormborn crew, I laid out our defense. We protect our lands no matter the enemy, be it more sea monsters or a fleet or something else. Once this weapon, Misla, he said, looking to Rungar, is revealed, can you strike it? I will need to be under Misla. I will need to be directly at an angle to which I can attack the core of the structure. Then upon its reveal, we must take flanking positions, allow the Nakri to get into place, Aaron said. I still think Valrin will reveal his plan, Evern said. Aaron shook his head. I trust in your friend, but I cannot risk the entirety of the northern coast on something you think will happen. Have you had contact with your friend? Evorn looked to Avium and then back to Aaron with a sharp sigh. No, but he is not within our realm. Once he is, perhaps, he may already be in control of Misla. His ship, the Ayla Sunrise, is within the city of Misla, taken by the enemy. If we see his ship, if we see him, then we'll know we have the upper hand. The Ayla Sunrise has weaponry capable of damaging the city, too. He could take action on his own, and none of our warriors may need to do anything. I pray it happens as you speak, Aaron said but I must prepare for the opposite. And of the destruction of this place, Tom added, has it been decided who shall have command of the remnants of the city? It should be destroyed, Rungar said. All of it. That is what should happen. The dwarves seemed a bit perturbed by this, but the elves were nodding slowly. That which was, which may be our own bane, should not be kept in any form. Even I do not know all of what Iaclo had, but nothing of Misla should be considered useful. Then we have what we consider a plan, Aaron said. It isn't perfect, but none of us can expect that. At least this operation is on the water and not on the land. The sirens have said that they will assist as needed. Remember, in the past few hours we have had the summoning of a horrid winter storm. The very balance of our world wobbles upon our actions right now. Avium suddenly stood up, igniting her spells in her hands and pushing upward. The veil falls! A thunderclap snapped around them, the windows blowing out of the top of the tower, and a sudden gust of frigid air shot through the tower. Avorn and several of the elves lifted their staves, their magics joining with Avium's to support the wavering ward. This was a place of the gods, a place safe from outside influence, but whatever had happened had changed that. A silver form slammed into the table, shattering it. A single white warrior stood up, looking around with bright blue eyes. Barak charged forward, axe in hand, yet this figure simply turned, snapping a slender blade from its hilt at its hip and killing the dwarf lord. He drew a second blade and held it out as the dwarves stumbled back, looking on in horror as their lord's blood poured out on the floor. 
A few dwarves attempted to step forwards, and a blast of smothering heat rolled out from this figure's form. People of this realm, I have come. Bear witness to the might of Marag as I, Riakar, defender of the one god and hand of judgment, decree you have been judged and found guilty. Now all must submit to the glory of Marog. Rungar stepped before Riakar. Brother, this isn't you. I know you understand the science of realms, of realities. The Riakar of my time would have paused, would have thought of what he was doing. Clearly he was a false being. Riakar's eyes burned with a furious ripple of blue fire. He pointed his blades up. Behold, Misla. Behold your new path. Above the great tower, devoid of the divine protection it had allegedly offered, Evern looked up to see a grand white crystal at the front of that, which was Misla, the great city of Marog, finally entering the realm. The path between the two realities, a bend in time and space, was shredded apart, allowing this massive white crystal to begin to light up the sky like a second sun, a growing light. Marog knows that you will not believe without miracle and wonder, so he had elected a merciful release. The elves of Narisond attempted to attack, releasing a furious barrage of arrows, but Ryakar simply lifted his hand. They froze in place and fell to the ground. Other warriors who tried to draw weapons fell unconscious. Behold, the wondrous energies of the eternal night crystals! A single beam of energy burst across the already bright sky as all of the light from the crystal focused into the beam, forming a circular halo that ran down the single beam. Then there came a thunderous snap, and the bright beam grew to a monstrous size and then went dark. A column of fire erupted on the coastline. That was Lok, a city just north of Lokum, Aaron shouted. You must submit, all of you. Pledge yourselves to Marog. Call out his name, and you will be spared. Otherwise, of you who stand here and of your rulers who are elsewhere, I shall be your bane. I will kill all of you. Your people will submit or die, for there is no other way. Misla comes, and with it, your only path to salvation. Riakar lifted back up, returning to Misla in a beam of light as the break above them was sealed, and Misla became as clouds again. They destroyed an entire city, Aaron said, looking at Rungar. They weren't even above it. They did it from the boundary of the glacial seas. We cannot wait. We must strike. Tom stomped towards Aaron. If action is not taken, the realm of men will pledge ourselves to Marog. Avern looked over to him. You cannot. It is a lie. He will destroy you and all of your kind. He seeks no new followers. It is a ruse. Shadow Elf, you believe in a young captain who clearly is not in control. I just saw a dwarf lord struck down without this Rhea car needing to do more than flick a blade. I saw arrows fall to the floor, fired from elven bows. This is beyond those in this room. How many thousand just died with a single blast of magic? How are we to protect ourselves? The race of men will do what we must to survive. Damn you all. He and the Legion commander went to a portal behind their seats, their own path back to their city. Tom pointed back at them. Curse all of you who trust in the false gods of the North. A new world will come, one without your wretched hands, where you in this room are forgotten, where history is as we, the order of men, seek. Damn you to your demise. Nurokas was with the other hammer songs. The dwarves of Haradar prepare to sail, Admiral. We will join you in defense of the Nakri. Dwarves, I ask you protect Srun, defend my home. The high ships of Srun will support the Nakri. Be prepared to move in on their flank if they present one. I do not know what enemy is ahead of us, and all has become more complicated. We must trust in this weapon of the Rusis. Nurokas bowed and departed, carrying their fallen lord with them. Aaron looked to Avern and then to Rungar. 
This was a place that the goddess Aether woke me in a dream to tell me to go to. I entered a portal in my ship and was before Meridaz himself, yet our enemy could reach us here. We have no other chance but to strike and strike now. I won't give up my seas to any glowing fiery-eyed being or sea monster or anything else. Your Captain Valrin, if he were to act, it would have already happened. We can't wait. Part 9. Shattering Moon. Aaron, Rugag, and Evern remained in the room as Rungar took the rest of the crew down to the Nakri. Evern stared at Rugag as Aaron rolled up what remained of his now-torn map. The wind howled. A great icy storm was upon them, a contrast to the warm winds of Misla and a clear sign that the natural world was fighting against the unnatural events of Misla. I do believe in your faith in your friend, Aaron said, but we can't wait. I pray you understand. Evern wiped a single tear in the corner of his eye and turned away, gripping his staff and taking several deep breaths. I am ready to do what I need to do, he said plainly, though he wasn't. He knew there was nothing else for him to say at this moment. An unknown number of people had just looked up, seeing a bright flash form the sky before the city erupted in a blast of fire. The dwarven fleet will support the island nation, Rugog said, still present near the edge of the room. We will protect the Nakri and the crew of the Stormborn. He said this not for Aaron, and it was obvious to Evern. Evern stared at him. We're in this together, Sea Dwarf. Don't forget it. If you betray us, you better hope Marog kills you, for if he doesn't, I will. No good serving a false god. I might not be your ally after this, but for now our interests align. I've got good faith that those in Haradar will excuse the actions of my master. We'll be back to our little game in the glacial seas in time. All the whales have fled. No profit to be had now. I'm fighting for my home. We all are, Aaron said. Captains, the darkness has shrouded over us. The black moon over Taria has grown in size. I have seen waves in the bay like never before, and the tides are pulled with such ferocity you should be wary of whirlpools. The island nation, the great island of Srun, will ignite the three beacons, great torches of green fire that you should be able to see off to the east. If you get turned around, let it be your guide. Srun is but a small fortress on the rocks, Rugag said. Not all know our truth, but the elves and dwarves in this room know now, and you will soon see Dwarf. We sail north from here with all the haste we can muster. I will signal my fleet, and we will end this. Rugag, due to this, I ask that you join your kin, stay in reserve near Srun. Our high ships are much faster than your vessels. If the weapon of the Rusus works, we'll still have a fight ahead of us. I'll need your ships then. Aye, Admiral. I will see you on the seas. Rugag said. He departed, heading down to the docks, leaving only Aaron and Evern in the ruined tower. You might have fooled the others, but you didn't me, Aaron said, looking to Evern. My wife and my boy are on our island, everything I love. I've known few shadow elves in my time, but most have disgusted me. Out there on those waters, you can't hesitate. I won't. Remember that. What I didn't bring up is the fact that the Stormborn, if he has fallen to the enemy, may very well face us out on those seas. I'm not sure what kind of person you really are beyond the robes and the snake. I've dealt with pirates from the Shadowlands, and I deal with a dwarven one who just left who I can't really trust. I will remember that I cannot hesitate. Don't tell me that you're not sure of my resolve, that I won't do what is needed. I've ruled an empire in my time, Admiral not some fleet of boats as yourself. I do not need your words to explain the stake of what we do. Aaron nodded slightly. Then we are at an understanding. An empire? Strange, strange for you to be on a crew in the icy glacial seas. Where's that empire? Sometimes the best you can do for your people is to die. Sometimes it is the only way to protect what you love. I speak little of it. You are to tell no one. It is better for both of us this way. Aaron nodded. 
They exited the tower, heading down into the room where Meridas had appeared before, which now had a gaping hole in the roof. The tower had been broken by Riakar, and now only the frame of the lower door remained. They exited the structure, journeying down to a gathering of ships moving around the island. Orange lightning streaked across the northern sky as Misla loomed above them. Avern looked down to see the crew aboard the Nakri as snow began to blow upon them. A host of Aaron's men had come onto the shore. The Bovika fleet is ready. They guard the island itself. Lunis, Kersa, and Uka fleets stand ready at your command. We have mustered an additional one hundred high ships. Good. Signal all ships to move into a moon formation behind my ship. Uka fleet shall deploy in the frontal arc. I will hoist the golden orb on the deck of the Nakri. We must protect the ship as it moves beneath Misla. One of the lower admirals bowed. We saw the flash. We've already gotten messages that a city was raised by the bright light from the clouds. Was it the gods who did so? Will they strike again? We heard a voice in the air, a... Aaron cut him off and pointed up. Misla and its ruler are not a god. Our gods are Kel, Meridas, Wura, Etha, Dimn, and Throka. That one who did that is just as us, blood and bone. Do not worry of their shows of power. The high ships of the island nation will turn any we face into wreckage, and we command these seas. The officers bowed. Aye, sir. Come with me, Ivorn, Aaron said. Avorn followed the admiral to his ship docked just a few spaces from where the Nakri was. The White Stormcrow, my own personal ship. Quite a ship, Evern said. It sits lower in the water than I'd expect, much like that other one you had. Do you keep this one put away for special occasions? Ha, ah, something like that. The long vessel had a wide bottom and was bright white. Along the deck were lines of ballistae, with red liquid held in the mouth of what looked like a dragon's head when looked at from above. But there was no weak point in this bolt, and the machined bolt was as strong as any dwarven axe. Along the center of the deck there were golden wings, not too unlike a bird, but folded up with many spears affixed to the bottom of the wings. Aaron noticed Evren was staring. These weapons are unlike any you have likely seen, Srun has an entire system of shipwrights, a marvelous sight, but it allows our island to produce ships in an insane amount of time. We have our secrets in the island nation. Sure, the dwarves helped, but it is the old ones, the Strantavedi. It was by their guide that we have made Srun Island into something beyond anything else. Our city has many secrets, as does my ship. I trust our secret to you as you trusted your secret to me. They shared a smile, and then the admiral led him forward and onto the main deck of the ship. His men saluted him as he passed, and he did one single salute to all of them. Make ready this vessel for a grand time, and make sure there are no tentacle pieces on my deck. I don't want to slip again. Aye, admiral, several crew members said. Aaron led him to a door that led to a cabin beneath a moon-shaped roof that jutted out from the helm on the second level. As they entered the cabin, Avern took note of a table not too unlike the table that the Nakri had. Aaron locked the door and went around to the table, pushing a series of stones on one side and bringing up an image of the great bay that appeared in a shimmering pool on the stone. You have seen this before, Shadow Elf? Aaron asked. Of course, the Nakri has this. The Ayla sunrise trumps us both, but I did not know this existed anywhere else. Secrets, Captain. Secrets. He pushed a stone, and the image suddenly centered over Lok, the city that was north of Lokum on the coast. The city was gone, a ruined crater filling with water and casting great columns of smoke into the air. He pushed another stone, and an image of King Hathol appeared. We saw it. I was waiting to hear from you. Sire, I have commanded the fleets proceed forward. The Nakri will deliver a weapon into the heart of Misla. This is our final moment. Ignite the torches, signal the Srun home fleet to protect the island. Engage the inner silver core. You have command of all forces. I will retain command of Srun. 
The elves have set up along the outer wall with true song. We have prepared for evacuation if needed, but I pray it does not come to that. Makli, friend of Avorn and the Stormborn, has arrived here and is preparing to assist in our defense. Misla drifts south, but do not wait if that crystal weapon appears again. It is one of two large weapons Misla is believed to have. The other is where we strike. If for whatever reason we fail, take care of them, please. I will see you here when this is over, Admiral. May the gods be with you. King Hathel vanished. The Silver Core? An energy system, something of the Stranta Vedi or Dwemhar or Rusis, I don't know. It works, and I'm good with it. Science and shipbuilding were never my specialty. There are many secrets beneath the depths. Everything is set now. The city keeps all our advanced systems engaged. We've never revealed them, but it's not a secret to hide now. Does Rungar know of your city's secret? Rungar likely does, but he hasn't mentioned it. That man knew more about our king and his line than we did. He's quite a man. Ever nodded. I must tell you, Evern, that your mention of the Strantavedi surprised myself and King Hathul just after our first meeting. It is but one more sign that our own apocalypse is upon us. It is an old story, but our legends tell of the stormborn and destruction. I fear what is to come, but we are all upon these waters together. Thunder rolled outside, and Evern smiled and exhaled. Let us depart. Admiral Aaron shifted off the Strantavedi machinery and walked Evern back outside. Snow covered the deck, and the winds blew over them. Here, Aaron said, handing Evern a small golden orb. Put this in your center mast. It will only be visible by other high ships of the island nation, but it will allow us to form around you and keep a consistent lock on your location. Oh, and this, he said, offering him a necklace. Evern took the necklace and immediately thought back to Valrin's story of the necklace and the Ayla sunrise. It will allow me to speak with you over the ocean. Aaron smiled. Tell me, Aaron, Evern said, his own mind confused at his beliefs of the race of men, and in particular this race. I do not know where the island nation comes from. You are not like the men of the north, yet you have such a tie to the sea. Shadow Elf, not all the secrets of the island nation will be revealed to you in such a short time. We are those who remember the old, yet embrace that of the new world. We are of men just as any others, yet we hold reverence from our teachers. We believe in the Dwemhar way, and we will do all we can to protect these oceans. Fair sailing, Captain. Ever nodded, giving the captain a small smile. He exited the vessel, walking toward the Nakri as he looked back at the high ship. Though they were in no way the Strantavedi or the Dwemhar, the island nation was a faithful friend to the Stormborn. In these final hours, with so much at stake, they were coming up to protect the ocean just as Valrin had sworn to do before. He wondered of these events, if the island nation were to, at one time before the coming of Misla, play a bigger part with Valrin and his quest as the Stormborn. Perhaps, after all of this, they still would. As he came to the Nakri, he saw that Ordok and Melia were now wearing armor. It was dark brown with red metal pieces along the shoulders. Found it in a crate, old, a bit smelly, but better than bare skin going into a battle, Ordak said. It is of the Strantavedi, Valrin's people, Aviam said, also wearing the armor. I'm not one for armor, but it seems like an honorable thing to do. Ever nodded. Taking the armor, he proceeded into the room beneath the helm. He wasn't one for armor anymore, especially the type you could find in most places outside his homeland. But this particular piece was simple. A hardened leather, not too unlike what he wore at one time back when he was younger. The material wasn't leather, though that was the closest he could compare it to. There was a knock on the door. Come in, he said. It was Rungar. All my preparations are ready. I've rechecked the weapon. We just need to get underneath Misla. Evern covered himself with his robe again. 
covering up Phoenix hide armor. Now that is something I didn't expect. Phoenix like the birds, really? Evern said, rubbing it. Yes, light, strong, waterproof. Good for those on the water. Designed by Rusus, strangely enough. You will not be wearing any, I see, Evern said, pointing at Rungar. No, my gauntlets are all I need. I can shield myself with my magic. These gauntlets are all I have left of my homeland, all that I can be proud of, at least. Evern nodded, taking a deep breath. What's your plan? After this is all over? He asked the Rusus. Rest, Rungar said. I'd much like to have a moment to breathe, maybe do some fishing. Since Valrin and the others released me from the ring's grasp, I've been either fighting or preparing to fight. I'm not for that anymore. Taria is a mess. The Rangers of the North, that Fadis, he's their leader. They've been trying to keep an upper hand. It's just too much. I guess I'll put off the fishing. Go west, help Taria. I guess, in a way, I still feel like I did back when Iaclo first cursed our skies. I still desire to protect the people, even if that was so long ago. Evern motioned for Rungar to follow him. As they stood out on the deck, he noticed Melia and Ordak setting up the strange spears they had used before. Aeovium had brought at least two dozen of the golden rods with red tips from a recessed passage that Evern didn't even know was on the side of the ship. More weapons! The little turtle construct found it. Ordak spit off the deck. The little guy is quite useful, he said. He even sharpened my blades for me, sorted out a small break in Melia's hilt. Good stuff. Avern stood silent, looking at Evium, Ordak, Melia, and Rungar. They all paused, looking at him. I guess this is where you expect me to say something profound, Evern said, smacking his lips and pulling out his pipe. He pulled out his tobacco pouch and found only a single pinch of leaf, stuffing it unceremoniously into the bowl, he lit it with his staff and puffed until the embers glowed red. Well, here goes. We'll need a bit more tobacco when we're done with this. He looked at them. They all knew the risk before them, the stake at hand, and that after all this ahead, no one was guaranteed to be here. He smiled. I'm not one for long speeches. Just action. Ordak knew me before the rest of you. I've done things many times that I said I wouldn't. Monsters going back to Ayaklo, leaving my little island in the first place. But if you told me I'd be where I am right now, I wouldn't have believed you. For good reason. I'm not sure this will work, he said, pointing to Rungar. But I trust this one. When this city falls, I'm sailing this ship into the wreckage and I'm finding our captain. I don't care where he is. I don't care if he fights me. And if he needs my help in battle, I'll be there. I expect none of you to follow me. But if you do, know that I have no intent of returning. If Valrin has fallen, I will be better served to enact my revenge on every soul still breathing on Misla than to return to you. Silence befell them. A cold wind gusted over the deck. Evern went to the center mast and placed the orb Aaron had given him. The golden orb began to glow and rose to the top of the mast, flashing twice before sending out a beam to the white storm crow. What was that? Avium said. Our island nation friends have quite the ships. We have good allies. We have the best chance we're going to have. The veil around the island began to crack and collapse, orange lightning striking it from the outside, cracking and snapping the place once believed safe by the gods. Evern hurried to the helm, engaging the ship's sails and feeling the energy surge within the ship. The veil fell sending up a plume of water as fogs rolled over them. Avium, forward position. Protect the weapon. Ordak Milia, keep yourself prepared. He couldn't see any of the crew, much less the mast directly in front of him, or even the railing in front of the helm. It was then he suddenly saw a red glow on the deck, followed by a spark of fire that grew in size, looking almost as if a single column of fire before an explosion sent a stream of orange light around them. Rungar had burned away the fog, leaving a clear ward that surrounded them. Avorn, Forward! Rungar shouted. All vessels, converge on our position! 
Avern heard a voice speak from the necklace Aaron had given him. Avern, keep a northern heading. Uka fleet will pass before you and keep a pattern of movement almost like a snake to keep all their ballistae at the ready to clear the path. I will bring my ship to a rear position to yours, with the rest of the fleets behind me. We have killed many of the tentacled monsters, so I'm hoping that is all of them. Those can disrupt us more than an enemy fleet. As Evern pulled away from the island, he watched as the entire structure faded away. Behind it, he saw the many sails of the high ships of the island nation. He couldn't even count the number, but as he began to pull away from the host, Aaron took the position directly behind him. They were sailing into rolling waves that seemed to be coming from the very fogs surrounding the monolith of stone moving toward them. Flames rippled around the front of Misla. The sky ahead had become dark red, like an early morning sunrise, yet behind him he could see nothing but stars. The winter storm that had been present had fled. The icy winds continued, though, pushing into the sails and giving them all the wind they needed. Praise be to Dimon! Aviam shouted. The winds are in our favor! An explosion of green caught Evren's attention, and he turned to see the veiled island of Sroon, now clear to be seen as it was. A massive city atop a mountain of rock, its towers rising into the skies, and great torches of bright green shining against the stars. A great secret revealed indeed. Evern turned his attention the task at hand. He could see the line of ships meant to form ahead of him. The fleet of Uka was cutting across his field of vision from the east, and the first of the ships was nearly there. These ships had large drums pounding a rhythmic beating, yet the tides were getting stronger, and even these vessels struggled to take the intended position. The sea was beginning to churn. The Nokri climbed, moving up a massive wave that was growing and growing. He kept waiting to cut across the crest, but the ship did not dive down. It kept moving up. Evern heard a rumble beneath him, and then a voice from his necklace. Evern, it's one of those damn creatures. Break off, break off. Hard to port side. Come back down the arm. Arm? What arm? It was too late. The Nakri shot over the crest of the wave, and suddenly... They were sliding across a massive black substance. The ship tipped to one side, scratching across whatever it was they had been caught up in. Ahead, he saw what looked like a massive fin rising up. He struggled to hold on to the wheel, seeing Melia nearly fly off the edge of the ship, only just caught by Rungar as she hung off the side. They weren't on the water anymore. Yet he could see the water coming across the surface of the creature. From the east to west, the line of ocean covered, catching up under their hull and splashing them back in a circle. They fell off the back of the creature, a sudden wave blasting them forward again. The entire ship pushed upward and nearly flipped forward before coming to rest in the choppy oceans. Flashes of fire erupted through the waves ahead of them as the island nation sent volleys of glowing red spears into the creature, though it dove into the depths out of their reach. The Uka fleet hurried ahead of the Nakri. Evorn looked up. They were off course significantly, too far west as it was, but it seemed, to their own fortune, that though this creature was massive, it was only a gentle giant moving away from them. That was the Great Mother, a type of sea ray. It's not just big. That thing drops off children. Watch your deck, Aaron said. Watch the sides. Watch for creatures. Evern shouted. A wave blasted over the side of the ship as Evern moved to guide them back on course. The sky above them was shifting, no longer clouds but black stone, with white lines of energy moving through as if a lightning storm was above. He looked around and could no longer see their sky, only that of Misla. A loud hum filled the air, and a sense of dread fell over him. It was like music, but he felt it deeper within him, stirring a coldness yet making him sick. The fleet was reforming, and for now, none of the creatures had attacked as Aaron said, but he could tell from the Uka fleet they were dealing with whatever strange creatures it was that the Great Mother had dropped off. Rungar was busy checking the weapon. The strange, tubal-shaped creation was sitting at an angle pointed directly up. 
Several of the pieces were glowing. Avorn had no idea what the Rusis was doing, but that wasn't his place to know. He did his best to keep the ship from rocking too much. Avium had taken a seat behind Rungar, meditating and likely watching for threats beyond. Her Dwemar powers were flowing from her body, rippling white energies spinning around and reaching out across the waters. He exhaled, working to keep his breathing focused as Rossi jumped down onto the wheel and curled up. Helping me sail, sure, I'll take it. I only need to go north, and yet that alone has proven difficult. The tides were changing again. He could feel the current shifting beneath the ship and tried to turn the wheel to compensate. They were still pointed forward, and yet looking behind him, he could tell by the trails of water behind the island nation vessels that they were moving to the side. He tried to turn to the left, but the ship wouldn't stop, moving into a circle. The formation began to falter. A VM reached out towards the oceans. Meridas! Meridas! We need your aid! It's a maelstrom! Rungar shouted. It began to rain, the ocean shifting around them as the entire host began to slam into one another. Evern heard Aaron suddenly. Keep your headings. All crew prepare for vertical ascension. Evern, turn to starboard, away from the current, sail toward the mouth of the maelstrom. We're breaking out of this. That ship can fly, right? Yes, he said back. Evern noticed the water shifting underneath them. The strange greenish hue became bright blue, and narwhals leaped from the water beside them. Evorn, Avium said. The narwhals are going for the beast beneath the maelstrom. Keep the heading as Aaron has said. Evern turned to follow the current, seeing as the other ships around them began to spin as a column of mist rose out of the water. That was the mouth, the opening of the maelstrom. Several high ships came to either side of him, and Aaron kept his heading just behind him. He could see the edge of the maelstrom. Hold positions, crew, he shouted. They came to the edge, and as one, the entire fleet lifted off the surface of the water. Evern looked over to the high ships and saw fire erupting from the rear of their vessels. The winds over the mouth of the maelstrom blew into their sails, knocking them to the right, and several island nation vessels flew into one another, the sudden sounds of screams as the crews fell into a mouth of teeth below them. But in an unexpected action, the fleet of high ships of Srun were flying beside the Necri, avoiding the mouth of the maelstrom. Evern looked over the side of the ship. He could see the creature, its mouth snapping shut, the oceans collapsing as narwhals bloodied the creature's body, a sanguine river filling around them. The waves were coming down upon them, though, and Rungar stood up, his gauntlets glowing bright blue as he manipulated the waters beneath them, curving the waves and providing a funnel to prevent the ships from being swallowed by the collapsing walls of water. The island nation fleet and the Nakri had made it through, splashing into the water and with a strong wind pushing them forward. Evan could see a great crystal ahead, high in the sky, the core, the target for their attack. The Yuka vessels had never been able to take a position in front of them, but were at least on his flanks. He didn't know how many of the fleet remained overall, but they were cutting through the water at a pace that only divine intervention could be spurring them forward. Horn calls went out, and in the distance he saw the masts of hundreds of ships. The fleet of Marog, seemingly destroyed by Valrin, had not at all been destroyed, only reduced by a few. The ballistae of the Uka fleet locked into position, and in a series of volleys, the bolts of the island nation took to the sky, screeching like a dragon's cry, flames rippling from the metal. A volley of blue orbs shot up from afar, passing the bolts as the first volley was exchanged. Explosions came from both sides as high ships, shredded and torn apart by Marog's fleet, shattered. But in the distance, there were other fires. Columns dropped down out of Misla, slamming into the oceans, striking their allied vessels and sending up plumes of water. From atop these columns, light shot up to Misla, and figures appeared, dancing in erratic patterns, leaping from one spot to the next. 
Suddenly, the masked forms began casting out volleys of fire, smashing into the Nakri and other vessels. Water showered over Evern as he turned to avoid a series of pillars that had dropped in front of them. The casters atop them began to dance. Avium was to her feet immediately, sending up shards of ice, striking the ones closest to them as Melia and Ordak stood ready with spears. Rungar had a ward up, protecting the actual device. Evern kept a steady heading. Seeing several arced shots heading for them, he moved to the right, the white storm crow just behind him, and Aaron shouting orders from his own helm. They were headed right for the fleet ahead as more and more columns dropped down. Balls of light struck the water around them, appearing as flashes like stars coming from Misla as more and more spells began flying into the water. The water turned to ice around some of the high ships, and as more of the fleet fell back, either trapped or broken apart, the white storm crow shot ahead of the Nakri. Ivorn, the fleet is breaking! I see that damn crystal! Follow me in! Aaron's ship began shifting in appearance, the grand golden wings bursting out of the side of the ship, revealing a series of ballistae-like devices. Morag's fleet had formed a battle line, setting up with the length of their ships like a wall. The waters around the Nakri and the other vessels were like a constant wave, a wave of blue overtaking the green. The warm death that Misla had brought about across the glacial seas faded. The northern oceans were with them. Meridas was with them. The gods of the north were with them, and the crew of the Stormborn was moving toward their destiny. Or so it seemed. As more of the high ships moved into position, Aaron unleashed a massive volley of flaming projectiles, a constant stream of fire as bolt after bolt shot out from his ship, piercing all the ships ahead of them, shredding wood and metal alike. The fleet of Morag was made up of all kinds of vessels, but as Aaron's high ship unleashed a payload of weaponry, they became nothing but a bubbling mass of wood, metal, and blood. A shimmer of silver light shot across the lower portion of Misla, the sky becoming bright for a moment as the crystal, only barely visible before, began to glow, sending blasts of energy into the ocean around them. A light seemed to go across the deck of the Nakri and then focus on the weapon. Rungar snapped a ward upward. Avium, help me, he screamed. A blast of energy struck his ward as Avium projected her own ward, gathering with his but barely holding back the volley coming from the crystal. Suddenly, the energy stopped. Evorn looked up to see the crystal had vanished from the realm again. Misla was still not fully in their realm. More pillars began slamming into the ocean as the fleet of Marog moved away from their position. Evorn noticed the ship's turtle moved across the deck to the Rusis weapon. Rungar was on his knees. A portion of the weapon had been damaged by the blast from the crystal. What is it? Evorn shouted. The weapon was dark. Though the Ruses attempted to manipulate it, it would not do anything. Is it broken? Ordak asked. It will work. Get me close. Really close, Evern. The crystal was emerging again. The white storm crow moved in a circle around him, with still dozens of high ships moving with him. The enemy fleet is breaking off. Now is the time, Aaron said. I don't know why they're leaving. Evern looked around, seeing that Aaron's fleet was still holding strong. Rungar ran up to the helm. You can communicate with Aaron? Tell him to get clear now. Sail back toward the south. I need you to do something, Evern. I must go. I must make sure this weapon lands. None of the runic devices work anymore, so I will have Eviam ignite it, and you will turn the Nakri and flee. Rungar! You are not going to sacrifice yourself for something that may not even work. No sacrifice. I can shield myself, hitch a ride on a narwhal. He smirked. You forget I've been doing insane things before you were even a possibility in this world. Just do it. Rungar ran back down to brief Avium on his intention. Aaron, the Rusi says to fall back, return south. He is about to deliver the weapon into Misla. Good. 
We will turn south. The enemy fleet is still retreating. Take care of you and your crew, Evorn. Good sailing back there for a shadow elf. Evorn looked to see Evim embracing Rungar. Rungar ignited his gauntlets and flew into the air, lifting higher and higher as the crystal core began to grow, light searching the ocean again, dancing about. Do you know what he is doing? Ordak asked Avium. Guiding the weapon, she said, putting her hand on it. I tried to tell him I could guide it, but it is made to resist Wemhar powers, so he is going to do it. Right. How's he going to do that? Milia asked. Evern could barely see Rungar. He was tiny, a mere speck above them, yet still a good distance from the crystal. He sent down a single blast of ice, striking just off deck of the Nakri. That's the signal, Aviam said. Aviam knelt. Using her powers, she heated the rear of the device. Evorn noticed the tip of it was broken in and blackened. Whatever this was, though, this was the end of Misla. He thought of Valrin, and he planned his path once the city fell. He'd find him. One way or another, he'd find him. The fleet of the island nation was still in sight, but was on calm waters, the glacial seas like a clear path created by the destruction of the pollution that Misla had done. Fire suddenly blasted underneath the Rusis device, and Aviam formed a ward around herself, Melia and Ordak. The weapon howled like a wolf, long and constant, roaring now as it shot up and off the deck of the Nakri, directly up toward the core. Evern spun the wheel around, and Rossi slipped into his robe to hide. He turned, looking up to see Rungar suddenly grasping the device, directing it to the core. He then blinked and saw none other than the outline of a ship he knew too well. A ship he had seen first on his island in the glacial seas. The Ayla Sunrise. Valrin! Wind spun up around them, lifting them out of the water as the Nakri shot away from the center of Misla. He closed his eyes, grasping the wheel, as for a moment he saw hands grabbing and holding him, a glowing white form with wings that sparkled. He felt a searing heat on the back of his neck, and even looked at his own hands to see his bone beneath his skin. It was a strange image, fleeting. As he squeezed his eyes tighter, a sounds like thunder and whooshing wind filled the air. His eyes burned, and he kept them closed as suddenly he felt a wave of energy overtake them, and then a sudden crashing sound. The next thing he knew, he was on his back. A voice spoke to him. Evorn, you have been delivered by the grace of Dimn. Now is not the time to hold back. Take the helm. It isn't over, but we are here. Lead with courage. He opened his eyes to see a white-winged form with glowing eyes. I am a Corsair of Dim. We have delivered the defenders of the glacial seas back to the Great Bay of the North. The gods will not let you stand alone. Arise, arise, and fight. With a flash, the Corsair was gone. Evern stood up to see the deck of the Nakri scarred with charred wood, but the turtle moved about, repairing the wood. The rest of the crew was there. He looked up, seeing across the ocean, as he then noticed that the rest of the fleet of the island nation, including the White Stormcrow, had been brought out of the great fire that was Misla. He noticed that Misla was now upon them fully, no longer an entity between realms, but purely in their realm. There was a great city of crystalline buildings atop the massive floating structure. The large crystal weapon they had seen before was clearly in front of the gargantuan horror, Beneath the city of Misla was a fireball that was quickly going out. He thought of Valrin, the Aela Sunrise, and then he saw a singular form coming out from the dark smoke billowing beneath Misla. It was Rungar, surrounded in a ward of his own magic, a flickering form with the grand sight of Misla looming behind him. As he floated toward them, Evern looked up at the light of a now bright white moon. There was a shimmering ribbon of red and black lightning floating away from Taria and into Misla. The veil around Taria was lessening as deep and long horns sounded from Misla. Evern turned, 
looking to the east, seeing the great island of Srone and the green torches high above the island. Great towers had risen around the island that were not there before. Rungar was nearly to the deck of the ship, when suddenly he dropped into the ocean. Aaron guided the white storm crow closer to the Nakri, and Avium lifted an unconscious Rungar onto the deck. Evern ran down to the deck. He's burnt! His back, his hands, his face, but alive. We need to get him to healers, Avayam said. Evor noticed that the waters beneath Misla were beginning to churn again. Waves began to splash up on the deck of the Nakri. Aaron shouted from his ship, What now? Can you use the weapon again? No, Avern shouted back. Rungar is barely alive. He needs to get to shore. Take him to Srun. They can tend to him. A roar split the air. A massive tentacled monster with multiple eyes erupted from the sea, its tendrils wrapped around the towers around Srun. Flashes of flaming arrows fired into the creature from Srun as Trusong and the host of Narasond warriors fought to protect the city. Back up the coast, Evium said. Radenba, it isn't too far from the shore. The water erupted again more tendrils shooting up as Aaron sounded his own horns. Evern, get him to safety, and then return as soon as you can. We must figure something else out. The white storm crow prepared to engage the coming monsters as more large tentacles, heads, and monsters of Misla counterattacked the forces of the north. Avern guided them away, sailing south with haste. After seeing the Aela sunrise, after all they had worked for amounting to nothing changing, he didn't know what to say or do. He felt they should be in the fight. He felt they needed to get Rungar to safety. He screamed, slamming his hands on the wheel. Why did the weapon fail? He shouted out. Where are the damn gods now? Why did they save us just to flee again? The weapon didn't, Rungar said, his eyes opening. It didn't fail. He grabbed at Evium and Ordak, pulling himself up, pointing toward Evern, they helped him up the stairs, setting him by the helm. The weapon worked. There was something else. You already know this. Evern thought of how he saw the Aela sunrise. I saw the stormborn ship, Evern said. Who controlled it? Some demon? Valorin knew that we attacked Iclo from beneath. Perhaps the enemy has extracted that information and was ready, used his ship. Rungar shook his head. Valrin was on the ship. He engaged a ward from the ship that knocked back the explosion onto me and the ocean beneath. No, Ordak said. He wouldn't help them. He wouldn't do that. It was him, Rungar said. I tried to strike him and he struck me with his sword, speaking the word Hakan Rak. Well, I didn't hear it, but the lightning struck me just the same. I have seen such spells before. Rungar looked at Avium and then back behind them. Evorn said nothing. He wouldn't believe it. Valrin would not strike against them. Rungar had to be wrong. You need to get back out there. The Nakri's weapons will be effective against the monsters. They need you. I think this is only the start of what's to come. What about you? Aviam asked. You, he said. You will take me to the city. Grab my hand, take me to my kin. Then I will rest. You will be needed. I have seen it, Avium, daughter of Lor Lam. Avium looked up to Evern. I don't know if I should leave the ship. There's nothing more for us to try. We must defend those who cannot defend themselves, Evorn said. Take care of him. Take my hand, Rungar said. Avium looked down at him and then pointed. We're too far from shore. It isn't time. Take my hand. I know where we are. Evern watched as Avium took Rungar's hand. His gauntlets began to glow as Rungar seemingly used Avium's power with his, carrying them both across the ocean at a rate faster than the Nakri could move, vanishing into the darkness as they went toward the city. Well, they're gone, Melia said. What now? Ordak asked. Head back, kill some monsters? Evern kept the southern direction 
and began to turn toward the eastern shoreline. I will not send you two back out there. This is not what it should be. None of this is as it should happen. Melia was silent, but Ordak grabbed the wheel. I'm not sure you understand how this works. We may be your crew, but we're still the crew of the Ayla Sunrise. Our captain needs aid. You see that moon? He said, pointing upward. It gave some kind of power to the city. Maybe the black moon you told me about has lifted. You've got your other friends, the ones in Taria. Do you think they'd let you just shove them off to shore? Evern jerked the wheel from Ordak. There are few ways this ends. I don't see much good coming. Go back home, take Milia, return to the Shadowlands and do something else, but live. Have you not seen the massive looming weapon of death? Milia questioned. There's no other place to hide. Morag will not stop here. He has sea monsters attacking what defenders remain. I'm not sure you remember correctly, but I was meant to die when Ayaklo was destroyed. I got a second chance at life, and I will not be cast aside by some shadow elf. I don't care what happens. Think about Bry, Ordak said. You barely knew her. Ordak grabbed Evern by his shoulders. But all of you did. I know what it did to each of you when she died. What would Bry do? Would she let you cast her on the shore? Avern paused, his breath quivering. Valrin, I don't know what has happened. I will find you. I will do what I can to help you. Damn the gods and fate. Evern spun the wheel round, changing course and heading directly back toward Misla. Ordak clapped. Yes, time to kill some monsters. The green flames above Srun were burning bright. High atop the central spire of the island, there were repeated flashes of light. Streaks of silver arrows flew down into the monster below, blasts of white fire sending the creature back into the ocean. Elves have quite the bows to do that, Milia said. It is true song, an elf from Narisond, has a bastard Falakar horse rider name. I'm not even sure if it's just an elf who takes up that name like a title, or the name of the elf, but I heard of that ball back in the Shadowlands. It's quite a legendary object. I'm sure there will be even more legends now. Evern, it is nice to see you on approach to the battle line. Aaron's voice was sudden and unexpected to Evern. Where are we needed? Misla is changing course. The crystal weapon is rotating to my home. Avern, we have to try to get close, but I do not have the energy between our ships and the city defenses. I have to switch to wind power and shift everything we have to Sroon. Start the evacuation. We'll head around and try to help, Evern told him. Okay, follow the fleet that has escaped. I've signaled the dwarf to assist the evacuation. We are heading east with the evacuees. Ordak and Melia stood by Evern as he directed the vessel along the coast, making a straight heading for Sroon. Misla was slowly rotating, its crystal glowing a bright red color as electrical bolts bounced around it connecting to smaller crystals. They can't evacuate the entire city, Ordak said. With the number of ships they fielded, that must be hundreds, thousands of people. I know, Evern said, but there is not much else we can do. Can this ship not fly like Valrin did with it? Evorn looked back to the supply of crystals. They were recharging now in the moonlight, but he felt that even the controls of the Nakri were sluggish. I like your thinking, he said to Ordak, but we must wait. He could see the high ship sailing in front of him, moving towards Sroon. His eyes traced over to Taria. He could see the snow-capped mountains, but there was no sign of anything else of any friends who, in the back of his mind, he hoped were coming. He switched his focus, feeling the ship lurch forward and the tides shift around them. Suddenly, the ocean burst in the distance, and a gargantuan form exploded from the depths. It was the Great Mother, the giant sea ray. It flew higher and higher, passing over them and blotting out the moon as it dove back into the bay, leaving a shower of small beasts in its wake. The tiny creatures seemed to be made of jelly, pulling themselves across the deck of the Nakri, a burning sludge trailing behind them. 
Ordok and Milia jumped down to the lower deck, stabbing and slashing the creatures. Using the spears, they tossed them from the deck. The ships ahead of the Nakri burst into flames as the water around them began to boil. Ivorn turned hard to shift their path, making for the west as the ocean began to boil. Another creature comes, Milia said. At that moment, the Great Mother came again to the surface, scattering the high ships moving towards Srun, as Misla began to focus light towards Srun. They're about to strike, Ordak said. Try now. Try to engage flight. Evern shifted the crystals. The ship began to lift out of the water, but then crashed back down. There simply wasn't enough energy. Avorn sailed west as the Great Mother kept scattering Aaron's fleet. Misla's weapon flashed, and a focused beam struck Srun, sending up a blast of fire and light that lit up the night sky. Evorn, Milia, and Ordak watched in horror, the massive island aflame from the crystal's blast. But beyond the fire and smoke, as the light from the attack faded, a shimmering ward like a puddle disturbed by a rock shimmered outward. Srun had survived through the use of some form of energy shield. Evorn tried to keep the ship directly in the moonlight, working to recharge the crystals. An explosion of fire and rock came from beneath the great bay. Something was emerging. A volcanic fissure sent columns of steam up into the atmosphere. Of course the damn volcano is erupting, Ordak shouted. Evorn turned them away as steam billowed out from the surface of the bay. Nakri, we need you with us. Evern heard from his pendant. What is your plan? he asked. Get close to Misla, arc our weapons. We have to try to knock out that crystal. Evorn kept his heading. He was too far to be able to reach them in a meaningful time. He could see the high ships firing into the lower portion of Misla, but they didn't have the range to hit the city. Suddenly, the waters shifted around them, and in the distance he could see the wings of the Great Ray emerging again. Ordak and Milia heaved their spears. The Nakri propelled them forward, slamming into the creature. Evern turned the front of the ship toward the creature, switching the crystal switches and sending an explosive green beam directly at the creature. It dove down, vanishing, but the crystals of the Nakri dimmed to only a faint glow. Ordak ran back up to the helm and saw the crystal. It was either that or it hit us, Evern said solemnly. Misla unleashed its weapon again, striking the ward with a concentrated blast. Evern shielded his eyes, the bright glow sending streaks of fire off the shield of the city. But to his right, where the eruption beneath the surface was happening, he saw several black forms emerging, flying straight up high above them. Misla kept its focused fire before finally darkening. The ward, cracked and broken, fell with the sound of shattering glass audible from even their great distance away. Suddenly, a great black form landed on the back of the ship. Evorn turned, his staff alight, to see a lone monstrous black dragon and its rider. Elera and her dragon rider kin had come. Part 10. The Longhorn. Evorn staggered back, seeing the mighty Rornuk. Elera removed her helm and smiled. We are here. We are here to help, Evorn. We need it, Evorn said, astonished. I hope it's more than just you. All of us. All the dragons of our isles are coming. How? Ordak asked. The dragon islands are under the control of Morog. No, no longer. Those who were there still fighting us fled. Something happened. Morag's power has lessened or something. It doesn't matter. We're here. Valrin, Evern said. He is fighting for us. He smiled and then turned and pointed. Head for that crystal. It's a weapon. One more strike and the island of Srun is gone. Alera put her helmet back on, lifting into the sky with the thunderous flapping of Rornick's wings propelling her upward. Ivern watched as dozens of dragons shot out of the ocean, the dragon riders forming their own path through the volcanic portals to come to the aid of the defenders of the north. Ivern grabbed the pendant. Aaron, 
Dragon riders are taking out that weapon. Do not engage the dragons. Those on the deck of the Nakri watched as Ellera led the dragon riders directly up into Misla, fire and ice blasting the crystal as bursts of energy filled the air, the forces of Misla attempting to stop the assault. Even from afar, Evern could see the dragons diving one after another, splattering the surface of the crystal and its components, purple fire erupting all over Misla. Elera and Rorna climbed high, turning and diving again, a series of white blasts exploding around them as Rornuk made another blast of blue fire, shattering the crystal weapon in an explosion louder than any thunderclap Ivorn had ever heard. Yes! Ordak shouted, smacking his hands together. Take that, you stupid city! Melia laughed, cheering as Evern watched with careful admiration. Ilera and the dragon riders flew back down, making for the ocean as silver objects lifted off the surface of Misla, a melodic sound filling the air. Misla made another loud and thunderous horn call. Evern looked ahead and saw the outline of ships emerging from beneath Misla as the entire superstructure moved forward in a southeastern direction. The destroyed crystalline weapon was smoldering high above as Misla's shadow began over the island of Srun. Ilera moved through the sky over them as Ever noticed that something was just behind her. The melodic sound he had heard before had gotten louder. He focused his eyes, seeing what it was that pursued her. It was in a can, the flying ships of the Dwemhar. Ordok and Melia began tossing their spears, the arching bolts striking and sending fire rippling from the side of the Akan. Ilera banked to the right, bringing herself around to blast the Akan herself. Aaron, we have Akan Dwemhar vessels. Hit them hard, and if they get over you, if you have a ward, engage it. I have no power for that, Aaron shouted back. The Misla fleet approaches. I've signaled the dwarves to join us in the assault on the eastern flanks. We will sail north again. The dragon riders were fighting erratically above them. Alera swooped down, Rornuk's wings batting the air to stay afloat. Evern, I can see something moving under the surface of the water. Something is moving up onto the coast south of here. Make a pass, see what it is, but the fleet is coming. I need you and your dragons to get to Misla. We must get Valrin. Wait for Nevron. He is coming with more of our kind. They will be here soon. Evern nodded. Understood, Elera, he said, pausing. Thank you. You and your riders just saved thousands of lives. Thank me when we're done. Her and Rornuk flew south, as Evern and the others continued to join up with Aaron's battle line. Evern looked back to see Rornuk unleashing his breath upon the distant shoreline in several concentrated blasts before taking to the air as a can flew high above him. It was clear something was headed to shore, but between Rornuk and the awaiting legions of the Protectorate, perhaps it would be enough to deal with it. That said, it wasn't Evern's focus right now. As the dragons and Akan fought just above the Nakri, Ordak and Melia tossed their spears, the power snapping from the ship's reserve and sending up the bolts with accuracy impossible with a normal spear throw. Evorn noticed that the fleets ahead of him were not moving forward yet. Even the fleet of Misla seemed still for the moment. There were flashes of lightning high above Misla as a great storm, black clouds rolling across the sky, struck the western portion of the city. More blasts from within the city caused the entire air to shake around them. Damn dragons did quite a number on the city, Ordak said with a laugh. Good. Or Valrin, Evern suggested. Ordak went from smiling to a serious glare. I hope, Evern. I think we've been lucky about enough so far. Avorn guided the Nakri to the front of the battle formation. As Misla moved forward above them, Arryn and his ship moved beside Evern. High above, the dragon riders were keeping the Akon ships busy for the moment. How is Thrun? Evern shouted to him. Good, my friend. I have received word that most of the city is still being evacuated. My family is safe, though. The city is damaged, but yet still stands. 
He sighed. Misla moves to strike with its other weapon, and our ships cannot do what they did before. This fleet is large. We must protect the evacuations of Srun. That is our purpose here. The dwarves only await my signal, and we move forward. Evern looked behind as dozens of dragons were emerging from the ocean. He then noticed one of them wearing all gold armor, and even from a distance, he knew who it was. King Nevron of the Dragon Islands joins us, Evern said. Now is the time. Aaron affixed his helm and drew his sword. To battle, then. Evern looked to Ordak and Melia. Before he could say anything, Melia smiled. Take us in, Captain. We're ready. Ordak picked up a second spear. Don't ram another ship right away, though. I'd like to be able to throw all these before we have to do actual blade work. He winked and chuckled before looking to Milia. Don't think I'm not going to grab you and take you into the battle with me. Evorn coughed, tapping Rossi. Get ready to bite something. I don't think we're going to be getting saved by some corsairs or whatever those were this time. Gods be damned, time to prepare for a real fight. Rossi hissed and slithered out onto his shoulder. Good, he said to the snake. The fleet moved forward as a series of horn calls came from the many vessels assembled. The drums of the Uka fleet were loud and thunderous, pounding in unison as the high ships, the spine fleet of Rugog, and the vessels of Haradar moved forward. From his vantage point, Evern could see the dwarven ships of Haradar, long vessels with great dwarven statues of stone, standing with a large hammer forward like a ram. The fleet of Rugog was intermixed, dark vessels all too familiar to him in truth, but he was happy to at least have another ally. Morag's fleet began forward at nearly the same time. From afar it was difficult to make out all the smaller vessels with them, but there were masked forms with long robes and large staves floating in the air around the ships. They began sending arching spells of fire and lightning, striking both ship and crew of many of the vessels. Ordak and Milia fell back, hiding behind the center mass as several blasts nearly hit them. Ordak, take the wheel, he shouted. As Ordak took the helm, Avern ran up to the front of the ship, casting a ward to shield them as several more blasts bounced around them. Two of the larger Misla vessels, the ships with the copper and metal parts that could cast their own spells, came into clear view. Evern focused his magic, sending a large blast of earth magic smashing into the lower portions of one of the ships. The ship began to glow, sending a blast directly his way. Ordok wheeled right as the blast blew past the Nakri, striking a ship behind them but not destroying it. They were closing in on the Misla fleet. Aaron sounded horns again, this time holding the horn call. The ballistae of the high ships twanged over and over, volleys of flaming bolts smashing into the enemy vessels. At that time, Nevron and a massive green dragon flapped just above Evorn. Let's get them! Ordok shouted up. Nevron drew a spear from the side of his dragon. The king was wearing all golden armor, a glowing sight against the dark outline of Misla. On his back, he also had a large sword. The Dragon King had come to kill, and Evern was more than happy to have yet another beacon of hope in the darkness that was upon them. The Dragon Riders let out their own horn calls. Nevron and his dragons waited for the volleys of bolts to cease from the high ships before dropping down, flying directly above the water with a series of fiery blasts directed at the enemy fleet, sending explosions of Morag's ilk, wood, and metal into the air. They flapped upward as a Khan descended upon the fleets, their melody clashing against the sounds of the high ship's drums. And suddenly, the two fleets collided. Evern cast his spells, sending repeated blasts at masked forms on the ships to either side of them. Melia threw her spears as the Ishta wizards that Evern had seen before dropped onto the deck of the Nakri. The Shadow Elf slammed his staff down, sending a blast of energy that toppled his three foes before each of them cast a blast of ice at him at the same time. He spun, 
waves of energy spiraling around him as a concentrated ward, deflecting the spells. He jumped off the ground, grabbing onto the center mast before throwing his staff down into the hull, sending a blast of green energy outward. As the wizards were distracted, he dove down, cracking one across his mask with his fist, before Rossi catapulted off his shoulder, striking another with his fangs. The one he had punched was struck with such a force, he fell dead. Evern grabbed the last one by the throat, gripping him, feeling his pulse in his fingers. The wizard squirmed in his grasp. Blood began running from his nose as the shadow elf squeezed harder, the cartilage in his neck cracking between his fingers. Avern smiled, ecstasy flowing over him as life faded from his foe's form. Get off my ship, he growled. Milia thrust a spear into the wizard's side, and Evern tossed him overboard. Other nearby wizards began floating into the air. The dragons and the Akan lit up the otherwise dark underbelly of Misla, and ships began to board one another. From a distance, Evern saw Rugag and his pirates boarding an enemy vessel, and then a Haradar vessel smashed through three vessels as they too became locked in the fight, unable to sail away as ships broke upon ships. Marog's wizards began to chant something, a language Evern didn't know, but as they spoke louder and louder, the waters began to flow out from under the ship, and it was as if the entire fleet was lifted out of the water. The Great Mother, the ray from before, had emerged from beneath them. Upon her back were hundreds of strange creatures. They had arms and legs like any elf or man, but upon their bodies were masks of shells and rock. Servants of Marog, no doubt, but ones of either a much older time or of some cursed sea race. Suddenly, the deck of the Nakri, now on its side, was crawling with the creatures. Nevron flew down, blasting the massed mask-wearing sea warriors. Ordok and Melia fought to keep the deck clear, as Evern shielded them from blasts cast from vantage points of higher ships. As far out as he could see, there was nothing but the crumbled masts of ships. Arrows began to fly from high ships, striking other ships at random, but Evern couldn't tell if arrows were finding their intended marks or simply missing their targets and hitting others. What water remained on top of the Great Mother was red with thick blood, as screaming of man and beast, along with fire and smoke from burning ships, began to erupt across the top of the ray. Morag's wizards began to cast some type of energy into the ray, causing the creature to wail. They were killing it intentionally. It began to dive down, water sweeping across the expanse of broken ships. Ilera flew just over the top of the Nakri, circling around before attempting to land just as a blast of fire struck the top of Rornuk. He quickly turned, snapping the floating wizard, but the creature that they were killing screamed a sound Evern could not describe. It was like the screech of a bat and the squeal of a whale. It forced him to grab his ears when a blast of light from beneath the water caused the water to suddenly boil. The creature was dying, and with it was released an acidic pool, burning the vessels underneath the water. The Great Mother's destruction was destroying all the fleets of the defenders at once. As the creature wailed, it sent large waves up, pushing up both men and boats into a tidal wave of destruction. Evern held on to the center mass, and Ordok and Melia did the same. They were tossed atop the waves, shooting down the front side of the expanding mass of water, wood, flesh, and blood of the battle. Evorn noticed they were moving out from under Misla, forced up against the great rocky portion of Srun. The waves battered them, and as the ship began to settle, he saw another wave coming. He scrambled up to the helm, turning the wheel, trying to veer away from the island of Srun. A wave of debris struck them, and he engaged the ship's systems, lifting off the surface of the water as the Nakri took to the air. It seemed the crystals of the Nakri had recharged just enough. He struggled to catch his breath. He felt his side and realized that he was bleeding, but he didn't know from where or even what. Both Ordak and Melia were soaked in blood and water, and now Melia was limping. 
Rossi remained with him, nervous, squirming back and forth across his shoulders as the waves battered Sroon beneath them. There were some ships emerging from the battle, but very few. Evorn made out a few dwarven vessels and high ships, but their numbers were almost nothing. The wizards of Morag had led them into some trap, but at the great costs of their own fleet, or most of it, as he assumed. But Ivern knew that for Morag, it didn't matter. He had Misla, and it was drawing ever closer to Srun. Part 11. The Stormborn and Shadow Elf. Evern looked over the expanse of the choppy seas and the smoldering ruins of boats and a can, of bodies floating in the water, and the smoke rising from both Srun and the city of Lok. Flashes of fire in the distance told him that the Protectorate was fighting their own battle on the shore, and after fighting atop the Great Mother, he assumed it was the same creatures they had seen, the strange sea creatures with masks. It was hard for him to draw a full breath. He could see part of the starry sky above, and still, dragons and Akan fought one another for control of the skies. He looked down to the shoreline and saw the wreckage of battle covering the beaches. He then looked back to the ships emerging from beneath Misla and saw the white storm crow. Its mast was broken. Evern descended, lowering the Nakri into the water and turning to head directly for them. Aaron, he said into the pendant. He waited, not seeing anyone moving on board the high ship. Other high ships in the vicinity were moving about, but most were nearly as damaged as the white storm crow. Fogs rolled out from underneath Misla, and a shimmer caught Evern's eye. The high ships closest to the fogs vanished as Evern came closer, seeing the Admiral grasping the helm and slowly standing up. Evern angled his own ship, preparing to defend the Admiral's vessel. Istha, the masked forms of Marog, began appearing on the deck of the White Storm Crow. Aaron's sword flashed in the pale morning light as he took down one after another in a last stand, as it seemed the rest of his crew had been lost or were too broken to fight. From beneath Misla, veiled in fogs, Evern saw at first another glimmer, then a wooden bow. Explosions rocked Misla high in the clouds as the Ayala sunrise appeared in the fog. A lone captain stood at the helm. Valrin had come. Valrin! Evern shouted out, but he wasn't even sure the captain could hear him. Ordak and Melia jumped up and down, waving. Evern turned his ship, heading now directly for the White Storm Crow. Evern had so many questions for Valrin, but as the city still loomed above them and more and more explosions shook Misla above, he wanted to get the survivors and get away. Whatever Valrin had done had worked. He knew he was right. He smiled. Rossi, we've done it. He's done it. Evorn looked back up at the Aela sunrise, nearly past the white storm crow. Suddenly, the center mast of the Aela sunrise glowed bright red, and fire engulfed the white storm crow before an explosion shook the air, and the ship exploded, sending chunks of wood and water in all directions. Milia and Ordak cowered down as the Aela sunrise turned to line up a pass on the Nakri. Evorn left the helm, running to the front of his vessel, holding up his staff. Valrin! Valrin! It is us! Do not attack! Ordak ran up beside him. He's headed this way, Evern. No, he's confused. He thinks we're the enemy. Milia ran to the helm, wheeling them right as the center mast of the Ayla sunrise began to glow brightly. Evern took his staff in both hands, holding it, shaking. Valrin, he cried out. Fire erupted from the Ayla sunrise, and Evern summoned a ward, channeling all his energy into it, his staff trembling and cracking as the energy struck. Evern flew backward, striking the center mast. He spat blood and forced himself back up. The Ayla sunrise struck them on the right side, splintering wood as the two ships snapped and cracked. The turtle went to work, attempting to patch the leak. Valrin stared at Evern, who just stared back. Melia wheeled right, moving into the wake of the Ayla Sunrise, which was quickly moving for another pass. 
Evern stood motionless, his own legs shaking as he watched the Stormborn circle back around. Valrin stared at him still, a menacing glare unlike any he had ever seen from him. There was another crashing sound. A Haradar vessel struck the side of the Aela Sunrise, the dwarves aboard sending a volley of axes at the helm. Nurokas and the several hammer songs boarded the vessel, three of them jumping nearly upon Valrin. The Stormborn spun, jumping up to the center mass of the ship before diving down, sending a blast of lightning from his sword at his attackers. Evern ran for the helm, wheeling them toward the two other vessels. Valrin had jumped atop one of the hammer songs, his sword at his neck. He split open the dwarf, spraying blood all over the deck as two other hammer songs both swung, striking him in the stomach and blasting him across the deck. He was down, lying in splintered wood at the front of the vessel. Neurokas wielded his massive hammer, running at full sprint to deliver the final blow when Evern angled his staff, sending a blast of magic, raw and random, striking the dwarf and knocking him from his feet. Valrin pushed himself off the deck, jumping once and then launching himself, spinning into the two remaining hammer songs before turning to Nurokas and moving to thrust his sword into the dwarf. Nurokas roared, bellowing out as he threw his axe, which Valrin avoided, moving to slash the angered dwarf. Nurokas took the blade into his left shoulder and then began punching Valrin over and over, blood spraying all over the deck. The Nakri smashed into the other side of the Ayla Sunrise, and Evern quickly boarded, Ordak and Milia just behind him. Cease this insanity, he screamed. Valrin hissed, his eyes black. He lifted his hands. Three masks rose from the rear of the ship, two of them striking the two other hammer songs. They both stood up, brandishing their hammers, reawakened by not necromancy, but the power of Marok. A mask flew onto Neurokas, who fell to the ground, trying to keep the tendrils from grabbing his face. Dark is night, dead is the moon, Valrin said. The Stormborn comes. The two Hammersong minions charged forward, one directly into Ordak, pushing him off and back onto the Nakri. The other stuck Milia, throwing her overboard and jumping in after her. Avern lowered his staff. He did not sense Valrin. It was something else. If you're the Stormborn, tell me, where did this ship come from? The failure of Eliu became the glory of Marog. Yes, I know that part, Evorn said, slowly walking in a sidestep of Valrin. But where did you get it from? All will understand with the coming of the One God. Valrin as he was is no more. This is the truth, the path the light that shines and darkened the black moon. The nether moon became as one, and from whole came the broken, and came the shard in which cuts the lives of those. You're a damn fool, Evern said, cutting him off. Bri would strike you herself if she were here. None matter, none of the old matter. Bow before me or die. I bow to no one, not even you, Captain. Valrin charged. Evern slammed his staff, sending a crippling blast of energy toward Valrin. The Stormborn jumped to the opposite side of the deck before leaping at and trying to punch him. Evern dodged as Valrin went for Neurokas, pulling his sword free from his flesh, the hammer song still struggling to stand as he had ripped most of the tendrils off of him. Neurokas fell back to the deck of the Aela Sunrise as Valrin spun his sword. Melia had managed to get back on the Nakri. The hammer song who had knocked her off had drowned just afterward. Now, both Ordak and Melia attempted to kill the remaining one. Valrin lunged toward Evern, growling and trying to hit him with his sword. Evern cast earth magic, slamming stone around stone, building an entombing wall around the Stormborn. Avern went for the high ground of the helm as the rocks exploded behind him. He turned to find Valrin mid-jump, his Dwemhar blade burning with black fire. He parried the sword into the helm and forced Valrin into the wheel, striking him in his already bloody face over and over. Valrin pushed Evern off him, throwing him at the rear of the ship. Evern slammed his staff down again, but this time 
Valrin dove out of the way, bringing his sword around in an arc, striking Evern in the ribs. Evern held his staff firmly in the ground. He looked down. The blade had just caught on his staff. Otherwise, it would have gone through bone and tissue. Valrin leaped, kneeing Evern in the lower jaw and pushing him against the back of the Aela Sunrise. Damn you, Vals. This isn't you. This isn't you at all. Where is the Valrin who fought the Barb King? Valrin ripped Evern's staff from him, forcing his blade toward his neck. Evern grabbed the blade, the black fire searing his hands as he pushed back. Where is the Valrin who would never go against his crew, would do anything to destroy Morog, the Valrin that Bry loved? Valrin pushed harder against him, the blade slipping in his skin and bone. I will kill you, Valrin said. I will do what the Stormborn was meant to do, bring true ascension, bring about the reign of the Dwemhar over all life. Rossi slithered under Evern's robes, moving toward the opening of his arm. Evern of the Shadowlands, submit. Submit now or the Enforcer of Marog shall finish you. May this face be the one you see at the end, for nothing is ever as it simply seems. Valrin is dead. Rossi shot out from Evern's robe, fangs out, attempting to bite this form before them, but he pulled up his sword, blocking the serpent as Evern went for his staff. Rossi flew upon this foe only to be flung away. Whatever this was drew a second blade, spinning them about as white fire erupted around him. His eyes began to burn blue. Come, Evern, taste that which you have avoided for too long. Riakar emerged from the form of Valrin. Death comes for you, Evorn. Valrin is dead. I tossed his body from Misla. You are alone. Avern lifted his staff, his hands aching from his torn flesh. Rossi rose up beside him. Avern nodded at Rossi and then pointed his staff at Riakar. I'm not alone, and if it is the truth that falls from your cursed mouth, then I'll avenge him. Fire erupted across the deck of the Aela Sunrise, blasting Evern across the deck. He landed on his back. Looking up, he saw the early morning starry sky above him and Misla burning. It was then, in the blackness of rolling smoke, he saw a single form of a bright burning flames high above. Not a dragon, not an Akan, not even a spirit or signs of the gods, but something fell upon them from the carnage of Misla. Flames within flames and the truth to all that had transpired. The only hope any of them, broken and beaten upon the oceans of the north, could hope in. Hello, I know. I know. That's a heck of a cliffhanger. While I originally planned to have one final book and alternating point of views between Valrin and Evern, the story worked better to keep what exactly was happening with Valrin a complete mystery. As Stormborn... Ascension will reveal, the story will pick up not too long after Valrin arrived at Misla. I will give zero spoilers here, but you're going to get something that you won't expect, as if this series could have any more bombshells. But this coming book will tie everything up, and the Stormborn saga will come to an end. Thank you for sticking with Valrin and the crew all this way. The finale will be amazing. I assure you. By the light of the Strantavedi, I will see you in the next book. J.T. Williams This is the end of Stormborn Book 13 Cataclysm. Thank you for listening.